EMR safety crew and the Chevrolet safety truck there from the IMSA safety team and my goodness they were there quickly they will have heard the full course caution called this is a short yellow so the pits will not reopen as we've just been under yellow flags and Philippe Albuquerque got back into the car exactly as we're seeing now and it's what they're trying to do I know exactly what they're trying to do he's trying to get that into neutral so it can be flat toed and Albuquerque couldn't do it they're going to need to li oh no well I'm wrong the lights are on and somebody is home well, what, what you need is the AMR safety crew to maybe do a little a little dance around it and uh, lift one foot wow. up and, and the electronics in the car go, OK, fine then, whoosh. Well, well that was somebody, t you have to be a certain age to uh, remember this, I thought somebody did a fonz on it and just sort of give it an elbow. Or not just pointed at it, double fingers, double single oh. pistols and gone, A. Hey. No, it's just, it just cuts off. Cuts off the green light for the safe mode of the hybrid system is on in the windscreen uh, uh, the engine probably still running at that point although that is slightly downhill to turn number six and Delatraz in fairness looking for somewhere where he could get off the racing surface but stay on the hard surface I don't think he wanted to put the car on grass but that is extraordinary. Uh, Shea Adam, I'm sure, will be seeing Louis Delatraz in the pits. He, he won't be able to fasten his seat, seat belt uh, that easily himself. They might be able to, maybe with what happened to the sister car, they might have learned something from that of how to kick it out of this. And it, 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 to kick it out of this funk, if you like, and to get it back to the, the garage. But hopefully it won't require the same repair that took you know, over an hour. Well, well over an hour. Oh, Shea Adam back is... going like the clappers now. Well, Shea Adam... Well, the, the, there'll be a prototype class split, split. So, lots of flashing. And that is Delatraz. Delatraz is absolutely on it. Something clicked back into place. He restarted it. And he's trying to get back onto the end of the prototype field. I don't think he'll be able to come through the P2s. But that car's running nicely. Um, oh, okay. He's come through the P2s. So this is the GTP class split, but I haven't seen that call from race control yet. Uh, Shea Adam is our crowd strike pit reporter at this stage of the evening. Shea, any, any sign of the team expecting that car into the pits? Uh, no, the team was actually expecting him back in the garage. I saw them grab the skates and head back towards the uh, garage area, and now they're making their way back over to the pit lane. So, very interesting turn of events. Thanks, Shea. We'll uh, wait to see what happens. I was going to try and give you the cars out, as I said, it's not uh, very easy, but I've been keeping a note. That's uh, for certain the TDS racing number 11 is out. The Richard Mille 88 Corsa, the AF Corsa uh, run car. The Orica of United Autosports number 22. Uh, we've just heard that the 44 of Magnus Racing, the Aston Martin, that's gone. Uh, cars that aren't divisible by 11 with double numbers. Uh, that we haven't seen for a while include the Iron Lynx number 60 and the Wayne Taylor Racing uh, Lamborghini Huracans, those two. I've not seen official notification of those two. Um, I'm pretty certain we saw one for the 75. In fact, I'm sure I am. That's the Sun Energy 1 AMG. Uh, and the other car is the MDK by High Class Racing Orica, which, again, has been out of commission for quite some time. Uh, but we've not yet necessarily seen an official... Oh, in fact, here's another one. Car 60, now officially retired. 6-0. So that's an addition. So now we know that the Iron Lynx Lamborghini is definitely gone. Thank you, Race Control, for that. And that's part of your VP Racing in-race update. What a bizarre turner. He didn't, he didn't just knock the kill switch or something like that did it? No, no, no definitely I not. Hope not. No. Um, and what that means then, 
is that what that means then is that well they what our saviour has arrived into the, the international broadcast centre here with some donuts as we go back to green safety car into the pit lane just under uh, just over half distance to go 12 hours six and a half minutes and right round the outside that's a brave maneuver by the number 10 many 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 laps down for that car uh, with a spookily similar incident for its team car just a few moments ago and the Wayne Taylor Acura's not having the best of this Jack Aitken still leads from Lawrence Vantor in the number six that is the Porsche then the two BMWs working together maybe they lead the field onto the banking right now cars trying to make up positions and make up laps Looks like the number 85's right in there. It does mean, though, after that great recovery from Louis Delatraz, whatever he told that car to do to get it back going, he's still he's running on the same lap as the 01 Cadillac, the 85 uh, JDC Porsche, the Proton Competition Porsche as well. Just one lap off the leader, so game on for any of those cars. The only car that's out of contention in GTP is the number 10 Konica Minolta car after half the race distance. I think that's a, that's a pretty good effort from uh, for the GTP field. That is incredible, Peter. You're absolutely right. It's, uh, it is uh, Marcus Ericsson uh, who is in the number 10 Acura. He was pretty racy coming off there, but uh, he is uh, almost 100 laps down, actually. He's 98 laps down on the leader could be useful though if we get weather no, I think that was a useful. brilliant piece of deduction that you mentioned earlier on Peter so we'll see we'll, we'll see whether that whether there's the, nothing to lose for that car is there so if no. we do get weather remembering that there are no intermediate tires you have slicks you have wets uh, two compounds uh, a medium and a soft the softs can only be used until is it eight o'clock in the morning? Yes, I think it is. Eight o'clock in the morning. Or you can use mediums all night. It's your choice. But what you don't have is an in that you have a wet. And and unless it's fully wet, the wet will tear itself to oh, pieces. It will, it will overheat yeah. straight away. Any any wet tire would. Particularly with track temperatures still as high as they are, and they've been in a a pretty impressive range all the way through. Still showing 72 Fahrenheit on the track at 73 in the air so you can work that one out if you wish into uh, centigrade it's round about 22. 22 23 for both of them so that's humidity about, still 77 percent that's about four degrees celsius higher than what it was at this time uh, last year uh, Shay Adam down in the pit lane, the debut of the GT3 Ford Mustang this weekend. We had bootleg, trunk lid problems for both of the factory cars earlier on. And now, you've got one of them with you now. Uh, yeah, we've just had two of the three with rear end issues. The Again. 55 Proton competition run car, that's the GTD one, was in. They put a new bumper on, but that car lost a lap while it was in having the service done because the bumper wouldn't seat properly. There has been damage to the back of the 64 Mustang. Something has hit it on the left-hand side. It jarred the floor loose and actually broke the floor. So while they had the opportunity, brought the car in right off the green flag, not the ideal time for them. They pulled the floor off and then realized that they would not be able to get a new one on because there was too much damage to the existing carbon and tape wouldn't stick because it's very, very dirty. So now they're both trying to clean it and using the infamous lump hammer to try and knock bits of carbon loose so that maybe they can find something to drill a hole and then put a zip tie and maybe get the floor to fit back on. But this is devastating for the 64 Ford. Battle for the lead in P2 on the high banking after that crowd strike pit report from Shea Adam heading down towards the Le Mans chicane. Tom Dillman ahead of Connor Zilich, another ex Master racer. John Doon will be happy about that. Connor Zilich won more Master MX5 races last year than anyone else, but because he didn't do the full season, he didn't quite get to the top of the championship and he's chasing down. Tom Dillman at the moment 
with uh, Philippe Massa in third place, Matthew, Mac uh, Matthew Jacobson for CrowdStrike by Algar Pro Racing, then Ben Keating. Ben Keating restarted in the lead. Just biding his time in that car, he knows what he's got to do in the wins. Mission Food number two from United Autosport. A little gamble for uh, car number 31, Wheel and Engineering Cadillac Jack Aitken. It might not pay off here because they decided not to pit at the last proper caution, if you like, no, because we've had a short caution since. The last proper caution, our last opportunity to pit, they did not take it to stay out, maintain track position and pinch Michelin and Endurance mm. Cup points. But with a minute and 10 seconds to go, if Lawrence Vantor can really get on with it in car number six for Porsche, Penske Motorsport, he might be able to pinch it. It's at the conclusion of the lap, the after. first lap yeah. after. So we've got one minute to half distance. Get the memes ready, please. Uh, at Radio Show Limited on Insta, Radio Show LTD on Insta and on the platform formerly known as Twitter. It's at IMSA Radio, halfway there, memes to come. John Hindorf, Peter Mackay and Shea Adam in the pit lane. 30 seconds, so I don't think it's going to be the next lap around. It will not be this one. For the second tranche of Michelin Endurance Cup points, Jack Aiken comes under the brighter lights around the main grandstand, flashes under our feet with the gold and grey Cadillac. Four, three, two, one, half distance in the 62nd running of the Rolex 24 hours of Daytona. And it must be golden hour because uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi has just put in personal best lap of the race for that car, 146.430. Second, second lap in a row, he's done that, but he needs to because Alexander Sims put his car's fastest lap of the race just the lap before as well, that Corvette. There is uh, just about a second and a half between them. Incredible stuff through all of the battles in the four classes with Vanto unable to close down that Cadillac as soon as the Cadillac gets into its stride they want the longer green flag runs I remember people Durrani saying that I think on the grid to Nick Damon earlier on in our Michelin countdown to green they finished the se series last year very strongly indeed to take the championship and they've started this year exactly where they're left off. It's almost as if they just rolled straight back off the truck. Well, this is this was their key in last year's Rolex 24. They didn't get the win, but when we had really long green flag running, we had a six hour period of green flag and they just really charged into a big lead there, did the Cadillac, and it was the 0-1 on that occasion. This time it's the 31, the Whalen Engineering car, but make no mistake, every single GTP car, except the Konica Minolta Acura, is in with a shout. So nine out of 10 cars that started are still well in with a shout. We're all, at, we've, got, we've got five on the lead lap at the moment, and the other four are just one lap behind. So this is, this is anybody's motor race. Let's uh, get some reaction from down in the pit lane. We've still got that Ford Mustang number 64 with uh, all kinds of uh, work going on to the rear. Shea Adam is our CrowdStrike pit reporter with Dennis Olsen. For the number 55 Proton competition, Ford Mustang with Ford factory driver Dennis Olsen. Dennis, things seem to be going so well for you, but now the car is back in again. They changed the bumper the last time. Looks like they're doing the floor this time. What's happened with your Mustang? Um, we were running well. Um, we didn't have any issues, but uh, yeah, Marco got hit on the last restart. Uh, we lost the rear light, so that's why we changed the rear bumper, and uh, he went out again, and a lot of vibration on the rear. So we're going to try to uh, change the diffuser, but hopefully there is no damage on the center floor so we can connect it again. How important is this race now as a learning session for the remainder of the season for the team? Uh, it's going to be a big learning for sure, I mean, uh, for the whole crew, but 
uh, we came here not only to learn, we wanted to fight for the win and uh, hopefully we can fix it quickly, have a couple more yellows and we'll be back on the lead lap and try to fight at the end. Only halfway there, good luck. Thanks. Yeah, Molly Alicia was the quickest in, halfway there, lizard on a chair. Uh, we'll take them all, not a problem. I I think, John, this, this this brand new Ford Mustang GT3 has run very, very strongly. It's run reliably. They've done a lot of testing. What they probably haven't, well, I could be wrong, but probably what they haven't practiced in testing is having contact from the rear, which does happen even just little taps here and there all the way through. The field has been so close. I think this is something that's showing up in a race that they won't have seen in testing. What did we see, though, when the Ferrari came in at the Nürburgring last year? They had a way of taking off the rear end in almost in modules to be able to replace the diffuser really quickly. Now, this is a front engine car. The Ferrari is a mid engine car, um, which you, know, you can say there's pluses and minus for each, but it shouldn't be any more difficult for a front engine car to a mid engine car. If it's a rear engine car, like a Porsche, where you have to have some structure around that engine when it's hanging. Uh, out, out over the back wheels okay but this new mustang is along with the corvette is taking the gt3 category into another new era pushing it even further than the 296 has done but i'll take you back a couple of seasons peter do you remember when bmw debuted the new m4 here what did they have real trouble with they had trouble with rear diffusers and they, their their struts were breaking that was curb strike as well as side strikes from uh, other manufacturers. As the aerodynamic regulations allow, you can come quite a long way out because that's the way the GT3 regs are. And you're right, they're vulnerable. The, the car has got to be able to take a hit because it's it's these the GT3 now, it's not just an endurance racing car, far from it. It, it needs to do 24 hour races. But you look at like the DTM, for example, it's a very good example. The DTM are using the GT3 as a base car. And well, the, the, the action there is pretty fierce and contact is regular. So the cars have to take it. Um, and that's something you hear it all the time and you think, yeah, okay, it's just a, a cliche when teams say, oh, when you, when, you go, when you go out and testing, you only get certain things showing up in the race. That's when you really get to see what a car is going to do but this is a perfect example of it the car is just not seeming to take contact um, very well yet but they'll get to it it was the number 31 wheel and engineering car that took will take the five points for the michelin endurance cup as oh shay adam this is terrible news for the customer mustang the light blue and white car it's not going forwards and it's not going backwards under its own steam uh, people power not, not pony power in this case uh, no they couldn't get the floor reseated so they are pushing it back to the brake of the wall this car will drive back to the garage it does not have a difficult to access garage it is a first row garage which is big but the 64 mustang rumbles by it with its pony power that's going straight back through the pit lane that's a drive-through penalty for something john what was that uh that is the 64, 64. the mustang and that was refueling whilst on the stands so that's the drive-through there uh we had our porsche keys to the race which included no pit penalties uh, they weren't listening were they good battle in gtd pro alessandro Pegidi by half a second from Alex Sims, that's Reese versus Pratt and Miller. Well, we've said that before. 62 red Ferrari from bright yellow number three. And at the moment, Alexander Sims just going through in the wheel tracks of the Ferrari through the Le Mans chicane onto the high banks again. Coming up in around about 10 minutes, we head into the the Night Owls Night Shift, powered by Sacred Coffee. And welcome Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones into the Global Broadcast Centre. They'll be fueling themselves up with Sacred Coffee, available in the US as well as in Europe. And with a special Penske Coffee blend as well that's available. 
in so, the US. So they've got the unfair advantage to get them through the night. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, very good. Now, I like it. <laughs> the Corvette here now has five. Alexander Sims has got five laps more fuel in the tank than the uh, Rizzi Competizione Ferrari has of Pierre Guidi. But in the meantime, they just drink in a battle of two GT greats. Pierre Guidi versus Sims, two of the very best at their craft. Shea Adam with her bat ears uh, picking up a problem for one of the Porsches. Shay, what did you hear on the try over last time by? From the bottom of the number 92 Porsche, so I think their floor might be coming a little bit loose for the Kelly Moss entry. Uh, not looking like a repeat of uh, success previously in the weekend. Not going to spoil which race it was, though. Ah, can't there, there, you it does. there we go. Um, no, but I am anticipating pit stops for some of the GTP cars, namely, as Peter very rightly said, Jack Aiken running around with a lot less energy than everyone else. He's on zero energy now. Yep. He's actually regenning uh, as he comes down the waters also uh, Marcus Eriksson he's on uh, only 5% energy everyone else up in the 40s and 50s Bar uh, Barfus in the BMW as he's down to 35% so he's got the least of the cars uh, who uh, were in most recently and here on cue comes our leader Jack Aiken I don't think that was even fumes. I think that was just sheer willpower from Jack Aiken. He jumps out of the Wayland Engineering Cadillac and in goes Tom Blomquist as into the pit lane. Also comes the number 10, got a penalty car. That is Marcus Erickson staying aboard. He is getting a drinks bottle changed up. Fuel and four sticker tires for Tom. So he is not having to share tires with his teammate, which is very kind of uh, Peter Barron up on the wall making the strategy calls to let the new guy have some new rubber. They did do a windshield tear off as well. Wow, they really like Tom. Good to see that he's fitting in really well with this team. Waiting on the fuel as the last part of this stop. And the nozzle comes out. Wonkvist fires it up. There we go. Had to wait for the kick of the uh, Cadillac power. They start on electric power. Uh, roll forward effectively. That's saving the starter motor. And... What they're effectively doing is if you had your mates pushing you down the street and they have a a process where they effectively bump start the engine so the big racing engine is not turning when they come out of the pits and it's only 10 yards or so down the pit lane that they in mechanical terms they drop the clutch um, and it's in gear and clunk off it goes and it bump starts the engine unfortunately if you're uh, marking off on your spotter's guide uh, get your marker pen of doom out unfortunately because the number 27 heart of racing Aston Martin ah. has been retired they were going to try and fix it we heard from Marco Sorensen in our crowd strike pit lane report an hour or so ago but no no luck uh, unfortunately now a, a little bit of colour to uh, what she mentioned on the that she uh, great spot to hear that number 92 Kelly Moss car that car uh, we got a, a picture sent in a screenshot from Tim Fulbrook thank you Tim um, that the front left of the car of that 92 Kelly Moss Porsche had got a bit of damage and he reckons that's the damn the debris which caused the last yellow so wow. there could be all like you say there's a lot of bits and pieces of evidence heading towards a conclusion there we'll try and get proper confirmation if we can but it's all pointing to one outcome uh, Nigel Dobby hello how are you uh, night hours he says I've just had breakfast in France well yes it's nearly eight o'clock second place for Alexander Sims Nigel Sunday morning croissant yeah lovely absolutely great uh, and I've just seen on my messages that uh, we've got a sacred coffee offer as well for you and now I can't find it so I might have to leave that to Johnny and Bruce in the night elves powered by sacred coffee oh there we are night shift coming through I'll repost that 20% off yeah 20% off your orders of sacred coffee 
from Sacred Coffee Sport or Sacred Coffee in the US. Uh, use the code Campbell20, C A M P B E W L. I'll repost that on at IMSA Radio. Shay Adam. Well, Jack Aiken, you did what you won out there to do, which was get the most Michelin Endurance Cup points as possible as the defending champion in the GTP class. And now the good news, the team has pizza for you behind the uh, tent. How much do you think you earned it on that stint? Uh, yeah, I was working a bit harder than usual. There were a few nice on-track battles with the other guys, and um, still a lot of traffic out there, so it's um, keeping you on your toes. I'm glad to be out of the car and have a nice rest now. How much of a rest do you actually get with only the three drivers cycling through the car? I mean, now that we're in the night and it's a little bit cooler, we'll try and extend the stints a little bit so we grab a bit more time out of the car as well. Um, I think if you've got three capable capable guys, then it's not too bad. Uh, but ask me again tomorrow. <laughs> you were the one who took the car to the checkered flag at Sebring, so we know that you can win a race, but also you're in the car with Pippo Durrani and Tom Blancas, guys who know how to win this race. Any discussion of who's going to be finishing? Uh, the discussion was short, it was, I think it can be any of us, which is a bit of a luxury. So um, it gives us a bit more flexibility at the end of the race. We don't have to sort of anticipate the driver rotation at all. Um, you know, we'll see how we feel physically and uh, go off of that. But uh, yeah, we all feel pretty comfortable with the car. You've got a cool helmet design for this weekend and it's got a thistle on the back of it. Do you have Scottish heritage? Yep, so uh, on my dad's side of the family we're Scottish. Uh, to go to the South Korean side on my mum's side. So, yeah, I've got um, the, the thistle colours, which is like a national emblem of Scotland, a prickly nature, but a beautiful flower, so two sides. Yeah. Love it, thanks. Great job out there. Thank you. Deep into the night, very nearly two o'clock in the morning then, and it is the Night Owls stint for the next four hours, powered by Sacred Coffee. And uh, I hope you're settled in, and have been in fact from the start of the race, because only now is this starting to really get serious. And the old saying with the Daytona 24 hours is that if you're in it still with 22 hours to go, then there's really a chance of a good result. But this race has a habit of having twists and turns until literally the 23rd and 24th hours. So we're going to pay close attention, of course, throughout the various classes and for the rest of the running, which is 11 hours and 44 minutes. My name's Johnny Palmer. I'm delighted to be joined by Bruce Jones in the global commentary booth right here on RS2 IMSA Radio. And we'll keep you in tune with what's going on in the pit lane as well. Just heard from Shay Adam. And uh, we'll keep switching around with our pit reports, powered by CrowdStrike throughout the course of the night. And then on into that wonderful sunrise, which is so synonymous with this venue. Good morning to you, Bruce. Good morning, JP. Middle of the night in Florida, and uh, the most amazing thing coming into the studio, sitting down in the Global Broadcast Center and seeing the graphic at the side of the screen, the four classes, GTP, LMP2, GTD Pro, and GTD, and the biggest gap between first to fourth in those, that about 20 minutes ago was just under 10 seconds. Most of them down to fractions of a second. Um, okay, subsequently we've had a little flurry of cars running in and out of the pits, but you want your race to be tight the whole way through. It keeps everybody interested. And again, looking at the, the followers out on Twitter, there is so much interest. Then you look where they come from as well and find out it is a global event and uh, people really, I think, increasingly do stay up through the day, the night, wherever they are to follow these great races. And uh, so I think we really are set for a, a cracking four hours in the booth. Lawrence Van Tor is the leader of the race after 394 laps and uh, it's a gap of well chopping and changing a little bit through the last split back to Maxime Martin was 11 and a bit seconds so Porsche Penske Motorsports with their 963 entering its second season from the two BMW M team RLL uh, new prototypes again new as in, in the sense that they've had a season's run in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship already. They'll be breaking into the, the World Endurance Championship for the first time in 2024. So BMW spreading their wings, but in a sense, this is ground that they know well, not only now from GTP, 
but also from their GT, uh, GTLM days, I suppose, too. Plenty of data from that. Data is everything. One of the intriguing things whenever you come in and sit down and examine the screens is how things have changed in the four hours since you last looked at them. And just noticing, noticing that the race leader, Lawrence Van Tor, Porsche Penske Motorsport, 23 pit stops thus far. And the BMWs behind him in second and third, Maxime Martin in the 25 car, Augusto Farfus in the 24, 17 and 16 respectively. My maths is good enough to know that people are doing things in different fashions uh, as they go through this race. Ever has been the case, but really the 23 pit stops for number six to me is the outstanding element in that and something that uh, could need drilling down to. But uh, Lawrence Van Dor Tor setting very respectable pace at the moment. Um, in fact, pulling clear of Maxime Martin. Okay, you can't just have a vignette of a lap but uh, a second and a half gained in the race lead last time around by the flying belgian so clearly all is good all is sweet at the moment two o'clock in the morning on the dot here in florida for the 62nd edition of the daytona 24 hours we're just enjoying a wonderful sound in the background of alexander sims corvette which is pursuing alessandro pierre guidi's ferrari by just 0.3 of a second so very much in the box seat it always surprises me to be just a smidge over halfway through this race and for gtd pro and is as an example to be separated by less than half a second and they're just pounding round through the trioval and back onto the infield uh, that feeling of deja vu because uh, this is a i suppose it's it's because the track is in such a confined area but it's also a relatively short circuit as well you just get to know every single corner intimately it's very simple to draw on a map it you've learnt it probably after three laps but then you haven't learned the secrets until you've been here about 20 times 20 years i'm talking about uh, event after event yeah and uh, again you look at the sh format of a track but the difference with a shift of a few degrees in temperature is just enormous in terms of grip and uh over the last, uh, well, still just about coming to a conclusion that D Dubai 24 hours, they've got, of course, the shifting sands that blow across the track as well to just uh, keep the drivers absolutely on the toes. But uh, thankfully here, a little further inland and uh, doesn't uh, get the sand blowing in off the beach. That would be quite something, riding high on the banking and finding there's uh, only 10% of the grip you had the previous time around. But uh, all really good. But Alexander Sims getting closer and closer to the... GTD Pro class leader, which is the 62 Ritzy Competizione Ferrari, Alessandro Piaghidi. When you look at the history of race history, uh, career history of race dri racing drivers, some just have a habit of winning races, others pick off titles. Piaghidi has been phenomenal in recent years. It doesn't seem to matter what sort of Ferrari he gets into, he absolutely flies in them. And, um, you know, he's, he's clearly just got the whole mental setup as well as all the driving speed and uh, you do need these faculties it's not just about as we know Johnny not just about planting a foot and just seeing where it takes you and uh, be an international GT champion uh, GT World Endurance Championship chip winner in 2021 phenomenal season and last year won that race in France in June didn't he of oh, course the Mans 24 hours quite famous 100th year 100th running of that sorry 100th year of that event the centenary event Ferrari arrived have been at the top class since the 1960s and boom Hey presto, he was one of the winning crew. Also fascinating to compare chariots in this GT Daytona Pro fight because you've got the three litre turbocharged V6 of the Risi Competizione Ferrari 296 of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Compare that to the number three Corvette, which is naturally aspirated, five and a half litre lump in the uh, middle of this car and uh, V8 for the Corvette Z06 GT3R, which is an out and out GT3 car for this year rather than an adapted GTE model. Yeah, again, ever it should be. I love variety and different ways of uh, chasing after one particular goal, which is winning your class, winning the race outright and uh, long may it last and i think you know with um, the gt in the gt world we've just got so many more manufacturers involved than uh, we've had for almost living memory so it's really exciting times and for alexander sims you just mentioned he's very close to class leading gtd pro of course he was running in in prototypes in the gtp class last year took the title right at the end of the season to some people to his mind in fact even alexander sims himself has said it just wasn't quite working for him, wasn't quite feeling he was right on it. And then stepped down to GTD Pro, but the best way of kicking off your championship would be to take a class victory. And maybe, just maybe, he'll manage that in that number number three Corvette racing 
entry there shared with Antonio Garcia and Danny Juncadea. Gosh, that's quite a lineup in that car. That's what we call probably GTD Pro Plus. Indeed, uh, not strictly a category, but I know entirely what you're saying. Around the world on RS2, IMSA Radio, we're at the track, of course, too, so uh, I'm sure you've found us by now, but 107.9 FM, WDIS, and on Sirius XM channel 207. And delighted now, from uh, this point for the next four hours, to be joined by uh, all the, everybody consuming this race on NBC and via Peacock as well. It's Johnny and Bruce, the Daytona Night Owls, powered by Sacred Coffee. And we cannot take our eyes off, first of all, the GTD Pro fight between Ferrari and Corvette, and not too far away, the Lamborghini Huracan, just 6.7 seconds back for Frank Pereira in his Iron Lynx number 19 car, but also keeping a keen eye on the 14, nearly 15 second fight between Paul Schapensky Motorsports 963 for Laurent Vantor, and uh, all of a sudden the Ferrari, I noticed it disappeared from in front of Alexander Sims, that's because it pitted though, right, Bruce? Well, it was, uh, I looked at my moving oh, monitor, it? it was right there, and I looked down at the timing screen, and there it wasn't, but uh, I think it had, let's oh, was take there, was a look. change no, there? No, it was a part change at the start of the lap, it's there was four fine. tenths It's between. fine, Bruce, it's come in the pits. I, I thought oh. all of a sudden Sims had pulled off a stonky manoeuvre around the outside, and I was looking down at a timing screen, but it came in the pits, we're fine. Phew. <laughs> 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 Need a bit more sacred coffee to get those eyes even wider open. Uh, well, yes, uh, but uh, you know we are blessed with about 17 screens here. So as I said, question of uh, where to look next. Funny that I just uttered the words, I can't take my eyes off this battle, and then I did. <laughs> Here's the 62 Risi Competizzi Ferroni, uh, Ferrari, Ferroni, Ferrari, and uh, thanks to Shay Adam as well, who just buzzed in my ears. Yes, Johnny, it definitely just came in for a routine stop, and nice bit of wheel spin there to get it back underway. That was far too fast to get to get uh, a driver change done there and Tower Motorsports also in Michael Dynan's brought the Orica LMP2 car from sixth position down pit road Felipe Massa has also pitted for Riley in the LMP2 category so that's going to mean an automatic change of lead because Tom Dillman in the 52 into Europol by PR1 Matson Motorsport Orica will retake the lead uh, I haven't mentioned it too, too much about uh, LMP2 because that started to span out a touch but the nice thing is they're close enough within that category for everything to totally change complexion with just one pit stop so Massa will now level things up in fact that car's pitted 19 times whereas Dillman, no 19 as well so yeah Massa's taking that stop that he owed us and it'll put Dillman to lead for into Europol Era Motorsports, Connor Zillish second in the 18 car and Malta Jakobsen for CrowdStrike Racing by APR, the 04 car, now running in third bruise. Yeah, really, in the space of 10 minutes, chopping and changing, but of course that happens in the cycle of pit stops. Track conditions look absolutely fantastic out there, and I must say, every time you look at the Daytona International Speedway, it looks great in the day, but it looks so much better by night, and so much illumination on that infield um, run between turns one and turn six and it gets a little darker out on the banking but the drivers have got their their laser eye focus on what lies ahead and it's all about positioning your car when you turn out of uh, turn six to have that long run around uh, half of the banking effectively and then down as it flattens out levels out when they get to the Le Mans chicane a corner that still even with all the practice sessions at Daytona you still get drivers getting caught out going into that uh, chicane left right right left is the format but uh, you've got to get the car absolutely nailed down there yeah, and uh, that tightrope of setup that is so difficult to get right, and that's the reason why there's so much running for this particular weekend, but then the roar before the 24 as well, when qualifying for the main race was done, but there's lots of extra free practice there too. You can choose to have a car that's very, very strong up on the high banks and the long straights, but then you're going to be nowhere for the infield section, which is so crucial. 65 car and the number four Corvette overlapping there and that was Dirk Muller in the Ford Multimatic Motorsports Mustang seventh place in class being lapped by Earl Bamber so not a change for position but Earl Bamber 16.7 seconds adrift of the new GTD Pro leader Alexander Sims so it's a Corvette Racing 1-2 for the Z06 and a car that you would have expected to be really in contention goes a lap down, but then to say that here at Daytona, it's very easy to fall off the lead lap, and you shouldn't necessarily think all is lost, because you can gain lap backs, 
if there are such a things as cautions, I utter that word advisedly, it would be great to have some sustained running in the darkness hours. With that, one of the GTPs sweeps by the number 65 Mustang and runs a little too deep, actually, into the International Horseshoe. Just about gets away with it. Great driving manners there, though. Running completely different classes, completely different battles. But, yeah, again, it just shows how hard the drivers are having to push because there's an element of risk there. Are you sure the driver in front has paid attention to you coming through? Oh, hold on a second. You haven't quite got the uh, downforce you're wanting. And uh, sliding a little bit wide through the Horseshoe. It really is a circuit of, of just such two parts in so many ways you've got the horseshoe where it just feels almost like a european circuit in so many ways and then you get on the banking there's no other place in the world you'd be other than uh, the usa and for the drivers it's something that is just so enticing when you look at the images they're iconic the cars going around the banking at night going past the individual uh, laps the standards at the side of the circuit high above the wall and then the different shapes of headlights, the different speeds of cars approaching. Do you recognize another car in the dark? You can tell which class it is, possibly by the closing speed. However, these are things that just you don't learn, I was going to say overnight, you do have to learn them overnight, but you don't uh, get them right at the very outset. So as much as you're trying to set up your own car, you've got to be sure of the etiquette out on the banking. And it's always fascinating to me how little running you actually get in darkness hours, considering the bulk of this race is held uh, without uh, sunshine and it's uh, well over 12 hours worth as the 04 car has just come down into pit road and we'll get fuel only in that car zero one Is it? pardon zero one car for Alex Palo in the Cadillac and it's fuel only says Shea so Palo keen to get his teeth into his next stint and it's fuel and tires for the number seven car of Dane Cameron, so pitting from third position for the Porsche uh, Penske Motorsport 963. Matt Campbell will be the next driver lined up to take the next stint, and there's a drama for Kiffin Simpson in the 81 Dragon Speed Orica. Something flailing, it's a tyre down, I reckon, on the front right corner. Yeah, front front right has got a square bottom, which isn't yeah. a good sign. The air has gone from that, the tyre wall's about to, to come loose as well. Anyhow, he's done well, Kiffin getting back into the pit lane, the Orica, car number 81, eighth in class, but that would have been a slow in-lap back to the pits. Didn't pick up exactly where the tyre went down, but uh, resting around that final corner to dive into pit in, well done to Kiffin Simpson. So Elton Julian and the gang will go, good job, right, get it changed, and uh, let's get that car back out on the deck. So Alex Polo, as Shea described to us off air, uh, has stayed on board for probably the best part of uh, another hour's worth of action. Assuming uh, nothing untoward happens elsewhere during this stint, but the teams have always got to be ready to be plunged into completely a different direction from a strategy point of view. And very often, if there is the cause to uh, clean up an incident, then you can expect to be under caution for 20 or so minutes and then a decision to be taken generally the call is to get into the pits should we have a yellow but uh, the teams will be delighted in well um, sucking up all the data that is provided by a good clean spell so this will help them when they're trying to back time and yeah it seems a strange thing to say 11 and a half hours away from the checker but they'll still be trying to work out how many stints there are to go from this point. And if you've just done a pit stop, that's possibly easier to do. One thing that really impresses me, and is the change in, in this race, is the, the age of some of the drivers. Kiffin Simpson, the driver from Barbados, who just brought the uh, Dragon Speed Orica into the pits, he's still only 19 years old. He's already been a champion in the European Le Mans series last year, so he's clearly got the pedigree, but a few years ago he just made ditch his toe in the water, Formula Regional Americas, and uh, here he is, cool, calm, collected, bringing that Dragon Speed Orica in with the flat tyre, not panicking. You can't replace that. You can have the speed, but you've got to have the, the experience and the mental acuity to just keep on top of the situations you didn't want to occur. Up on the banking, at Daytona, the uphill front tyre is the one that's gone flat. Yeah. Stay cool, he did. Yeah, well far more left-handers than right-handers around this place funnily enough being a, an anti-clockwise circuit and also though that first sequence of, of turn one into a much tighter turn two can chew through the front right tire especially considering how the aero works on these cars lots of pressure on the nose 
uh, by design but you can if you're stretching if you've gone a little bit radical on the canvas not suggesting that particular car has done uh, but that's then very difficult to fine tune once you get to the race so you have to often live with a setup like it or not uh, from the from the off and uh, we're a long way into this race now but that may just be a bit too much curb strike or a lock up here and there that can easily be done coming off the banking and onto the infield section well race leader Lawrence Van Tor into the pits the number six Pe Porsche Penske Motorsport uh, 963 looked like a, a clear regular pit stop it's always that moment when you look into the the eyes of the driver sitting in the car during during the pit stop what's he taking on board clearly he knows he's going out for another stint so stayed on board but uh, what are they thinking of what time's my flight on Sunday night no it's not mm, it's of course they're, they're, you know they've just got to focus on the next stint how's the car handling is it going to be a, a new set of tires put on my car they, they will know in advance oh, oh dearie me the JDC Miller Porsche 963 stuttering to get away from its pit pit box and then <laughs> trying to come into the very neighboring one always happens like that the Iron Dames Lamborghini uh, coming to a halt the bright pink Lamborghini waiting for a driver change there well, Sarah Bovey brought it in. She had to be very alert to that uh, JDC Miller GTP car being on the move, but really they should have waited for the 83 to find its box. The problem is they are very near neighbours. So now that Lamborghini, the 83 Iron Dames car, has come in at a very oblique angle and had to straighten it up using the dolly jacks so away it goes and we could very easily have had contact there as one car tries to leave the other one arrives and actually the jdc miller car stalled on the way through as well had it got away cleanly that might not have been such a close call lessons to be learned from that one michelle getting getting on board so the belgian racer sarah Bobby hops out of the car the other tall driver in the lineup because rahel fry is uh, rather shorter in stature and then you've got dorian pa who for most of the last year he used to be carried around by Michel Gatting every time he had a bit of social media poor, poor Dorian was being hurled around like a rag doll I know that's because she requested it she, it could well be yeah yeah that's how she got places <laughs> <laughs> when I said I wanted a lift I didn't mean a physical one yeah indeed um, but that, I mean the one thing that so they're not short of in that crew is humour oh they're uh, fantastic yeah uh, and whether that be in person or via social media just endless entertainment but then when the helmet goes on and the door goes down of that Lamborghini this year that boy do they mean business and they've got some tremendous results through the years whether it be in a Ferrari in the past Porsche last year in ACO rules racing and this Lamborghini in the GT3 world yeah and I mean in the World Endurance Championship last year of course it was the bronze drivers in in the bottom in the bottom GT class that that would go out and for, for, to try and set uh, the qualifying times and uh, Sarah Bovey was just grabbing class pole positions by the by the cluster by the handful yeah yeah they know how to do it and the 83 they car 85 car rather rejoining as we can head to pit road to Shay Adam to hear from Louis Denatras Louis a couple of big questions for you but the first thing what happened out there when the car completely turned off uh, to be honest I have no idea obviously we got it's very sad what happened to the tent, which lost, I don't know, 40 laps or something. The car just switched off and uh, very similar for us. I was out of turn five and yeah, the car switched off. So at that point I thought it was game over. I tried to power cycle, it didn't work. Uh, I went out, pressed the outside buttons, went back in, power cycled again and it restarted. So no idea if it's me or just some time, but I mean, it's back on. We only lost a lap, which is, means we're still in the race. And uh, yeah, the car still fast, so hopefully we get it to the end. How did you manage to get your belts done up again? Sorry? How did you manage to get your belts done up again? It's hard enough to do it when you're sitting here in the pit lane. It's very hard. Actually, it was quite quick. Also, the marshal helped me a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think we don't see so well in this prototype. So put the head down, pull the head net, and just try it. I mean, it's survival. We have to get the car back on quick. So maybe it is luck turning your way a little bit. As you said, it's still early on, only one lap down. This team is not giving up. Definitely the lap is not a problem, luck, I don't know if we can call this luck. Uh, but definitely we're trying to find base and push to the front. Thanks, Louis. Louis Delatra is chatting to Shea Adam in that crowd strike pit report. And it goes back to my point that you, he's said definitely not a problem to get the lap back, but we possibly have bigger fish to fry right now. From the number 40, Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti Acura. And uh, Wayne Taylor quite public, actually, to Joe Bradley earlier in the weekend, suggesting that the pace on the face of things was OK, but when you link lots of laps together and create a stint, he just felt that they were nowhere, and it's very easily... We could be lapped 
we could end up a few laps down and um, Wayne it, it felt he knew precisely the reason why that was he just didn't want to tell Joe at the time and uh, may not be particularly forthcoming towards the end of the race if he gets the result they think they might but you just never know with this place because I've heard people really uh, very concerned about how the how a Daytona 24 hours may go and then by Sunday afternoon they've won the thing so who well, knows oh well let's face it Wayne Taylor run cars have won an awful lot of things in the True. Daytona 24 hours but certainly in that interview on, on Friday he really was down in the shoulder it must be said and uh, we couldn't see his face at the time but I imagine the corner of his mouth were going down was a little twinkle in his eye I didn't get that coming from Joe well, plenty of action in the GT Daytona Pro class, and it was Ferrari versus Corvette for many, many laps. The Corvette we're talking about was the number three, and driving that, Alexander Sims, but he's now out of the car show. Alexander, you were the defending GTP champion, and you just got out of the Corvette, which is your full season ride, from the lead of the Daytona 24 hours. I think Gibson Racing really likes you. Well, it's just, just fun being back in a Corvette. Um, you know, mixing it with the, the top guys in GTD, cars feeling really nice. Um, yeah, I've said it plenty of times already, but um, yeah, it just, just feels more natural to drive these things for me. So, um, yeah, really, really enjoying it so far. What's it like working with this group of people that you've been with before as a third driver, but now primary guy? Well, um, yeah, it's nice to have a bit more responsibility because as the third driver, you generally just get stuck in the middle of the race and uh, told to do your job, don't mess it up and bring it back in one piece. Um, expecting this season to have a, a bit more responsibility, um, which is cool, but um, yeah, the Pratt Miller guys know how to run a good car, a slick race, um, give me all the, the help that I need. So yeah, it's, it's been a great start to the season, but yeah, really looking forward to, the, to what's to come as well. Are you sure you were just out in the car for a long time because you look very calm, cool and collected? How comfortable is the Corvette to drive? Well, honestly, it's working pretty well in the night. Um, the balance is nice, not having to fight it too much. But um, yeah, I had plenty of lads sat behind the, the Ferrari in the slipstream and just just holding on to him. Um, really good fun, really good fun out there. I caught, yeah, as I said, the Corvette's working well. Um, we'll we just got to keep the thing in one piece. No, no knocks or anything, and uh, be there at the end. Fingers crossed for the number three Corvette. Thanks, Alexander. Thanks a lot, Shay. There's another crowd strike pit report with Shay Adam chatting to Alexander Sims, sharing that car this year with uh, Antonio Garcia and Daniel Juncader. I'm not sure whether that's whether whether Alex has had to learn a little bit of Spanish. Mind you, those two guys can speak exemplary English, so I don't know. Maybe a bit of a combination of the two together with uh, some mean Detroit uh, to mix in with it as well but the Corvette he's very happy with and funnily enough it can be quite relaxing I suppose to just be in the slipstream of another car because the Ferrari was doing a lot of the hard work there punching the hole in the air and making the process not particularly not especially easy for Alexander Sims but uh, as comfortable as it might be in the GT Daytona Pro car and that suggests to me that he wasn't, you know, as, as eager necessarily to get by the Ferrari because you can also f save a bit of fuel, quite a bit of fuel, when you're not having to create that aero force. Yeah, and I, th I think you don't become beguiled by it, but you're sitting there and you're just, if I'm matching their pattern, I'm doing a good job, they're taking the airflow off the front of my car, you know, that might help a bit with fuel consumption. And it was a, a really good measured drive there from Alexander Sims. He's always a good interview. And, um, you know, again, Shay wasn't entirely sure he'd been in the car, he looked so cool, calm and collected, but that, that is Alexander, he just has things very, very much under control. The pit lane remarkably empty at this, uh, this point in the early morning, and again it's that huge speed differential as the cars are wending their way towards the exit of the pit lane, which of course doesn't come out into turn one, that would be disastrous as the cars are coming off the banking, but you have to go around, take a couple of left hands, and then you rejoin the circuit, uh, just coming up towards uh, turn two as the cars go into the International Horseshoe. But uh, again, it's just a wonderful high shot when the cameras look down onto the cars, and just the speed differential is astonishing. So the change for the lead of the race just a few moments ago involved Tom Blomqvist getting a phenomenal run on Laurence Vantor. This was coming out of the second uh, speedway corner, so turn two on the high banks, and around the outside into the Le Mans chicane. Boy, uh, did uh, Tom Blomqvist need to know the dimensions of his Cadillac to know that he was safe 
to break into the chicane and not clip the nose of Laurence Vantor. So that's heads up driving and then some. Uh, but obviously the slingshot out of, well not just turn two, and not really turn one either, but it, it all started coming off the infield up onto the, uh, the heavily cambered section and Blomqvist had that marginal slightly better run than Lawrence Vantor which all came to a head in the braking area for the chicane. And you know I just think that's indicative of the form the Cadillacs have had coming into this race every time they've been out on the track they've been looking super good but maybe that's one of their super strengths going up on the banking in terms of straight line speed they look very very effective. You know when you put racing cars side by side in that imaginary world in our heads some just look sleeker than others, and the Cadillac has looked amazing ever since it's come out. It's always had a burst of speed, but I really do think this year they're going to start uh, reaping the rewards. But for Tom Blockford, two wins in a row, 2022 and 2023, victories here, but he was racing an Acura, of course, in both of those uh, for the, the Maya Shank team. But uh, right now he's really adapting very, very well indeed to the Cadillac. And uh, 19 pit stops under his belt, we talked about this before. Five pit stops more for the car he's just overtaken, which is the number number six uh, Porsche 963 from Porsche Penske Motorsports. So doing things differently, but Blockfist made it look easy going around the outside of Lawrence Van Tour. Lawrence not very long into this stint though, so settling down. But you know, you we, we talk about what you try and do through the long, long night at Daytona. We just heard it from Alexander Sims: don't damage the car. Yeah. And so if you've got a choice and someone's really pushing you, you know, sometimes it's better just to let them go. Very difficult to negotiate all of this uh, GTD and Pro traffic on the infield for Tom Blomqvist now. But he was calm and collected and knowing that you don't need to do anything heroic on the infield. You've just got to allow the gaps to emerge slowly and surely because if you try and press the issue too much you can be speared off onto the grass and worse into the concrete wall which is on driver's left and if you go far enough driver's right as well so you've just got to allow the GT traffic to almost make the gap for you it's a bit like driving a, a cop car or an ambulance through busy traffic and just you know not try and force the the gap to open just to allow it to do so in a natural way and now his reward is an open road just about GTD Pro and uh, GTD traffic staying well over to the left as they're instructed to do in the driver's briefing into the tri-oval and now a clear road in front through the blind corner of turn number one albeit briefly because right up ahead in the international horseshoe is a big collection of tail lights and the second place car of Laurence Vantor is obviously going to find this traffic a couple of seconds behind so needing to brake just before he overtakes one of the two bright yellow Pratt & Miller Corvettes, that I think was the number four car of Earl Bamber, who had time to stay over, well over to the right just before that kink between the two horseshoes. Yeah, it's just working out where you're going to place your cars in certain classes. And I was reading, reading someone's autobiography a while ago who raced at Daytona, naming no names, quite a long time ago. And he said he'd been instructed, you don't go high on the banking, that's where the quick cars come through. But he said the first time he was up on the banking, he didn't, didn't manage to spot a quicker car coming up and just happened, happened to drift up there. And somehow the quicker car got through without uh, touching car or wall. But afterwards he had to come into the pits with a sort of inbuilt excuse. Oh yes, I had an electrical problem. But he said that was absolutely eye-opening. I was back in the 80s, the lights on the cars were very different indeed, the speed differentials seemed to be even larger, got away with it, but uh, again, it's all about gaining the experience and, and trust in your car as well, but it really is, if you're in a GT class car, you stay low and the prototypes come through above. Now the five Proton Competition Mustang Sampling 963 in the GTP class, that's recently had to serve a drive-through for the same reasons as the number six which runs in second place in the hands of Laurence Vantor and that's the failure to adhere to the controlled powertrain parameters so something again within this season's regulations that everyone say everyone the team managers need to keep a watchful eye on plus uh, no doubt a dedicated engineer it's the same reason for the amount of pit stops for the number six compared to the other GTP cars the six has also had a stop and hold for 10 seconds and had to reserve a drive-through penalty as the, the uh, light at the end of the pit lane indicating that the pit was closed came on as they got to the pit limiter line so effectively they were beyond almost the point of no return but nevertheless the pit light comes on means you can't breach it and they unfortunately did so the six has not had a pleasant time of late 
Meanwhile, hearing in the background now one of the two BMWs, hybrid V8, Rene Rast in third, Dries Van Tour in fifth, and the BMW for a time has a spell up in second place. It will have led laps as well previously. It's uh, when you combine the gaps between Blomqvist and La Von Tour and then back to Rast's car, about 30 seconds back when the lap time around here is 137, 138, occasionally 139. So they're about a third of a lap back from the race leading car of Tom Blomqvist. It's 2.30 in the morning here in Florida for the 62nd edition of the Daytona 24 hours. I'll give you a rundown actually of how we sit with 12 hours and nearly 49 minutes gone. So 11, in fact, if I wait five more seconds, I can say that there are 11 hours, 11 minutes and 11 seconds to go. And it's Tom Blomqvist leading for the Wheel and Engineering Cadillac V-Series R, 413 laps done, uh, with a 5.1 second lead over Porsche 963 of Penske Motorsports and Lawrence Van Tor and Rene Rass for the BMW M Team RLL crew with their hybrid V8 running in third. LMP2, now their car, the cars in that category run from 10th overall back to 17th. Tom Dillman for Inter Europol by PR1 Matheson Motorsports lead that class, car 52, but only by 0.8 of a second. So if you're here at the track and listening on 107.9 FM, WDIS, then look out for the 52 LMP2 car, and right on its tail will be the number 18 of Collar Zillish for ERA Motorsports. There's a drama for the 24, we'll get to that in a tick. Felipe Massa in the 74 LMP2 car for Riley is in third. In GT Daytona Pro, Daniel Juncadea now leads for Corvette, car number three, ahead of the 62 Risi Competizioni, Ferrari, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, and Franck Pereira for Iron Lynx in the Lamborghini Huracan, number 19 is third in Pro. And in GT Daytona, Kenton Cook for caught off Preston Motorsports. The Mercedes are leading in the 32 car from the 57 Indy Doncha Mercedes Windward Racing and the Inception Racing McLaren 720S of Brendan E. Reeb, car number 70. That's a VP in race update. We'll do another one of those in around about an hour's time, but we have gone full course caution because of the problems for car 24. It's on the infield on the exit of the International Horseshoe and uh, that car needing some outside assistance was running in ninth position, Dries Van Tor's BMW. In fact, um, at the time, at the, the that, time of the moment it was running rather higher than that, it was Indeed. about sixth or seventh position. But I think it was fifth, fifth, actually. Fifth, was it? Yes. Yeah. It dropped down slightly because uh, when we came into the into the booth, they were second and third, but uh, obviously, as others made their pit stops. But the lights are on, but it's going nowhere. Two course vehicles alongside, and um, a couple of people may be talking to Dries Van Tor. Certainly from the pits, they'll be talking to him from uh, the BMW crew, but it's going nowhere. The sister car is in, still in third place, number 25, Rennie Rast, but uh, still waiting to see what is going to happen. There's, been, there's definitely been conversations with uh, Dries from the outside of the car, or maybe gesticulations, uh, but right now it's going absolutely nowhere. Still full course yellow, just over 11 hours remain in this the 60 second running of the Daytona 24 hours. So, yeah, I really put the kibosh on that because I said the BMWs had had a strong race to this point. Uh, let's hope Rene Rast continues to pound round. And, that, of course, what will, this will provide is the opportunity to close the gap that had stretched to half a minute between his car and Tom Blomqvist. They'll be right together at the restart. But the issue for Dries Van Tor and the others in car 24 is that they're easily going to fall off the lead lap. Well, they weren't quite there anyway, but uh, yet more laps are being lost no overtaking permitted, obviously, under a full course yellow, unless you're a stopped car, and then you're being directly waved past it. And sadly for this BMW crew, they may now have to concentrate on just the one car. I mean, they'll keep the 24 going if they can, but uh, it, it'll first of all have to try and get back to the pit lane area under its own steam, and then there may well need to be some lengthy work behind the wall because there's only limited stuff you can do on the pit lane apron. And then we've got to look forward to the um, the typical full course caution procedure, which first of all is lining everybody up, and then the pit lane will reopen, and we'll have an incredible busy spell of action 
for the GTPs and the LMP2s and then the GT cars. So the lights are bright on the, on the giant wheel illuminating its patch of the circuit but are the lights on in for Dries Van Tour down in ninth position but stationary uh, just on the approach to uh, turn six the end of the international horseshoe but uh, saw the car suddenly take a jump but that was actually the, the one of the doors being slammed back shut so Dries still working away and now we've got about uh, six about six people around the car trying to work out what to do to get it out of the way so I've given it a big build up. Let's get straight to the GTP uh, stops because Shay Adam is watching. It's going to be fuel only for most of the cars that have come into the pit lane, at least so far for the number six Penske. Uh, that Porsche getting fuel and a windshield clean. There's a drinks bottle change for the number 10 Konica Minolta Acura. And for Tom Longfist, well, they gave him the full service last time, so it's just fuel for him this time. Lawrence Vantor, the first car to roll back down the lane in the Porsche for Penske Motorsport. And the BMW is taking fuel, but they are also cleaning the windshield of the 25 as it rolls off again. And let's make sure it safely rejoins alongside the 74 Riley. It does. Last car to leave was actually the 31, aside from the 10, sorry, the last car of the leading group. Also into the pit lane, the 01 Cadillac. This for uh, the Chip Ganassi run team. This is fuel and tires, as well as a driver change. Alex Pillow is out. Ranker Van Zanda is in. Yeah, so Alex actually didn't need to do a great deal more running. We talked about in the previous stop him staying in the car, and if it was a full stint, I mean, he's perfectly capable of doing it. And uh, when you get in the rhythm, you kind of don't want that flow disrupted. But a full course yellow can easily do that. And a chance, therefore, for the team to reflect on their current run of strategy. You're tuned to RS2 IMSA Radio around the world, of course, on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. We're at the track on 107.9 FM WDIS and Channel 207 Sirius XM. I'm delighted that uh, we have also been joined by the NBC audience too. So if you're watching on there, hello from the Daytona Night Owls, powered by Sacred Coffee. We're on Peacock as well for this four-hour spell in the early hours of Sunday morning for the 62nd edition of the Daytona 24 Hours. Bruce and Johnny through till 6 a.m. And then we'll have a couple of hours away and we're back again for breakfast effectively uh, we ate till 11 that we're back on again in my world that's the second breakfast of the yeah. day of course true we're munching our way through the first right now accompanied by sacred coffee and matt campbell has not come into pit lane the number seven car am i right in saying he stayed out yeah because he's now taken the lead in the penske motorsport 963 cars rejoining then the 6 Porsche, the 25 BMW, as the sister 24 BMW is now towed from its resting point from the infield. So it being given a helping hand, at least back to the paddock area. The 31 Tom Blomqvist driven Cadillac from Whelan Engineering and the sister Cadillac car of Renga van der Zander, as Shea reported in her CrowdStrike pit report. The 01 in fifth place. LMP2's returning to uh, the track as well, so 52 still leading the 18, it appears. Kubish Milhovsky and Ryan Dial, the new drivers there, as the GTD Pro and the GTD cars are pitting show. I know that our friend Rooftop Ray is helping us out, so Ray Ray, if you will watch the number one PMR BMW so that Johnny and Bruce can keep an eye on that, I'm watching the number four Corvette because these are the two cars that I have seen so far that are doing brake changes under this caution. The brakes are already off of the four Corvette, for the front, they are replacing the new ones on the, uh, let's see, they are AP racing brakes uh, as far as the pads are concerned. They've got the tools out to re-secure the discs into their positions. It's discs and rotors and pads and the whole, uh, the whole shebang. Let's see, new Michelin tire? No, it's the same Michelin tire that they pulled off, which is good. So Earl Bamber will know what kind of rubber he's got underneath him. Big clout to the nose of this car, actually, uh, where the radiator normally would sit, uh, the air intake in the front of the car. Wheels have gone back on, and let's see, car drops off the air jacks. Earl is told to fire it up and leave. Here is PMR in their brake change. I hope you boys can see it. We're trying to keep our eyes on uh, a number of things during this stop, uh, with thanks to Rooftop Ray for 
a far better vision than I can muster right now. Doing a sterling job again, Ray Winston Jr., as he does so often, keeping us covered in the early morning stint. And uh, the number one BMW looking like it will rejoin now. Tyres being changed on the 62, Risi Competizioni Ferrari. Alessandro Pierre Guidi's just brought that in, and the brakes have changed, as Shay mentioned. So tyres going, or tyres and wheels going back on after that substantial change, but it always amazes me how quickly they could do that. And just beyond the half distance marker should be set for the rest of the race now at Risi. Well, exactly so. I think it seems to be going, could someone just throw a full course yellow thank you very much Dries Van Tour unfortunately for Dries he's he's fallen down the order quite a bit there he's lost about three laps due to that stoppage in the car of course being towed back in so let's see whether that car gets to continue or is it going to be a long time behind the wall being repaired so there were two bullets in the gun for the BMW crew now it's down to just one by the looks of things uh, I mentioned Shay that the seven did not pit as far as we can tell you might have a theory on that and what else is happening on pit road there's a new nose on the wall for the seven Porsche as well as another bit of body paneling so maybe they've got a bit more work to do and that would have blocked the pit exit for the sister car the number six um, but a very substantial moment just now the number 12 Lexus had a full service as well they did a brake change they're still in their box they had just rolled about 10 seconds ago I'm walking out sort of a little bit further into the fast lane to see if the pit exit light is on and it is even though the cars that were trapped between themselves uh, and their leader and then when everybody else came into pit they got the opportunity to now take the wave by those cars are going around at full speed the pits are open for anyone this time around and yes indeed the number seven is coming in for that service but the number 12 Lexus from Vaster Sullivan just went from the top three in GTD to needing to fight its way back up through the field yes now it has fresh brakes so do some of its competitors and they got their brake change done a lot faster all right looking at this number seven for porsche penske motorsport it is a new nose going on the car and let's see are they doing any other work there is one mechanic around the right hand side and yes new number panel going on the right hand side of this car so the illumination system uh, perhaps was a little bit too faint too dirty for the marshals that is a safety problem that is something that would have needed to be redressed with the pit stop they're putting the new panel on and bert is overseeing it to make sure that it does fire up and oh yeah that's that's right that should uh suffice for all of our hard-working marshals out around the track thank you ladies and gentlemen for your time and your service we couldn't do this without you now there's two very clean parts on the uh, porsche the number seven the number panel and the nose neither of which will stay clean for very long so back into the race will go matt campbell in car seven um meanwhile you couldn't quite make up what's going on on the infield because the bmw number 24 the uh, gtp car has got as far as the other side of the track from where it broke down. So it broke down on the exit of the International Horseshoe. The idea was to try and tow it into the back of the paddock via that route out of Turn 1 and into the International Horseshoe. They got as far as the turning point to turn left across the flow of traffic and obviously waited for a gap. And in the two, the tow truck and the car, and the car it was towing coming to a halt, Either the towing strop has failed or it has simply fallen off the tow. Oh, it's pinged off the back of the pickup truck. So the guys driving the 4x4 turn left and think everything's hunky-dory here. Then look in the mirrors and think, hang on, where's the BMW gone? And it's still stuck on the track because the towing strop is no longer connected. And now poor old Dries Vantor's thinking, well, what do I do now? I've got no power in the belly and I can't move from where I am. I'm on the on a live racetrack. Now the guys have pulled back onto the onto the road from the paddock area. Another tow truck. In fact, that's the um, the dryers that are uh, tending to the track that have just gone by. And now they're trying to work out whether this tow rope is properly snapped and needs to be binned. It looks like well, that is the case. Yeah. A new one needs to be sourced. It'd now. be better that, that was the case than if the the hooking point the the the, the point from which it would be towed has had any failure but yes they brought a new towing strop out onto the circuit Dries Van Tour it's a 24 hour race he's, he's feel he's spent at least 24 hours in this problem alone he's uh, plummeted off the lead lap he's down last in the GTP class he's now six laps in arrears but the fact the lights are on the car is going nowhere oh the number 24 car this is a disaster and bear in mind what 20 minutes ago 
all was running smoothly, all was looking good, get through the night, that little mantra, they were running second and third, they moved down to about uh, third and fourth, all was looking good then for the Belgian racer, while his brother Lawrence leads uh, the race for Porsche Penske Motorsport in the number six. Uh, this recovery has been a real cluster for them, it just has not worked, it was very, it took quite a while to get the car moving, get it yeah. hooked up, and then just when it looks like they've done the hard yards, they're about to get it back into the back of the paddock and be able to work on the car, sitting in the track. Driver being spoken to, the door is up, but no one's actually fitting anything new to the front of the uh, BMW. Let's see what happens next. But the race recovery vehicle comes into position. In fact, a second race recovery vehicle, a far more important and larger one, a, a, a real proper tow truck has come into, onto the scene. But for Dries Van Tor, sitting there, very, very hot under the collar, no doubt. I just wonder whether something in the drivetrain has become jammed so that as the pickup truck pulled away, the car it was towing refused to move and the only thing that was going to break first was the, the towing strop itself, but it pinged away with quite some energy, thankfully to a safe area over the top of the car. Though everyone driving, driving and sitting in the pickup truck wearing head protection, as most people working here at the Daytona International Speedway do, but there was that moment as two of them got out and went, hang on. The pickup truck's there, yes. but the BMW GTP's over there. How did that happen? OK, I can tell you what is happening right now. Is Dries Van Tor has been invited out of the car, and he's now being put into a rapid response vehicle, and the BMW is still sitting on the circuit. So Dries is going to leave the scene of the crime, the scene at which the, uh, the towing strap came off. I mean, the difference is, I thought they'd managed suddenly to bump-start the car, because we had lights coming onto it, so certainly when it was sitting on the entrance to turn six, nothing was happening, and now Steps towing with a far more serious vehicle, and a great big tow hook is going to go onto the roof of that car, is going to lift it off terra firma and move it away from the side of the track. So it's sitting there, Dries is no further with the car, so I think the marker pen of shame, of doom, is probably going to go through number 24. Uh, it, I mean, it didn't look particularly promising anyway with the 24 car, which incidentally has well, I was going to say slipped to 24th position. That might just be that the, the, the number system has reset to the race number now, but it's going to have to be a straight lift and maybe directly into the back of the paddock. So perhaps RLL will see this car sooner rather than later. No, it's going to be on a flatbed, and then maybe the flatbed will drive in. But this is just a sustained recovery of that and a headache that Dries Van Tor really did not need after running... Well, a clean race till this point, up in fifth spots, but dramatically dropping down the standings. Uh, Shea was just buzzing me with some news. I totally missed that, Shay. so by all means, uh, crack on air now to tell me what you were trying to feed to us. Ah, I, I was just saying, don't don't get the marker pen to do out yet. Maybe the, the pencil no. was questioning. Um, but it could be that they removed <laughs> Dries from the car because they need to put it on the flatbed and they can't do that with the driver aboard. I see. So, yeah, uh, uh, obeying regulations, driver has to be out and separate from the car. But, no, I, they'll still want to finish the race because half the battle is, you know, just fighting the 24 hours of this event. But from what could have been a very promising result for BMW, it's uh, one real threatening bullet in the gun compared to a car that might still just about make the finish. As Dries Van Tor clambers out, and if he didn't think all was lost to this point, he possibly does think that now. Although he'll still be keen for some stints later on this morning. It's RS2 MZ Radio with uh, a longer full course yellow than we were expecting. Lawrence Van Tor emerging from that uh, group of pit stops as the race leader in the Penske Motorsport 963 from the other BMW of Rene Rast, now up to second place, and Tom Blomqvist's Whaling Engineering Cadillac V Series R running in third ahead of the sister car 01. So 31 and 01 are in third and fourth positions. And no changes since the pit stops in LMP2 with Inter Europol by PR1 Matheson leading with Kubisz Michowski, the Polish driver, number 52, ahead of Ryan DL for Aero Motorsport and Riley. Uh, they did do a, a driver change with Philippe Fraga taking charge of the number 74 Bruce Jones obviously still running under full course yellow but uh, so that at least reduces the loss of, of time that uh, Dries Van Tour and the number 24 BMW have had they're now eight laps down but of course once the track goes green the, the number of laps they're falling back by will increase inordinately but they're still clear of the best of the P2, P2 runners and that's uh, 
10th place overall, Kuba Schmikowski, just mentioned him, Johnny, uh, car number 52, one of the many Oricas into Europol competition, leading that class uh, from Ryan Dayel, who was the driver change just uh, very recently in that run of pit stops, Ryan uh, taking over from young Connor Zillish, and when I say young Connor Zillish, I mean his race career is remarkably short, um, but it takes up almost no lines at all in my sort of uh, great big... Uh, non-digital chart of uh, who's done what but uh, again just seeing young drivers coming in and having a crack in sports cars and uh, certainly Connor has uh, impressed inordinately but it's just the fact that his birth was the mid midway through 2006 that still slightly gets to me here he is under the lights and running he's running second in the p2 class doing just a fantastic job for era motorsport so yeah it's great to have the new faces coming in but gosh aren't they young and how quickly they adapt to their new surroundings as well. The style of racing here at uh, Daytona International Speedway, very different from anywhere else, really. Um, hearing uh, probably five or six years ago from newbies in that period of time that, you know, you almost on the high banks need a cutout of the roof if you're driving a GT car because the bit of road that you really want to be focused on, the windshield doesn't cover because you're tucked in quite low down in the car and you're looking really out towards the top of the A-pillar for your next turning point and your braking point and uh, it starts to really ache on the neck but these are the things that you know are second nature to those people that have been coming to this place for 25 years plus but you have to adapt to very swiftly if it's your first time. Yeah, and also if you're driving a GT class car, you generally have to stay lower on the banking, so there's more banking up ahead of you, up above you that you cannot see, at least yeah. in a prototype, you're up at the top, at your, your lane, your speedy lane at the top. But again, these things you don't think about until you're physically out there in the car. People can tell you, but you never know the degree of what they're talking about. So, still a full course yellow, just under 11 hours remaining in the 60 second running and just waiting for the, the circuit to go green. I would suggest with the number 24 BMW having been flat bedded away back into the paddock. Here we go, shaping up for a restart and the green is displayed. So already the overlapping taking place for fourth and fifth positions around the outside. We'll try and go uh, Matt Campbell on Ringa van der Sander. There's, uh, also side-by-side -side action just tucked in behind there. That was actually Tom Blomqvist who was trying to make the move. Renga van der Zander involved as well and up over the kerbs went the number uh, 10 car. So trying to force his way through. Uh, ter terrific driving from, well, all of those cars out front. Lawrence Van Tor has just about scampered away ahead of Rene Rass, so it's Porsche Penske Motorsport 963 ahead of the BMW Hybrid V8 of Rene Rast. For now, we'll call that the remaining BMW in the GTP class, but let's hope, fingers crossed, they can, the crew can get number 24 back into the action, but that's obviously fallen an enormous number of laps away from the GTP uh, class. Pack. That's now nine laps down. Dries Van Tool back in the paddock, but importantly, so is that number 24. So the 10 car being driven by Marcus Ericsson. If you're wondering where on earth Marcus is in the order, well, it's 48th, but it's not preventing that car from holding back. And 10th in class, that's the reason why the 10 is displayed on the digital readout. But when you combine all of the cars, they say down in 48th spot, side by side action as well as we hit the restart for the GTD cars. And 57 Indy Doncha, there was a spinner there in the GT Daytona Pro cars right ahead of Indy Doncha. That happened a couple of seconds ago at the restart, and a real plume of tyre smoke. Uh, good avoidance driving as Doncha has in front of him the number nine GT uh, car as well. So all manner of things going on there. Ollie Jarvis in the FAF Motorsport McLaren trying to stay out of trouble. I'd like to see that moment again to uh, actually work out who was having the moment. Were there a couple of cars involved? Difficult to, to tell in this level of light. Let's just head to pit road to get this crowd strike pit report from Shea. More bad news for double number cars, guys. The 55 Ford Mustang of Proton competition is officially a retirement, and I'm hearing that the 66 of Gradient Racing will be the first ever Acura GT3 retirement coming up here soon. They are still trying to assess if they can fix the car, but as it looks right now, we're not gonna have any double numbers finishing this race. Thanks, Shay. Yeah, it's uh, funny how those patterns play out, and uh, 
The flip side of having a tremendous run to this point is that there are always going to be those cars that are swiftly into retirement far, far early in the big enduro of the year. But um, all the more reason to come fighting back, I suppose, at Sebring, the next round of the championship in a couple of months' time. As now the GT Daytona Pro Cars head up onto the high banking through Speedway Turn 1 and 2. And the number 70 car of Ollie Milroy for Inception Racing, actually one of the GTD cars running in fourth position, that McLaren. And on its bootlet is the Corvette number four running in GT Daytona Pro. And in third place for Earl Bamber, so he's looking to stick a lap on the McLaren up ahead. Plotting his course, trying to go high, but certainly uh, the car in front just sitting where it needs to be if you want to come past you've got to come past on the high side so Ollie Milroy British racer and that's uh, one of several McLarens in the race just doing the job he does so many years now he's been tied up with uh, Brendan Henry bringing Brendan's career on Fre Freddie Shandoff the Danish driver in that crew is the driver who normally sets the times but young uh, Tom Gamble also in the mix uh, for the inception racing McLaren. Ah, it wasn't a GT car spinning in front of the GT field. It was actually an LMP2 car, a bright orange and white machine. So from your spotter's guide, you might be able to, uh, through a process of elimination, work out precisely which one that was. Well, I think it's probably the Riley car, number 74. That's the one with the most orange on its flanks. But yeah, okay. maybe orange and white, it could also be... Um, the Tower Motorsport. Tower. Yeah, Tower Motorsport's got more white on it, so I guess it was number eight. Let's see who's at the wheel of that at the time. Well, Sean McLaughlin, sorry, Scott McLaughlin uh, driving the number eight car. And if it was, which was the other one you suggested, the Riley, that's just made a stop actually. So was that for a new set of tyres perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, Philippe, Philippe Fraga must have been the 74 spinning car then. Uh, running round on its own now and it's just made a stop probably because of uh, a full set of tyres that were flat spotted in that moment cool coolish tyres remember no tyre warmers and uh, no opportunity uh, really to keep the temp up when you're tootling around at full course caution speeds three gt cars absolutely together but uh, if you're joining us on NBC and Peacock, look to the right-hand side, and there is Felipe Fraga with his moment in the number 74, Riley. And the GTD Pro and GTD Traffic doing incredibly well to not get, invo not get involved with that. You know, you really have to set yourself up for the corners coming up ahead when you're moving up onto the banking, coming out of the uh, Le Mans chicane, and you sort of set your course, and then when something untowards occurs you've suddenly got to almost snap out of not reverie but you just really really got to uh, have an ability to change your change exactly where you want to put the car and particularly when you've got a prototype coming past as well you, you've already cut them a bit of slack and there isn't much more slack to cut but uh, good ev evasion there from all the drivers keeping out of the way of that Riley car as it went for its moment now let's hope we can settle down we had that period of full course yellow while the uh, number 24 bmw was uh, cleared up for the bmw m team rll that has now finally got back to the paddock be interesting to find out what is happening with that in terms of uh, what they think it is and whether they think they can uh, get it sorted now just uh, as a couple of the cars including the number 131 cadillac were going into the le mans chicane it looked as though there was a car moving very slowly just on driver's left before that le mans chicane we'll see gonna, if we can work that out we're going to go caution as a result of it so the yellow lights up on the high banking just beyond the safer barrier indicating to everybody there through speedway turns three and four that they must rein back the speed and this is only a short spell after the previous caution still haven't quite ascertained which car has caused this but yet yeah, another semi stoppage if you like how long was that uh, span of green running only just over six minutes i make it so we had a 20 minute full court caution now six minutes and shane knows the regulations back to front does that this now mean that this can be a quick caution if that car can be recovered it does um, and yeah we don't necessarily have to go or we don't at all need to go through the full uh pit calling um, system rigmarole if you like it's the zero one car that stopped so this is the big big story now of uh, Renger van der Zander is put into that car at the latest pit stop yes and Renger was charging hard at the restart I didn't see any contact for this car and can't see any damage on it visually 
at least, but that's not to say that something inside has gone somewhat awry. There are an awful lot of electronics that run on this car, and of course the uh, marshals need to make sure there's a green light illuminated on these hybrid cars as well to make sure that they're safe to touch, Bruce. Yeah, a rescue vehicle pulling up behind, but this is another last handful of years with the hybrid racing cars. It's been a real learning, steep learning curve, and the drivers can't afford to just hop on board and uh, disregard the elements they have to do. But Renger, the Dutch driver, is getting out. Bear in mind at this restart, the blink of an eye ago, uh, he was uh, dicing in third and fourth position, that 0-1 Cadillac, but now he's tumbling down the order and climbing out. Out. All I saw just before the full course yellow, I saw a flash of yellow moving slowly. In fact, ironically, the, the one I picked it up from was on board the number 31, the other Cadillac at the front end of the race, uh, being driven uh, by Tom Blomqvist. Went flashing past. I couldn't even see what sort of car it was. All I saw was yellow, which was the front end of that car. And now Renger is walking away. More rescue vehicles, including a tow truck, have pulled in position. So out on the back part of the circuit, just on the towards the entrance of the Le Mans chicane, down on the apron at the side of the circuit. And for Renger, oh what disappointment clearly the car was going well he was happy enough to attack and now the gun has been spiked 3 a.m at daytona you're tuned to the night owls with sacred segments of our broadcast we're on rs2 imsa radio around the world 107.9 fm here at the track on nbc and peacock delighted to have your company and i'm sorry to bring bad news for cadillac fans and those been following the Cadillac Racing 0-1 car to this point. This race just has a habit of biting when you least expect it. Of course, race cars don't necessarily like uh, being uh, absolutely gunned for a segment, and then you get a full course caution, because that gives chance for a lot of heat soak within the car and systems to start doing silly things. And then it's very difficult to try and do the running repairs, particularly when the car's nowhere near pit road. They can see it down at Cadillac Racing, but it's in the hands of the marshals now. Uh, for us, this can be a quick turnaround as long as the car's recovered re relatively swiftly. And uh, as BMW are tearing their hair out with the number 24 escapades, look to the top of the timing screen and the sister 25 M Hybrid V8 now leads the motor race by a smidge because it's all the gaps have been closed up again but Laurence Vantor will be a threat from the restart but the BMW would sooner have uh, having said that oh the 24 car is going to rejoin as well I feared that the 25 might have appeared on pit road for emergency service but that is the 24 running again and able to rejoin the race still I was about to say still with Dries Van Tor at the wheel. We'll wait for that to trigger Pitt out. It's, it is still Dries Van Tor who has stayed on board the number 24 car. At least we have two BMW GTPs still in the race, Bruce. What you always hope is the driver of a car that stops, particularly these hybrids, hasn't just knocked something in the cockpit because that was a very quick fix, well, fix once they got the car on the flatbed and the 24 car brought in. But uh, how many laps down? He, when I last looked, he was about eight laps down. He's now um, a further... He's dropped down the order an enormous amount in that BMW. He's in fact uh, 13 laps in arrears, so just remember that. But he's got it going. Point I want to pick up on was a point you made very well just then, Johnny. When when it goes green after a full course yellow, it's amazing how drivers suddenly feel sometimes like driving an entirely different car. If it's a long full course yellow and you're talking about all that heat soak, the build-up in the car when it's not running at full speed and getting the airflow through it, and it might be at a point where, where the car just simply feels as though something has changed. Have I got a puncture? No, your tyre pressures have gone down a little bit. It can be any host of other things, but uh, amazing over the years how drivers go. I really, you know, felt I was on top of it. The car was feeling good. We had the full course yellow, and then it was extraordinary. And that's when the driver's brain has to really go into overload. So we've just had a, a change down in the pit lane. A great stint there from Shea Adam. And Joe Bradley is taking over, uh, bringing the pit lane news to you from CrowdStrike as one of our pit lane reporters. Good um, morning, gentlemen. Hi. How are we? Hello, Joe. Go ahead. Uh, very well, very well. And, and you, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, at three minutes past three in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is kind of my one of my favourite hours of the race. The the paddock area quietens off. There's only a few people milling around. It's it's a completely different ambience to a 24-hour race at this time of the day. And at this time of the race, we uh, you know we've just crossed the half-distance mark not a sh short while ago, and it's just got that air of idiocy about it hasn't it it's like why why are we doing this why are we continue to go around and round but this is the time of the race when really 
you can have the race come to you or you can in equal in equal terms have the race go away from you but now's the time the cars are behaving the best they'll ever behave the air's cool if the air's thick you're going to get maximum amount of your motors your tires are cool you're not going to take too much energy out of them and this is where we see the pace really beginning to and the chess pieces really coming into play with the teams just continuing that high speed game of chess all the way to sunrise However, in the last uh, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, two of the chess pieces have been knocked onto their sides, of True. course. So things are running very smoothly at the halfway point in this the 60 second running, Joe. But suddenly we've got the 0-1 Cadillac uh, on a flatbed. The number 24 BMW had been returned to the pits and has now rejoined the circuit. But for Dries Van Tour, an awful lot of time has been... Uh, been scuppered there. It'd be really interesting to find out what the problem was for Van Tour's number 24 BMW because they've clearly got it fixed. And let's hope it's a, a permanent fix, not one of those ones where the car gets going and then suddenly has the same issue. I'm not entirely sure the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship will be adopting Joe's strap line of hashtag why are we doing this? <laughs> Mainly because at, at uh, 1.40 yesterday afternoon, everybody agreed to it. And uh, you can't back out now. Uh, but there are those that are very, very glad that they were happy to accept this challenge and others that perhaps are wishing they'd done something else with their Saturday afternoon and now into Sunday morning with three hours into that. I think Shay is busy uh, preparing a CrowdStrike pit report with uh, trying to do a little bit of research uh, elsewhere down pit road. Obviously, we've got the, we've got the BMW story to follow up. So she's going to uh, pass that message back to Joe as uh, she scoots off for a break, but via the BMW garage. And one side of that will be very downbeat indeed, although glad to see the 24 car return to the racetrack. The other side will be, well, kind of be slightly reserved, but really very jubilant indeed to see the Rene Rascar now leading this segment of the race. I've also uh, recently been introduced on the Night Owls with Sacred uh, segments of our broadcast to a screen to add to our collection already. So this is now screen 18 that I've opened up. Uh, if you haven't visited this already, it's very interesting. imsa.com forward slash gtp dash telemetry. So imsa.com forward slash gtp dash telemetry. And you can get all the latest information on things like energy regen for each of the 10 cars within the top category and also, crucially, energy remaining for this particular... For instance, the race-leading BMW of Rene Rast has 75% of its designated energy remaining. It's doing 62 miles per hour, and Rene is in third gear using a little bit of throttle, but no brake. And I, I mean, I can tell when the cars are braking, when they are applying the throttle, and when they are regening energy as well, and it's for fleeting moments, just for seconds really, as the cars are using a bit of mechanical braking, but then also winding up uh, their regen as they slow down for certain corners. So Alessio Picariello and Richard Westbrook are the most concerned about remaining energy, because they're down into the 40% right now. In fact, Westy with bang on 40% of energy still to burn during this particular stint and again something else for the teams to be on top of as we continue with this hybrid era of sports car racing talk about spinning plates bruce oh talk about spying the cab and none of the drivers have got anywhere to hide you know over the years you've heard drivers who haven't quite told the teams the truth about why something has happened but now it's all here i'm gonna have to go away from that screen i'm finding it totally beguiling I, it'll take all my attention away but again it's great for people watching all around the world that you've got these extra screens. It really puts you in the cockpit with the drivers. It's fantastic. What I can tell you, without looking at that screen, with all the telemetry as the coloured bars move left and right, is Rennie Rast is leading this race. Of course, we're under green flag racing all over again. And uh, he's going to try and stretch away. But Lawrence Van Tor tucked in behind just seven tenths of a second in the rear in the clue of cars. And Tom Blomqvist in the mix as well. Green, green, green. And trying the high side line is Lawrence Van Tor. Let's hope it's not a sitting duck from Tom Blomqvist as they hit the international horseshoe. But scampering away is Rene Rast in the BMW. And now Blomqvist for company because level with his rear wheels are the front wheels of Colton Herter's Acura, no that's not the Acura, that's a car trying to unlap itself from elsewhere, no it is the Acura, I beg your pardon, the 40 car 
Thank you, Ray, for zooming in briefly there to confirm my earlier thoughts. So Colton Herta was overlapping with Tom Blomqvist briefly. He then had to get out of the throttle, and that, I think, allowed Alessio Picariello around his outside and into fourth position. This traditional uh, unwinding a touch of the order during caution. It could be a quick caution because we were so close to the previous one, and we're back racing again for the 62nd edition of the Daytona 24 hours, live on RS2 from the Daytona International Speedway. Yeah, great description there of the restart, Johnny, and it really showed that moment when a driver in a pack of cars has to slightly adjust their line. Bam, Alessio Picariello just jumped and suddenly straight past the number 40 Acura there. And just, it was a tiny lift off the throttle to adjust the line and the Belgian racer straight through. Belgian racer now up into fourth place. Alessio Picariello in the number five Proton competition Porsche, but what a fantastic restart from René Rast. Uh, made the break, he may be hauled in, but he did exactly what the driver who's leading that pack had to do. And while those behind had a really very strong tussle, he just he's broken the toe to them yeah. he's now he's now stretching clear high on the banking sweeping down yeah it's got that one very nailed what a brilliant restart of course the driver is in the pole the pole seat the pound seat at the front of the queue but you've still got to get it right not outbreak yourself not go too deep into a corner but he's made that little break so really good job from the german and the thing is if you can do that at a restart you then don't really have to look in the mirrors as you're turning through turn one and naturally your exit out of that corner is going to be slightly more refined because you can focus entirely on the road in front how busy would you like it in the gtd element of the race a lexus number 14 to the high side of a couple of porsches and they are in a very tight gaggle indeed heading now out of turn one and towards the International Horseshoe. That's a certain Mike Conway in the Vassa Sullivan Lexus number oh, 14. He's, he's got a history. The number 24 BMW, the car that was stricken out on the circuit, is in the penalty box at the moment. So I can't, don't know what that's being blamed for, but that was the car that Dries Van Tor had come to a halt just before turn six. Partial recovery. Then, of course, the towing strap uh, seemed to come away from the car. Then flatbedded back into the paddock. The car was uh, sorted out back on the track, now serving a penalty. Well, that's not energy remaining related, is it? Because, of course, the car was stuck out on track. I mean, if it ran out of energy, we've seen in the World Endurance Championship that cars just go, as I think Lawrence Vantor described, just the dashboard goes black and it doesn't respond at all at Spa last year. Yes. The Porsche Penske Motorsport car conked out just outside of the, just at leaving the chicane at the end of the Spa Francorchamps lap and we never saw it again in that meeting because they'd misjudged the energy levels was that the problem for the BMW, I wonder? Might be able to, might to have to interrogate that at a later date to be sure. But um, yeah, maybe that penalty is related. The number 24 car um, should be on this list, the BMW. And I can tell you it's got 90% now, but of course it's been regened. Uh, during the pit stop so and uh, haven't got the archived energy remaining information because uh, that re would require an awful lot more uh, screens to distract me but the teams of course will be building up that data and have that to look back on and of course it's always accessible by the IMSA um, race directors to keep looking at to make sure that uh, regulations aren't being breached there so the teams yes have something else to concentrate on but of course those policing this race need to be all across it too yeah some of them will look back across the years when they could just get away with a notebook but now they've got so many screens they've got to interrogate at all times to keep on top of everything but the good news is increasingly over the years we get more of those screens to look at ourselves uh, have got confirmation actually it's got nothing to do with energy uh, remaining the 24 stops in fact for working on the car in a closed pit lane so uh, beyond the emergency service five seconds of fuel or one single tire change so they've had to stop that car for 60 seconds in the penalty box at the end of pit road for working in the pit lane as we can head to joe bradley for a crowd strike pit report yeah i'm actually at the back of the pits in the paddock garage with the uh Cadillac Racing 01 and Renko van, van der Zander uh, basically described the problem with the car as exactly as we saw it, it just basically stopped and uh, for no apparent reason and the, the reason is now being sought with the, uh, the car being completely stripped down of its bodywork and the team um, analysing data and 
the usual stuff. They're also, of course, taking advantage of this situation. Whilst the problem that stopped the car is being rectified and being sought after, uh, they are servicing the car. So, you know, the, the rules are that you don't necessarily have to just do the problem that the car has been brought in with. And whilst you're doing that, you can service the car. So hopefully they can get to the bottom of it. Hopefully it's nothing too dramatic and they can get this car back in, in this race. Because it's never over until it's really over, isn't it? They hear a Daytona, it's almost all the way to the flag. And that's why we keep coming back. That's why we love this thing. And um, yeah, get totally sucked into the story of the race. And the fact that you know you can you can be in it for so many hours, feeling like you're the dominant force, but any lead that you might build up during spells of green can be taken away in the blink of an eye or the blink of a yellow light. And we've had a couple of cautions already, purely just in the night owls with sacred coffee stint. It's Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer at 3:15 in the morning. We're here till 6 a.m. Then we'll take a pause for another breakfast and then be back on from 8 until 11. And then we'll uh, have John Hindoff back in the Global Broadcast Centre taking things to the flag. And that'll only be 2 hours and 40 minutes away from the end of this year's race by that point. Johnny, things do happen when we come in the commentary box. Yesterday, <laughs> you know, people were accusing, but when, when I came, it was start, came into the Global Broadcast Centre and was looking, analysing what was happening before we came on air, all was cool, calm and collected. In the blink of a handful of eyes, We've lost the number zero one with a problem and the 24 BMW has joined the Cadillac in sort of trying to sort its problems. At least that's back on the track. I do feel very sorry for the uh, BMW M Team RLL crew there for the 24 car being worked on drawing a closed pit lane. I think if it hadn't been for the zero one Cadillac stopping, they wouldn't maybe have uh, you know got caught out like that. But the good news is that car is back on track and hopefully Dries Van Tor is fully conversant with why it came to a halt. So, you know, not, sometimes the team send you back out without really giving you full guidance, other than just get on with it. But the drivers like to know what might be going wrong next. But anyhow, still going, that's the good news. So I was quite right. You were quite right to tell me to stay my hand on not putting the line through the 24 on my chart of who's still in the race or more to the point, who has fallen out. So yeah. we've still got those two BMW GTP cars. It, in the field but one the number 24 car clearly somewhat delayed right now but the sister car 25 leading the way by 1.8 seconds really good restart for Rennie Rass Tom Blomk is giving chase as I said he's in the 31 Cadillac and third is now Alessio Picariello who's just moved past Lawrence Van Tor so the Belgian had that really good restart has gone past his teammate up into third position overall in fact Lawrence Van Tor has now been passed by Matt Campbell as well yeah, so the six and the seven running round together. Vantor fourth, and Matt Campbell in sixth place. And on the same lap, yeah, 432 just ticked off, just like the race leader, Rene Rast. Not too far away from them, Colton Herter as well. And the 40, Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Acura. As they now head out of the second horseshoe and into this tricky left-hander which is so important as you build speed up on the speedway turn one and head around to the Mont Chicane. it got very very tight a moment or two ago though down into turn one Bruce yeah it did it's almost it was a one lap sprint uh, looking <laughs> at the timing charts so uh, you don't in a 24 hour race tend to get lots more than one or two place changes in the lap but among the front running groups have three place changes in the blink of an eye the number five Porsche of course run by Proton Competition but the, the six and seven uh, works cars are getting monstered and certainly a really good attacking drive there from Colton Herter in the number 40 Acura so that team the Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti you know it seemed to sort of lose its mojo a bit but it's certainly getting it back and uh, Lawrence Van Tor was the driver who got pushed back he's now moved back ahead again so chopping and changing so the drivers will be loving it and the fans that are looking at that particular part of the circuit will also be thinking this is rather good wherever you are in the world the time time zone will be different but uh, the racing is making the light night very very entertaining indeed and there was a touch there from Colton Herter uh, on the Porsche because both cars just briefly vibrating so uh, Colton Herter making his presence felt uh, literally and he, I mean, it was his corner all day long. There was a gap there, went for the gap, and the car was fully alongside, but just a sort of door handle to door handle little kiss, 
and then on would, would go Colton Herta in fourth place. Side-by-side -side action in the GT class. That is the 34 car around the outside of the 23. So let's put some meat on the bones. Car 34 is the Albert Costa Balboa uh, Conquest Racing Ferrari. And that was laps gain being gained back again on the 23 car, which is currently being driven by Mario Farnbacher in the GT Daytona Pro Class, Heart of Racing Aston Martin. Yeah, great racing, but I like the respect from the drivers. I know that the two GTP cars had a little, little touch, but again, it was uh, remarkably clean, but uh, the 296 Ferrari is looking great on the banking. You know, you gain a place, and at this stage in the race, we've just had four course yellows. It's side-by-side -side action. How, what what colour would you like your 296 GT3 to be? It doesn't matter as long as it's fast, and they're clearly going very well at this point in the race. Let's hope we can get a good long run of green flag racing, because uh, this is looking fantastic on the banking down around the infield. Best of all those, if you're a fan of the number 25 car, because Rennie Rass was 1.8 seconds clear, now 2.2 seconds clear. Tom Blomqvist giving chase, and importantly uh, for Blomqvist, he's got about nearly the best part of two seconds clear over Alessio Picariello, so he's not having to look in his mirrors, he can focus on his attack going off after Rene Rass. But Alessio Picariello, uh, great to see him getting a chance in a, in a top prototype. Been a big fan of his for years, having watched him race in the Far East for a long time in Porsches and always seemed to weave magic uh, for whichever his teammate uh, was that weekend. So he's in third, dropping Colton Herter little by little, but let's see if it stays that way. But right now, just getting a few gaps between the front running cars in GTP. Yeah, and uh, that might be a, a little by design as well, because these cars don't like constant running in the heat and the draft of a uh, fellow runner. You want to stay in touch, but you want to look after the car at the same time. Uh, enjoying Mike Rockenfeller come back through the order. He is four laps back at least from the GTD Pro leaders. He's actually five laps back and a bit possibly for Mike Rockenfeller, but he was scything his way through the order in the Ford Multimatic Motorsports Mustang up alongside one of the Aston Martins. I think Mario Farnback as hard of racing team. Aston Martin and speaking of which now the 70 car right on the boot lid of the 23 Aston Martin so Ollie Milroy in the fourth place inception McLaren around the outside of the Vantage but there's not going to be a way by there I don't think because the heart of racing team car keen not to lose a place and also um, there wasn't really a way through because there was a wall of GT cars down at turn one I love the little little plate inside the uh, the front of the McLaren. It has the regu regulation name, number, pack drill, etc. But underneath, a little message saying, hello, McLaren fans. Nice little <laughs> touch. Works very well with the onboard camera. I'm sure that's been picked up before. But again, little touches can make all the difference. Now, one thing, I said I'd stay away, but I couldn't. The screen looking at uh, energy remaining. Richard Westbrook was one of the least in the tank. He's down to 10% now, so it's gone from a green bar to a red one. Yes, danger, danger. And Alessio Picariello in second place is down to 20%. So he's used a handful of his shoes, possibly to make those overtaking manoeuvres, and he's going to have to manage that here, uh, here and after. Interesting to uh, watch the, the two GT cars, the one you can hear in the background, the McLaren, and Mario Farnbacher's Aston Martin. They are in different classes, but remember the performance of a GTD Pro and a GTD car, pretty much identical, with the exception of the balance of performance, of course, between an Aston Martin and a McLaren. But it's the driver makeup that means that you're either in GTD or you're in GTD Pro. The Pro lineup's unrestricted, whereas in the GTD driver combos, you do need some am element or non-pro element, but Ollie Milroy certainly matching Mario Farnbacker stride for stride. Farnbacker is seventh in pro, Milroy fifth in GTD standard. And then shooting by all of the GT traffic right now is the 31 Tom Blomqvist driven Cadillac. This again is why the GT cars are told to stay well over to the left on the approach to turn one and allow the quicker car by, which Blomqvist suitably does. Well, he's got far the better of that run through the traffic. The, the gap to the race leader, Rennie Rass, has been halved down to 1.1 seconds now. But I was just thinking, right, Rass has got clear. Is it going to delay Blomqvist? But actually, it just fell very nicely for him so he could get by almost the entirety. That, in fact, it was the entirety of that gaggle of cars before he had to turn in to turn one. So Rennie Rass made the escape. Now he's been hauled back in, but maybe there'll be another gaggle of traffic. But I think that was the first 
big group of cars they were coming across in the GTD class and it certainly fell into the lap of Rennie Rast, uh, not of Rennie Rast, of Tom Blomfist giving chase. Colton Herter has managed to get his way past Alessio Picariello, maybe Picariello has been told, uh, you know that little chart with the, um, the moving bar about how much energy you've got, you've used quite a lot, so he's maybe backed off, maybe he's slightly interrupted, so Colton Herter has got the Acura number 40 up to third place overall, so maybe, just maybe there's a little bit of a smile coming on the face of Wayne Taylor, but you know, hold on, Wayne's been there here for decades, he won't be on his face until we're in the final hour, one feels, he's been here before where moments have just had Rather big ramifications and uh, things that were looking perfect no longer are. But also, he can tell how a race is likely to go well before we've started it. And, you know, there may be murmurings that, well, this could be a good year for us. I think it's very much the flip side in 2024. Unless he was, you know, deliberately going very much the other way and just taking us off the scent. But... Well, there's, I there didn't is, sense no, that was I the case either. at the time. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a good poker player, uh, potentially Wayne Taylor, about uh, not le necessarily letting his true thoughts slip. But he knows the reason why the actor is not quite there this weekend. But we have got Colton Herder in third position. And he's only 1.7 seconds away from the whaling car of Tom Blomqvist. So, you know, you wind the clock forward another nine and a bit hours when we're into the final 60 minutes and if they're still there then you can bet that Colton if he's still at the wheel or any of the other his, of his teammates they are not going to let this slip through their fingers they just have to stay in that lead fight and that's the beauty of this race yeah so all these GTD cars having to be dispensed with but I sense they've almost worked their way through all of them now there's each about five cars up ahead of the race leader of Rennie Rast and maybe the traffic just helped for Colden Herter do not know but what we have is the top four cars, cars covered by 2.2 uh, seconds it's really very very little Rennie Rast desperately uh, now he's been passed in fact Tom Blomfist has now just gone past so he's in the lead the race by 0.133 of a second he caught and he passed the BMW but again traffic will certainly have been a factor in that so it was Blomqvist working out where Rast's BMW was just strumming a touch coming out of the Le Mans chicane. It wasn't the ideal exit for the M hybrid V8 and uh, Tom Blomqvist wasn't going to be asked twice there. T picking up a touch of side draft and also the natural toe from right underneath the rear wing of the BMW. Now running neck and neck Tom Blomqvist with the JD Sim T Miller Motorsports 963 I believe to stick a lap on the 85 of Richard Westbrook. Westy's just done a pit stop to top up his energy. Well, I just I just find it quite extraordinary the, the straight line speed of the of the Cadillac and obviously the way the car is set up to get that power down onto the circuit really is their their key to success here at Daytona, far from the end of the race. But the nose in front, but it is only by one tenth of a second precisely. Top four covered by 2.2 seconds because now we've got a new car in fourth place, the number seven Porsche. Matt Campbell's moved ahead of the Proton version of Alessio Picariello. So Alessio's three seconds down, but he's down in fifth place. But great move from Tom Blockfist, but actually looked very easy indeed. They'd got past the traffic. It was, I thought, if the move came, it was going to be because of traffic. In fact, they just negotiated some, maybe just maybe Rani Rass was slightly blocked by the last of the cars they passed into the chicane, the Le Mans chicane. But certainly once they got out onto the banking, the story was unfolding in front of us so if you're whaling engineering and at a restart Rene Rast starts to disappear up the road by a second they'll be thinking it's all right because when we get to the middle portion of the stint we know our car is going to sustain its pace whereas maybe the BMW just starts to fade very slightly it might have just been a slight error as you say or just the traffic on the run into the Le Mans chicane but that'll be interesting to observe in the remaining stints of this race, of which there are still due to be many, as to whether the BMW does that typically. You know, if we get a BMW out front at the restart again, will that stretch its legs for a brief spell, 10 laps or so, and then start to fall back into the clutches of those behind? Really cracking battle, Johnny, at uh, the front of LMP2 and uh, Spike, the Orica from AO Racing, beautiful livery on that. Uh, Mauve, an orange car, has now moved into the front of the class. Ryan De Yell giving chase, Ooh, just a whisker down, a third of a second down for Era Motorsport, having a really good run. And, oh, huge distance back. Uh, an entire second is Scott McLaughlin in third in the number eight from Tower Motorsports. It's been a little while since we grabbed a CrowdStrike pit report from Joe Bradley, so let's put that right now. 
uh, Justin Newgarden I found sat in his pit just listening into his radio about to take over the number seven Porsche. Joseph, is this aspect of endurance racing something that you find challenging coming from the world of single seaters as you do? Oh, it's very challenging. You know, I think it's a world class race, there's no doubt. You know, I think any racer I think wants to be here competing in this event. It's, it's, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, but it is a challenge in different ways to what I'm used to, you know, trying to make it through the night and interact with the entire team, you know, interact with all the other drivers. Um, you know, you got to stay up, you got to you got to be fluid, you got to work throughout all the temperature changes, uh, the, the car changes, you know, from day to night pretty significantly. So it's just staying on top of it and trying to be good through all segments of the race and, and for sure all of it combined is a, is a big challenge. 3.30 in the morning, your body clock's telling you you should, really should be in bed and you know, here, here you are doing this. I mean, how, how do you get the body to react and do the job? Uh, there's no secret. It's just, it's tough. I, I just had a double espresso shot, so I'm trying to amp myself back up, get ready to go. And, you know, everyone fights the same deal. I think some cope with it a little bit better than others, but there's really no secret ingredient. I, I can't sleep. I don't sleep very well, so I'm just kind of staying up. I think a lot of people are, but um, yeah, you just deal with it. Joseph Newgarten chatting to Joe Bradley. I wasn't sure what happened at the end there. Then you get pulled away, or maybe you fell over. <laughs> anyway, it, it constituted a crowd strike pit report, nevertheless. He ran out of coffee. But maybe he did. <laughs> the body yeah. just stopped. Uh, yeah, Joe's uh, not quite got a history of falling over this year, but uh, there's been some interesting shifts leading up into the race, so I understand. And uh, he uh, put his, uh, his arm up in fairness for uh, one of the crucial overnight stints to join us here on Night Owls with Sacred. We're on NBC, we're on Peacock, we're on RS2, IMSA Radio around the world and of course live at the track 107.9 FM and at 3.30 in the morning let's give you a quick flavour of uh, how things sit in terms of an order in each of the four classes. So it's the number 31 car of Tom Blomqvist that now leads after a terrific overtake around the outside of the final bit of uh, a couple of laps ago. It was maybe two and a bit laps when Tom got a really good exit out of the Le Mans chicane in his Cadillac V-Series R car number 31 to swoop around the outside of the then leader 25 Rene Rast in his BMW M Team RLL Hybrid V8. So Rene just a second back now in second position and it's Matt Campbell in the number seven Porsche Penske Motorsport 963 in third. LMP2 is led by the AO Racing Orica of Spike the Dragon, number 99, in front of Aero Motorsports Orica, number 18, Ryan DL, and it's Scott McLaughlin, McLaughlin who we thought was spinning at the restart, but to apologies, Scott, you were on the straight and narrow in the Tower Motorsports Orica, and has actually worked his way back up to third position now after a consistent run, currently working lap 430 in LMP2. GTD Pro, Daniel Junkadea in the number three Corvette racing by Pratt & Miller Chevrolet Corvette. So car three leads Alessio, uh, sorry, Alessandro Pierre Guidi's Ricci Competizione Ferrari number 62 and the AO Racing Rexy Porsche of Michael Christensen number 77. Indy Donche number 57 leads GTD, Windward Racing's Mercedes ahead of another AMG GT3 from Courtoff Preston Motorsports for Kenton Cook number 32 and it's Giorgio Cernigiotto in the Chetelar Racing Ferrari 296 that is running in third position number 47. The latest on Renger van der Zander's Cadillac that has yet to rejoin the 01 that caused the short full course yellow not so long back but at least the 24 BMW is back in the hunt, but obviously it lost an awful lot of laps because of that uh, stall on the infield. The car seemed to have no power, and, and then it was stranded on the infield as the crews were trying to tow it back to the paddock. That's your VP in-race update at 3.33 in the morning. Cracking battle in LMP2 between Paul Le Ch La Chatin and uh, giving chase Ryan De Yell and the Scottish driver got to within a tenth of a second he's now at three tenths back but uh, really putting on a great show just a one and a, one and a half seconds further back uh, we've got Scott McLaughlin the driver who did not spin which we were just reiterating fans in the grandstands well that, their approach to uh, the middle of the night is not coffee but it comes in a, in a can and it's in tight system to take their shirts off and wave them in the air so people all 
approach the race differently. Other people all around the world are sitting at home with two, three, four monitors, a sausage loaf, a cup of tea, and shed loads of information. That's what we hope we can offer them. But the great thing is, wherever you are, you can find data on this race. And I must say that that screen, I have not been back to it more than once about who's got how much energy left. It's uh, certainly something that uh, I'm going back to it for a third time. Okay. They've, all, they've all got loads, apart yeah, from Randy Rass, cool. who's down to 15%. Race leader Tom Blomqvist has only 5% more. So again, they have to assess that situation. The driver with the most is Kevin Estra in fifth place. What about a fight in LMP2 now arriving on pit road? So they've been not quite taking chunks out of each other, metaphorical chunks out on the racetrack. Well, now it's down to the pit crews to turn their cars around as swiftly as possible. Paul Luke Chatter in, Ryan DL in from first and second places. That will leave Scott McLaughlin to lead the motor race in LMP2 for Tower Motorsports ahead of Nico Pino. And then it's Colin Brown briefly up to third position as the work continues on the bright purple with uh, the yellow wings of Spike the Dragon. Uh, continuing this um, this uh, rather the scene set for the GT cars within AO Racing uh, but they had to think about some other sort of being or beast shall we say for the LMP2 cars dinosaurs uh, very much present in the GT Daytona class with Rexy and uh, we introduce a dragon into LMP2 as we can go for a CrowdStrike pit report and Joe Bradley yeah just on a quick uh, visit to the all one Cadillac pit just checking on what's happening with the car. Um, the, the car's still being worked on. It, it's it's never a good sign when the car is put under the high stands, so that it's standing about you know four foot from the floor, and people crawling about underneath it. There's not much, and then another really bad sign is not much activity going on on the car. It's not like they're taking anything off or stripping anything down. It's just basically on the high jacks and a lot of chat and conversation going on. I'm not sure this all one is uh, is going to be back on track very very soon, if at all. Well, that that's a massive shave for Ringer van der Zander and the crew. It's fallen 20 laps in arrears, so it's certainly not going to feature at the sharp end, even if it goes. But it went from running perfectly mm. to not running at all. And uh, really, really strange for Zero One. Hopefully they can work it out. But the pace at the front, in fact, we've just had a change of second place. Matt Campbell has moved to seven. Uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport 963 up ahead of Rene Rass. But Rene Rass has a little less of the go juice on board. So he's having to back it off a little bit. But still, the top four cars going back to Brian Herter in as Brian Herter, I think not Colton Herter in fourth place, only covered by four seconds. But hold on, get this this is sports car racing at its best. Cadillac from Porsche, from BMW, from Acura. We want variety, and by golly, we're getting it right now. Scotty McLaughlin now pits for Tower Motorsports together with Nico Pino from the LMP2 class. So we had what was the first and second place cars in on one lap, the very next time around, cars from net third and fourth in they were leading in second place at the time but they'll now slip behind the AO racing and era motorsport cars uh, yes because they're still in pit road colin brown will have a spell then leading lmp2 as he has done in previous cycles so that's the crowd strike racing by apr orica leading briefly in the 0-4 tom blomqvist Building a lead to 2.2 seconds after 444 laps. And it's Matt Campbell, as Bruce just mentioned, in the number seven Porsche Penske Motorsports 963, running in second position. Rene Rast in third. So we have Cadillac, Porsche, BMW and Acura all represented in that top four positions. And uh, another 24-hour race that's also taking place this weekend, but in a different part of the world, in the Middle East, in Dubai, at the Autodrome there. Uh, there was an early phase of that race where we had four, and at times five different manufacturers in the top five. Uh, that's uh, a GT3 race, um, mainly, as in GT3 is the top class at Dubai. But so obviously we ramp things up to a greater level here with GTP, but nevertheless, no shortage in this variety of manufacturers. Yeah, well, great news. Happy days at the moment for sports car racing, whether you're a prototype fan or a GT racing fan. Enjoy it while it's here. I think we're set for a very rich number of years coming up ahead. But the front of this field, <coughs> absolutely fantastic how close it is. Rene Rast is now coming under, excuse me, 
increasing pressure from Colton Herter, so maybe we will have the BMW going down to fourth, the Acura up to third. But this is exactly what we want. The, the track is in great condition, plenty more light night time to come, and proper racing out on the banking. 31 leads away, that's Tom Blomqvist, and uh, doing a very, very tidy job indeed. And he's just put a lap on Alessio Picariello, just moved past the number five, the, the Proton competition. Uh, Porsche 963 that looks so immaculate to my eyes. Uh, it's black and gold livery, but at the moment, Alessio Picariello, though he's only sixth in class, bear in mind at the restart, he was fighting to get into about third in that queue of cars, and he's lost uh, a fair de degree of time since then. I think a pit stop may well have been included to drop him back, but Tom Blockfist putting another car between him and the chasing Matt Cabell. Six tenths of a second, no, seven tenths of a second back to the number seven Porsche but uh, certainly Tom Blockfist works this traffic really, really well. Very, very impressive. I am hearing on certain channels now that the 01 is a uh, established and an official retirement now, sadly, for Renga van der Zander. We heard from Joe Bradley a moment or two ago that it was very unlikely that that car would be able to rejoin, and uh, 01 has retired is what I'm hearing. Uh, just one of those bizarre moments with no, no warning whatsoever, there hadn't been any contact as far as I know. Renger van der Zander likes to wring the neck of a Cadillac, but they're built to take that abuse uh, and for 24 hours, so that wasn't the problem. Uh, but uh, presumably something in the innards of that car, probably electrical, has uh, either been found or perhaps crucially not found, and it's going to take too long to chase and to rectify. So a real shame and uh, a big story that one half of the Cadillac uh, garage will no longer be competing. It's all on a 31 then, eh? And uh, fortunately for that car, it leads the race. Yeah, I mean, it is really astonishing. Why the clock back several decades and almost every car at this point in the day turned 24 hours, all the Le Mans 24 hours, wherever you had sports cars racing from day to night to day again, would be nursing a mechanical problem. But that 0-1 Cadillac, as you say, these days, it's effectively a sprint race. You don't have to nurse your cars. You race the cars. Racing fine, not going at all. Out of the race. Quite extraordinary, but... Uh, Again, these cars, they're not bulletproof, but they're a whole lot better than they used to be in terms of mechanical reliability. But when it becomes an electrical problem, the things you cannot see, you cannot hit mm. with a hammer, then it really is incredibly frustrating. And it may take quite a lot of uh, electronic investigation to try and work out what it is. Maybe by now, if, if the official word is coming through, or the word is almost official, as the, the BMW number 25 comes into pit in, the lights uh, tipping out on one side of the the nose there, Rennie Rass bringing that in and obviously he had got to the end of his uh, his power, needed a little bit of a reset so he's brought that in but quite a few of his rivals down now to about 25% uh, as well, race leader in fact Tom Block is down to 5% so he'll be probably in next time around the 25 BMW though, it's driver change time yeah, let's get to Joe for a CrowdStrike pit report on the latest stop for 25 yeah, and uh, as the 25 comes down off the jacks it's going to be the fueling that takes the longest. We've talked about this all day long, haven't we? Uh, tyres are done, cars off the jacks, and now we just wait for the fueler. That seems to take forever. The fueler is watching the fuel flow through the pipe. When it starts coming back on itself, that tells him that the tank is full. Well, the 25 tank is full. And that car resumes. To my left, we've got the 23 part of racing Aston Martin. This is a car pardon me, in the GTD Pro class that finds himself, finds himself surrounded by GTD cars from another class and they're just off the tail, really, of the GTD Pro class proper and really they're going to need to make some massive ground to get in contention for class honours in that. A uh, little bit of a delay going on here, looks like the fueling and the tyres is done, but a uh, little bit of a tension in the car. I'm not sure whether we saw a driver change on that 23 car racing Aston Martin. Did you guys say that there was a driver change on the BMW? Uh, there was there was a driver change on the 25. Conor Di Filippo, yes, has taken over that car. Right, we'll dive so in Brent there. So Brendan Hast getting out. Yeah, we'll see if we get an insight. So we'll get back to Joe with that CrowdStrike pit interview in a tick. Meanwhile, enjoying the Cadillac on the infield, almost up to 450 laps completed for that car and those that pursue it, which is uh, Matt Campbell's Porsche 963 from Penske. 
Wayne Taylor Racing with the Acura Colton Herta driven number 40 car and Conor Di Filippi rejoining the race in fourth spot although we'll, we'll allow timing to just correct itself as that car rejoins it takes a couple of sectors for that to do LMP2 has now uh, been reset after that latest round of pit stops so I think everybody came in under green because they were all due for fuel within a couple of laps of one another Paul Chata for AO Racing back to the front in the number 99 then and I noticed on our graphics Scotty McLaughlin yeah that is correct in second position now for Tower Motorsport so he's actually gained a spot on Ryan DL he did he came in the lap later but clearly things have gone better for him since the pit stop maybe slightly quick less time at a standstill so third has become second for Tower Motorsport with its uh, black grey white and orange race livery and Ryan DL just a little bit further back another uh, second and a half in arrears in third place cars still coming to the pits but most notably our race leader Tom Blomqvist brings the 31 Cadillac to a halt right now so this is obviously a pit stop we need to keep a keen eye on also in on this lap Colton Herter from third position Matt Campbell stays out though as the wheel gun really struggled to get that front right wheel loosened there were sparks as it finally gripped uh, nothing for the mechanics to be too worried about but it's these split seconds here and there that are lost that can lose you track position and then it's amazing how that is magnified uh, a couple of times over later on in the stint so you want to try and not miss a beat in these stops fabulous to have these two big teams so close to one another in pit road it is the Cadillac that leaves earlier than the Acura but that's fine because that's the order that they came in yeah and Matt Campbell leading the race you pointed out the number seven Porsche Penske Motorsport 963 that ought to be in next time around because he's got very little of the go juice left energy remaining five percent of course all those coming into the pits have had theirs topped up back to 100 so Tom Blomqvist Colton Herter going back out Connor De Filippi he's down to 95 because he went out a lap ahead of them but an interesting little sideline so it's imps.com GTP, I'm trying to remember what the the, um, the catch was, the, the strap just, line, uh, GTP hyphen telemetry, there you go. IMSA.com forward slash GTP, as in the category, dash telemetry, exactly, and uh, the full list of the GTP cars are there. Position, so current position in the far left column, then under the car banner who's at the wheel of each car and the number and the entrance too and then you can find out how much energy is remaining and Matt Campbell thankfully has pitted on this lap where he had zero percent probably 0.5 percent as he came in and now as the fuel goes in the energy is starting to be topped up 30 percent 35 40 and it will go all the way up to 100 percent before the car is released they're doing tyres, medium compound Michelins all around. You can tell that by the little yellow sticker element. It's not actually a sticker, it's a part of the sidewall. But the yellow with the M on it. Thank you, Roof Rooftop Ray, for homing in on that. Tells us it's medium compound for another nighttime stint, beginning at 3.47 in the morning. And then the long run towards pit exit, driver raring to get going but having to wait until they leave, go past the second part of the pit lane and turn left and left again to rejoin the track. But uh, expect Tom Blomqvist, I would suggest, to be in the lead of the class once he's rejoined. He should have already rejoined in 31 Cadillac. Uh, down in GTD Pro, it's Alessio Pierghidi who continues to lead the way for the Rizzi Competizione Ferrari team. LMP2, it's Paulus Lachatin. A uh, French driver who uh, enjoys racing, Spike, and in fact loves racing in the States. But for AO Racing, he's got that car at the sharp end of the field. So for now, Matt Campbell still listed at the top of the time charts, but we know he's brought that number seven Porsche into the pit lane. It hasn't quite exited the pit lane. Uh, so we will find out who goes to the very top. It might even be his own teammate. It's now Joseph Newgarden. We heard from him. Joe Bradley interviewed him down in the pit lane, working as a, our crowd strike pit lane reporter down there. He seemed very cool, calm, collected, and just hoping the double espresso would carry him through this next stint in terms of staying awake. But it's one thing sitting in the pit lane when you're not driving, sitting behind the pit wall, quite another once you're strapped into the cockpit. I think then the adrenaline kicks in.
So Kevin Estra now leads the race with Joseph Newgarden taking over the sister car for Porsche Penske Motorsport. That's the number seven. It's the six Porsche that leads the way. Tom Blomqvist coming coming out in second place overall. Through the darkness goes the number six car then of Kevin Estra with the huge banners that are to his right on the back straight. Nicely illuminated, not quite the amount of um, floodlighting on that back straight, although the corners he can pick out very easily indeed. This place no stranger to darkness racing, not only from this race, but also from the NASCAR night race as well. As out of Speedway Turn 4 and into the tri-oval goes the number six car that is now in front of Joseph Newgarten. So Tom Blomqvist and Colton Herta, uh, having made their stops quite recently, we're on lap 449. No, we're on, we're on lap 451. I thought my timing screen had just started to lapse a little bit. It has gone into snooze mode, and perhaps uh, who can blame it at this time of the morning? I'll try and do a quick refresh there. But Kevin Estra, the new race leader, by 13 seconds over Tom Blomqvist's Cadillac. It's a Porsche 963 prepared by Penske Motorsports that leads the way. Car number six ahead of 31 and 25, the Conor Di Filippi BMW with uh, nine hours and 52 minutes to go. Remember, we started at 1.40 yesterday afternoon. So when we get to 20 minutes to the hour, that's where another race hour is ticked off. Although, as we bring you this broadcast, of course, we'll be mentioning when we get to the top and bottom of the hour, as we call it in radio parlance as well. Give you a VP in-race update when we get to 4.30 a.m. Another quick top-up of how things are going in the various classes. Although, uh, hopefully, we'll keep you in tune away from that update as well. Alessandro Pierre Guidi for Risi Competizione and the Ferrari. Uh, a decent lead now, only consider the amount of laps when we join the broadcast where uh, it was Risi from Corvette by the split seconds. That seven, nearly eight second advantage is quite a decent margin now to be resting on. Back to El Bamba's Corvette number four and Paul Miller Racing's BMW M4 for Brian Sellers running in third. I think your screen's got a little bit of lag oh, it has. that's now I've changed that. because Pierre Guidi has just come into the pit. So El yes. Bamba now leading the number four Corvette. Brian Sellers second after such a good year in 2023 for the BMW racer. He's in second place. Up front, you might go, how come Kevin Estra's leading? Well, it was a blink of an eye ago. It was 13 seconds his advantage over Tom Blomqvist. So the number six Porsche out front, the 31 Cadillac in second. But the thing is, he's half a stint away from coming into his pit stop, whereas uh, Blomqvist, De Filippi and Herta have all, in the last couple of laps, just made their stop. So Kevin Estra out of sequence, but the French racer pressing on as he always does. is just going to maximise what he can do in this stint, but he will owe us a pit stop uh, in the near future. So once he's dropped back, what's the gap between... Blomqvist and uh, Felipe between the Cadillac and the BMW, well it's uh, just under two seconds, 1.75 seconds I would suggest, and Colton Herter in the number 40 Acura from Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti is back 16 seconds off the race lead but effectively only five seconds off Tom Blomqvist who will assume the lead A commentator is only ever as good as his or her timing screen, do you know what I did there? I pulled the cable out and I plugged it back in again and we've now completed 452 laps as so, if by magic. Perfect. Kevin Estra leads the motor race, and this is Joe Bradley with the Crown Strike update. Yeah, with the Pratt Miller Motorsports Corvette number four, Tommy Miller taking over the car. The car looking like it's done seven off in 24 hour races, let alone just over half a one. The car showing the usual skin marks and battle scars on the front end of this car. As Tommy gets in, he's going to be given a fresh set of Michelin tyres to start his stick with and a bit of windscreen cleaning going on there there's still a few tear-offs on there and, can... and there's the Pratt Miller Bonus Sports Corvette soundbite for you everybody Thank you very much Joe love it when you open your mic during you know when you're doing an interview down there and you get the, the start-up particularly of the GTD cars, they do sound great, and Pratt and & Miller, I don't think that it's in their rule book they're allowed to run a car that doesn't sound absolutely magnificent. And again, you talked about the battle scars, the skid marks, the rubber dents on the, on the nose of the number four uh, Corvette. 
and um, you know it's great but again you look at what I love looking at what the mechanics do sort of in the middle of the night someone out there on the pit apron with a little air wand just uh, blowing down to try and clear the radiator halfway up the hood of the car anything counting only one of the tail lights is working on the number three Corvette I've just noted as it's going through the infield just noted but it has been like that for about an hour and uh, 50 odd minutes at least I was watching from the other side of the car fair enough well, that's easily done because when it's going from right to left from our vantage point, there appears to be no issue at all. But when you catch it on the infield, the rear right corner uh, has yeah, been, um, been extinguished for quite some time. I'm interested that the officials don't appear to be too bothered about that. I mean, it's got one tail light and maybe if you've got one side working rather than the two, that's still OK. Um, rather than a message saying, you know, sometimes you get in other championships that needs to be sorted during the next pit stop. Yeah, that's been troubling me for the last 90 seconds. Why there has, has been mm. no warning since I've so after after long after the event has been uh, concluded, come to the battle. Well, on the odd occasion, we might get a, a, a view for, in our commentary box from the car behind the Corvette at any one point, and sometimes that gives you false information because these are LED lights and the camera frame rate is quicker than the human eye frame rate if you like so sometimes a light appears not to be working when in actual fact it is but uh, we know now we are, i'm now absolutely convinced because you've seen it too uh, that that corvette only has one working light and maybe the team are sort of keeping that on the back burner as a project to keep working on i mean they've got nine hours and 47 minutes to try and rectify it should the officials be majorly concerned about it. it? It's not as much of a problem as it might be at Le Mans when you hit the Mall Sand Strait and that is complete darkness at five to four in the morning. Here, at least there are a lot more lights on the stanchions uh, so that you can pick those cars out. Well, let's face it, I mean, the Daytona International Speedway in its own bowl contained Le Mans still classic, classically running down a straight that it used first in for 24 hours in 1923 you're in proper countryside maybe a bit more boombox sounded from people in the campsites than there was in 1923 but uh, the nature of the race is still very much the bit by the pits and that beyond we're using french public roads the first time i went to Le Mans, i was so excited i was driving down with a friend i said are we going to get to the circuit soon and he went we're on it I went, what <laughs> <laughs> we're going down the mulls out straight the barriers then were knee high to a grasshopper whereas now they're far more comprehensive but it was a bit of a jolt actually That's made it awesome. even more exciting yeah well uh, I think my first time to Le Mans which was uh, a few years after yours fair to say but uh, it's very difficult to work out okay from the camera angles you've been shown prior to a visit precisely which bit of the public road is actually used but then when you know you've hit the racing asphalt it does tend to, to uh, send tingles down your spine yeah, but also to drive around this place though in a road car and get you get up onto the high banks and say they race on this seriously it feels like you're at 45 degrees and um, it's uh, so violent an angle as the number 12 lexus has just pitted from the lead of gt daytona and let's head to joe bradley for this crowd strike pit report you found wayne taylor i have it wouldn't be a 24 hours if i didn't take a chance to chat to wayne taylor during the night win i think we'll file this one under character building hey eh? There's no doubt. Um, I mean, everything that could go wrong went wrong. Um, you know, everybody did so much work to get here for this race, being the two car team first time. And the guys have all done a good job, but there's been just these silly little gremlins that that have seemed to have attacked us. Um, with one consolation, is we still got um, the 40 car that might be able, we might be able to get him on the podium. But for the 10 cars, very disappointing, you know, um, lost power and then they seemed to get it all back together but we were like a hundred laps down or something. So, and the, those, the, the gremlins you say with, there's nothing that a team has in its toolbox to actually address that sort of thing. It's just pure luck, isn't it? That is the problem with these new cars and these old new electronics. It's really difficult to know what's going on. You know, as soon as you see a car go completely black, you know something's something's haywire. But um, yeah, it's been tough. Um, uh, when we we talked earlier in the week about um, the, the lack of pace, I don't want to go into the reasons for that. We you know keep that to yourself. But um, that has given you a different approach, the team and yourself a different approach to this race. You've had to 
you, you know, you mentioned there the 40 with a chance of a podium. You've really had to come about, come at this race from a different angle, a, a, even more strategy employed. Yeah, it, um, we've had to really do a lot of strategy, you know, based on some of the changes that were made on our cars just before we arrived in the weekend. And, um, you know, it's been really hard to, um, to be able to um, double stint some tires. Here and there, we have to, you have to save tires. Everybody does because you get a limited selection. So we've had our challenges, that's all I can say. And um, let's get this one finished and get out of here. Well, Wayne, you know, you've been around a long time. You've had, you know, tales of war and you've also had joy and glory. It, it, it's races like this that make the race wins all the more glorified, I suppose, is it? it it's so true, but I can tell you, there's nothing I hate more and that is not winning. I literally will go away from here and I'll be sick in my stomach until the next race. Really? Really? It, it's just, I don't know. Even after all these years? It, I don't know, it, it gets worse. I, don't, I just don't get it. I suppose also, you know, there's both my kids are driving in the series and so it's a double whammy, you know, when you look at it. You know, you gotta, you gotta cut out the father-son's relationship and be team owner and drivers. But you can't stop your heart feeling the way it is. And it's your heart that keeps you coming back. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, every year this time of night, normally we were doing a lot better than this. I would be still saying in my mind, you know, I don't want to do this again. <laughs> and after this, after watching this now, if I do do this again next year, then I'm an idiot. Yeah, mate, you will do that. You say that to me every every race. All right, when when you know we we'll get this one out of the way. But when does Wayne Taylor Racing start thinking about the next one? The next one being Sebring, of course. Uh, tomorrow. So I, when it when it ends? I knew you were going to say that. Thanks, Wayne. I'll leave you to you then. Thank you, mate. Yeah, and just to confirm, his kids, who are not necessarily the age of kids anymore, but I know I get the phraseology, are in his cars this year. That's not always the case, but Ricky Taylor driving the 10 Acura, and Jordan is in the 40 car. So what he means is it's a double whammy. Not only is he having to take this tough race for the two Acuras, but also both of his sons are as well. Can I give a, sh a shout out to Sheldon van der Linde driving the number one GT Daytona Pro car because it has just done the fastest lap of the race so far for any of the GTD cars. Uh, uh, it happened the lap before last, 1 minute 46.094 for the Paul Miller Racing BMW M4 GT3 and it just flashed purple on my screen, an indication that uh, the conditions at one minute past four in the morning here at the Daytona International Speedway are perhaps better than they have ever been so far in the race and a terrific effort that you have to get the stars aligning because he would have encountered very little traffic he would have had to get out, out of the way of very little quicker GTP and LMP2 cars on that particular lap but the South African is charging very hard indeed in an effort to stick with Seb Prio's AO Racing Porsche number 77, which is four seconds up the road. You can only what you do what you can do, can't you? So he's doing it very well indeed, and uh, you know what a talented family. You look at the talented racing families. We just heard about Ricky and Wayne t and um, Jordan Taylor. We've got obviously Dries Van Tor and his older brother Lawrence Van Tor, and then the Van der Linders uh, racing all around the world. Uh, and for Sheldon, who's been a BMW man for a long time now. You know, they are absolutely tip top. But some of the, you look at their early careers, particularly the Van der Linders coming up to Europe from South Africa with not a lot of racing under their belt, certainly a racing family. Um, but they, they stuck their neck out, they want some titles uh, low down in the racing for categories and they've really come good. But they're super consistent. And, you know, when you look at what teams and manufacturers require of their drivers, it's not just getting in the car and being quick, it's so much more than that now. So clearly they've learned the lessons well. It does help coming from a racing family with a great history down in South Africa. You know, you pick up stuff almost through out of the ether when you're around racing people, but uh, clearly a great deal of ability too. So good job, and track conditions do look very, very good at the moment, which is actually how they want them through the night at Daytona. This is Night Owls with Sacred live from the track on 107.9 FM, WDIS.
And we're also on Sirius XM Channel 207. We're on NBC and Peacock for this segment of the race through till 6 a.m. local, powered by Sacred Coffee. This is RS2 IMSA Radio with Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones in the Global Broadcast Centre. And thoroughly enjoying Kevin Estra's escapades at the head of the order because, again, nearly a seven second advantage being built by the Frenchman over Tom Blomqvist's Cadillac V Series R. Right now, even though Blomqvist was marginally faster than Kevin Estra the last time around, uh, the Whalen Engineering Cadillac doesn't seem to have an answer to the 963's pace in this uh, portion of the morning. Kevin Estra is getting towards, thank you, towards the end of his stint and Tom Blomqvist has actually brought that down from over 11 seconds. In fact, when, when Blomqvist uh, rejoined in the number 31 Whelan Engineering Cadillac, he was 13 seconds down, so he's got that speed. But then he'll be, when uh, Kevin Estra dies in out of the lead and Blomqvist assumes the lead, of course, Kevin Estra will come out with 100% tank capacity and uh, in terms of the energy and uh, at that point uh, presumably Blomqvist will be down to about 50% but uh, certainly Blomqvist sitting pretty because in this stint the important margin is not so much his gap to Kevin Estra it's the back it's the margin to Conor de Filippi who's currently in third effective second because he too had served a pit stop recently because it's gone out from about a second to uh, what we're looking at there four and a bit seconds so uh, certainly with each lap 31 Cadillac just gaining a little bit more of an advantage over the BMW and in behind Colton Herter, another five and a bit seconds back in uh, the number 40 Acura. So come on, Wayne Taylor, have a little smile. I think it would need to be later on in the race and him to, and that car to be in this position still for him to start to realise there still might be the chance of getting a good result. He suggested that the 40 car might well be able to sneak onto the podium. But crucially for Wayne, it's not a win, and it's going to stay with him potentially for the next month and a half until we hit the concrete at Sebring for round two of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship for 2024. That again will be covered live right here on RS2 IMSA Radio, just up the road, remaining in Florida before the great travels around the US and to Canada, of course, for the rest of the 2024 season. Side-by-side side LMP2 action now, and uh, this is the CrowdStrike 04 car on the inside with Colin Brown, Nico Pino in the other car, number two of United Autosports, and they, through the last split, were separated by just 0.2 of a second. Pino still just about ahead of Colin Brown. So, actually, oh, Brown's just got back ahead coming out of the Le Mans chicane. So they were side-by-side. And uh, Nick Bull in the Inter Europol by PR1 Matheson Motorsport car has just made a pit stop and returns to the racetrack in seventh position in LMP2. But it's Paul Luke Chatin who continues to live at AO Racing. This is a mightily impressive stint from an LMP2 specialist. He's been a multi champion in the European Le Mans series, uh, most recently in 2019 when. Uh, when Edex Sport took victory in the ELMS, but also been a champion at the World Endurance Championship level as well. Uh, I was going to call him a safe pair of hands. He's an awful lot more than that, Paul Luc Chatin. Yeah, also won uh, an LMP3 title in the European Le Mans Series back in 2013. Overall champion in 2014, as you said, 2019. You don't just uh, do that by mistake. And IMSA P2 champion last year with Ben Keating. So uh, clearly, state size, as I pointed out a short while ago, is really where he loves his racing right now. I know he's a very, very popular member of the team, probably because he's quite nice out of the car, as well as being yeah. quick when in it. Because, you know, that's still a massive factor. When drivers come across from single seat to the racing, some, are, of course, are not even going to single seats anymore. <clears throat> they start their careers and move almost directly into sports cars or GTs or whatever to step up the order. But uh, you know what, the dynamic between people they're not just together at the racetrack, they're together in the hotel, they're together on the flights uh, together, uh, ar around wherever they're going. But certainly for Paul uh, Chatin, I was hearing, um, I think it was PJ Hyatt being interviewed on Friday, and he was uh, you know, speaking in glowing terms of the Frenchman. The racetrack again in very good condition right now because uh, there were back-to-back -back personal best lap times in GTD last time around yeah that's very recent data so for Rahel Fry not just a PB for her but for the 83 Lamborghini itself the 147.774 and Mirko Bortolotti in the number 19 car has just done a personal best time 
for the number 19, which is not in that leading gaggle. In fact, it's not had a great deal of luck, but in the Sister Iron Lynx Lamborghini, maybe they've set those cars up to be supersonic in the nighttime hours. Car 19, unfortunately for Merco, down in ninth position in GTD Pro. Can I offer you a change of positions in P2? Because Ryan Yells just moved up to second in class, just moving ahead of Scott McLaughlin. So number 18 ahead of number eight. And right on their tail is Brazilian racer Felipe Fraga. So good little scrap. All those three cars covered by about one and a half seconds. Out front, however, in class, Paul Lula Chatin. We've just been speaking about him. Seven and a bit seconds clear. But certainly Ryan Yell, who was second in class ahead of the pit stops, uh, has got back ahead of Scott McLaughlin, who was third for the pit stops. So maybe it was a case of, as you were, gentlemen, but uh, certainly that was uh, very neat and tidy, and the move done very well indeed. Now, we mentioned, I mentioned the CrowdStrike Racing by APR, Algarve Pro Racing Orica, driven by Colin Brown at the moment. He is fifth, but the man looking after the initiative, together with wife Samantha Cox, is Stuart Cox, now with Joe for this CrowdStrike report. I'm doing the rounds of the team principals during the night, Stuart, and... Uh... I just want to see, you know, how you guys are doing. You're the man with the name at the top of the shop, if you like, or above the shop. What's it like so far for you guys? Um, Without hexing it, Stu, is what I mean. Yeah, we don't want any of that. Uh, mind you saying that, earlier on we had a bit of an issue that's actually cost us a bit. Um, Colin, on the couple of restart, a restart ago, uh, just went up the inside of uh, the Ligier and uh, Braga in the 74 car was just in front of us and there was a bit of a gap and I wouldn't say it was necessary going for the gap but it just panned out and he ended up tapping the back of Braga and we've got damage on the front clip. Now that's actually costing us lap time which is why we've actually gone backwards. But what we've done is, is rather than change the front clip at the next stop when we had to do tyres it would have cost us uh, probably 20 seconds. We opted to go with just tyres and beat the clip. So at the next stop, we're going to change front clip and uh, put uh, Toby in with this set of tyres to alleviate having a long stop. And I think our pace on uh, second stint tyres is very, very good at the moment. So we, you know, we'll sort of, I think, we'll be uh, in a position to bounce back. But saying that, I think everybody else, the way their sequences are, they're all going to take tyres in their next stop. So it'll be interesting to see what our pace is on second stint tyres as, uh, as opposed to brand new ones. But um, other than that, it's been relatively trouble free. But, you know, saying trouble free, we've just going to thumb the nose. So. You know, Stu, what, what you've just described there, you, you know, after all the time and effort to get here and here we are, you know, we've, we've got by half distance which is a hell of a lot of time in a 24-hour race, and then, then it can come down to a, a split-second decision from a driver, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty intense. It is. It's actually been a mega race so far. It's been a lot more exciting than I thought. You know, we're having a push on that uh, normally with these sort of uh, endurance races where you get your wave back, wave-wise, you can do a lot of fuel save and take it easy because the race generally comes down to the last 20 minutes, as we saw from last year. But um, now everybody's starting to push on and they're, they're racing bloody hard. So it's been very good. I'm hoping the spectators are enjoying it. Stuart, I know you've got a lot of experience in this sport. You know, the highest level, you worked in Formula One. The intensity is, you know, it's a little bit different, isn't it, on these long drawn out races or is it? You tell me. No, not, not really. It's still managing, you know. You listen in Formula One, it's all about looking after the tyre you're managing, so you're not necessarily driving the car as fast as it can go on that lap, because you're looking for the, the pace in laps down the road, you know, further laps, like lap 9, 10, 11, 12, for instance. So you can't just go out and murder the tyres on the first few laps. So it's all about managing the tyre. So it's very similar. We're, we're, we're having to push as hard as we can, but with being very careful not to upset the tyre and have the tyre fall off a cliff, which we don't want. And what about managing people? Because as team principal, you have to be the, the, the team psychologist, the team mother, the team social worker. It's a, and you've got to motivate the men and women in the team as well, haven't you? 
<laughs> you shake your head there, Stu. You Good job we're not telling. <laughs> no, no, you're exactly right. It's murder. <laughs> yeah. That's the hardest bit, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the, the, it, it, you, you know, you always say to the drivers, you know, it's the same adage, you know, I need to drive as fast as you can, but don't hit anything, and save the brakes and look after your car on the gearbox, you know? So, uh, it, it, it's quite amusing from that respect. But, um, yeah, you, you're trying to keep on top of everything, make sure the guys don't get too excited in a pit stop because things happen. And when, when you throw in a bit of diversity into something uh, uh, that you might not have exactly planned for or trained for, it, it can throw in the odd uh, mistake from somebody. But so far, everybody's done a super job. Um, the lads looking after the car are pushing on. The pit stops have been okay so far, so no grumbles, really. The, the two race engineers down here, David and uh, Jeff, are uh, doing a cracking job. And I'm just up here when I see and I can add a little bit, which I do a bit of old school engineering, uh, not engineering, but strategy, looking at the race there. They've got computer screens that, you know, it would take me a month and a half of training before I can understand what they're looking at. There's so much going on with their, uh, the, the information that we get sent to us. Uh, where we use this uh, pace tech system for strategy and help, but sometimes it's just down a, you know, a bit of a seat of the pants call at the right time. And there's been a few of those made here this evening. So as you saw, we had um, George had to jump back in because there was seven minutes more driving time. So we made a call there, and that was not really, you know, just looking at how it would pan out. And that was a quick call. Both drivers were ready, and literally on that lap. As the car was called into the pits, we made the decision to put George in and not Colin. And then it worked out really well because the way the other cars were running, we were in a position to do what we needed to do. So, you know, just got to keep pushing and uh, the aim is to come and win it. Thanks, Jim. Fabulous insight there at APR, CrowdStrike Racing with APR. Now, during that to pit reports we had a couple of stops for the six and the 85 how about this for a late call for the number six though that had to come right across the nose of a gt car that was one of the porsches wasn't it so they were going in the, on the radio i'm sure pit 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 and kevin esther was thinking well i'm on the right hand side of the circuit i can't get to pit road <laughs> yeah it's easy for you to say yeah talk about a close call do you know what that is years of racing at the Nürburgring Nordschleifer I reckon paying dividends because you've got to know the dimensions of your car and also uh, your your surroundings if you like and he knew that he had to come in probably because the uh, uh, energy reader was down to single digits and Kevin Esther pulling that off uh, to an exemplary fashion and he stays at the wheel of the car whereas Richard Westbrook who also pitted at the end of that particular lap in the 85 JDC Miller Motorsport car there was a driver change there Westy getting out and Tymon von der Hell the young Dutchman taking charge but what about that Bruce slicing his way well, through it'll, it'll be on the highlights tape that's for sure big time well now then Joe, uh, pit stops for LMP2, and yes, from the lead of the LMP2 class, you've just gone from APR and crowd strikes, talking to uh, Stuart Cox. Uh, Paul Luke Shatter comes in, in spite the dragon. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not omnipresent, uh, Johnny. It's just they're next door to one another, and I popped out the crowd strike pit, just as the 99, the dragon car, the purple and orange dragon livery car. And that's the car pulling away there. Um, I got there quite late, I'm not sure, yes, we have We have got uh, Paul Luchata out of the car, so we'll see if we can get a chat with him. Um, give me a few minutes, guys, let the, let the driver cool off and then I'll give you a shout. I was going to say, give PLC a few minutes just to debrief and to catch his breath. He's a fit guy, but he'll need a bit of water because it's a warm night here at Daytona. Also in on this lap is the number two of Nico Pino, young uh, South American and the uh, United Auto Sports car USA, United Auto Sports USA in from fifth position. Christian Rasmussen taking charge of the number 18 era motorsports Orica and that car rejoining too. Yep, nice clean pit stops down there and uh, just waiting to see indeed who has taken over 
uh, from Paul Lou Chatin. Really, really strong run for AO Racing in Spike, the car that's drawing a lot of media attention all around the world. Following on from Rexy, of course, uh, it's, it, it just adds something rather different. Whenever I saw Rexy, I always thought about the, um, the flying tigers after the Second World War. Uh, based out in the Far East with the beautiful teeth on the nose of their of their planes long long time ago but again in a pack of uh, so many cars to stand out you have to do really something very different indeed the tower Orica also in the pits now came, came in a lap later that was uh, running very very nicely in the hands of Scott McLaughlin went out for after its pit stop into second place came down one position to third but all very tight but we'll see where that one slots back in but the T P2 battle as with pretty much every battle is very tight indeed. At the moment, the only class that hasn't got a close battle because of the pit stop sequence, not for any other reason, is the GTD class. And Indy Doncha's leading that in the Winwood uh, Racing uh, Mercedes by 30 something seconds. But once he gets into the pit cycle with the others, Kenton Cook is very much in the mix. And let's go down to hear from Paul Lou Chatin uh, because he's with Joe Bradley. Uh well, we expected the LMP2 fight to be intense, and that's what it's turning out to be. And you're right there in it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You know, LMP2, it's always, always really tight. There is no BOP at all in the LMP2, so we just push from the first lap to the end. After we have to chip the car in one piece until the last hour, because it's where it's matter. But the team is doing a great job. We, we had a small issue at the beginning of the race, but. Now the car looks better and we are able to fight, so I think our pace starts to be good and uh, we need to keep working like that, but um, step by step. Are, are you absolutely flat out or are we looking after tyres or, or is it really just a, a sprint race over 24 hours? Yeah, it's more or less a sprint race over 24 hours. Of course we take a little care in the traffic because we don't want to have any issue right now. So. I, I would say we're at 99 percent. Thank you, Paul of Chatan. There, it's not incredible to think that the LMP2 battle is literally that, just a battle flat out, driving those cars as fast as they can. The 32-year-old Frenchman from just to the southwest of Paris. Um, but uh, has been an international racer and very successful as Bruce mentioned last year here in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. They're doing the front uh, clip change, I notice, on the 04 now. So the nose damage, particularly on the front right corner, missing a dive plane. So during a scheduled pit stop, that work being carried out. It was interesting to hear from Stuart Cox at APR that uh, that would been left for a bit and now the opportunity to get it changed it's a fair there's a fair chunk out of the nose and you can see why bruce it was losing so much time yeah certainly uh, the the front right uh, headlight and underneath it well it's not really attached to the bottom part of the bodywork no. there's a great big chunk missing and you could just imagine the effect particularly going high on the banking of that getting airstream in where it's not invited to go in uh, from the design studios of orica but uh, again stuart cox at uh, APR just talking, Crossfire Racing by APR talking about how he's got all these people with incredibly clever telemetry and things, but you've still got that sort of seat of the pants team manager at the top of the chart. And he took that decision, went, you know what, we're going to lose more time if we do it this way. Let's do it the next way. Sorry, Toby Sowery will now at least go out in the car that's going to be handling uh, rather better than it has been for a while. But it is about managing the small things to add up to the big picture. And Stuart Cox, I mean, he really has been there, seen it, done it. And I, I just like that old school approach, actually. Uh, uh, clearly the, the attitude as well, that he couldn't even understand how to turn a lot of these computers on. No. I do like that. He doesn't need to. He's got people who know how to do it. That's their job. He has to bring all his experience experience to bear and that's what he does. Play to your strengths and uh, Stuart's been doing this uh, an awfully long time and brings with it therefore the necessary and crucial experience and uh, the boffins that operate the computers in the background well they're employed for precisely their skills as well and it's all combined into a team effort. It's easy to forget that a motor race is totally about the team behind the scenes as well as uh, the nut behind the wheel as they're so often called Good battling again in the GT Daytona and GT Daytona Pro classes. Daniel Junkadea only 0.4 of a second now over Daniel Serra. So Serra's been taking chunks out of the Corvette's lead in the Risi Competizione Ferrari. 0.6 through the last split. 
Tommy Milner in third in the second of the Corvette. So the bright yellow cars running first and third. And then Sheldon van der Linde, where I mentioned an absolute best lap time from the South African within class not too long ago. He still has that, the 146.094. And he's got the Paul Miller Racing BMW up to fourth position now, car number one. And is this a potential overtake? It's the 62, no, not no. behind the number three. It's going behind the 120, which is the Chris, uh, the Chris Chiphart racing with Wright Motorsport Porsche, passing it uh, really rather easily around the outside. But again, it's about one driver realising he's not in the battle with the other. Let's not slow either of us down. His maturity is totally sensible. And certainly uh, that red Ferrari from Ritzy Competizioni only going very well indeed. They're in different classes as well. One's GTD Pro, that's the Ferrari. And uh, certainly uh, it's a GTD only for Chip Hart Racing with that blue Porsche. So with its one functioning tail light, the Corvette of Daniel Juncadea now approaching the International Horseshoe. Ricci Competizioni's Ferrari just to the left of the BMW of Connor Di Filippi who heads out of there with the Corvette right in front of him through the kink and had to just feather the throttle there because there was oh and there's no way by the Corvette into the Eastern Horseshoe I don't think either he can get around now on the outside line just about clipping the kerb which briefly unsettled the car but nice control in the end from Di Filippi who maintains that second position he cannot afford to be losing too much time though on Colton Herter behind who's also missing some of the some tail light on the uh, Acura I've noticed as that hits the high banks once again yeah traffic doesn't affect all the drivers equally some laps it comes to you some laps uh, it just obstructs you but certainly the lap last time around for Collar de Filippi was uh, best part of one and a half seconds slower than race leader Tom Blomqvist in the 31 wheel and Engineering Cadillac, that did a 1 minute 37.7 second, that 1 minute 39.2 for Conor de Filippi, 1 minute 38.3 for Colton Herter. May have been traffic delaying Conor de Filippi, but if that degree of difference uh, continues, the uh, his margin over the chasing Colton Herter will come down to next to nothing. Let's see if this lap free of traffic, or is going to be relatively free of traffic through to the end, will enable Conor de Filippi, so long a BMW driver, it's great to have him in a prototype now, uh, can hold on to that second place, but the gap's going to be closing all the time. Again, a potential overtake in the GT classes through the tri-oval. So often the cars get really close on the braking area there. This is the Windward 57 car that actually leads the class. So this will be some lappery on the 43 Porsche, which uh, actually makes way for 57 Indy Doncha. So it's Gabby Chavez in the Conquer in the Andretti Motorsports Porsche, realizing that the GTD leader was wanting to get by. Chavez 12th. Doncha first and leading from Kenton Cook by over half a minute. The fight very much now on between Kenton Cook for Kortoff Preston and the inception racing McLaren of Ollie Milroy. Less than a second between the second and third place cars in GTD. Great news, have all that variety in the class. Up front though, it's just looking very, very good indeed to Tom Blomqvist. Eight seconds clear of Conor de Filippi. So Cadillac ahead of BMW, third place Colton Herter, the better of the two. Accurate from Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti, of course the sister car number 10 have had many, many woes and uh, certainly a loss of power early in the race, uh, let, left them scratching their heads, it's still, still circulating but way, way down the order, in fact 46th overall and I think effectively with those still running, only two other cars in behind, but still fighting on, still actually setting very good lap pace, too little too late though. Uh, Matt Brabham's now in the AO Racing car. You may have mentioned that. It was the first time I've spotted it in the 99, taking over from Paul Luke Chattat. So Brabham leading LMP2 by a smidge. That's half a second, pretty much, from Christian Rasmussen in the Aero Motorsport 18. And then it is Ferdinand Habsburg in the Tower Motorsports Orica. So 99, 18 and 8. Currently the top three in LMP2. GTP now headed by Tom Blomqvist with this nearly eight second advantage now over Conor Di Filippi who is exiting the International Horseshoe with the resplendent scoring tower over to his right just before he hits the left hand the little nagy left hand kink on the infield next to the bleachers there 
a wonderful place to be standing at this time of the morning though because uh, generally the big crowd that was there for the first four or five hours has dispersed for some sleep and uh, a number of times in the past I've uh, headed to the infield section because uh, this race really it does take on a completely different complexion in the dead of night uh, and you can get so close to the cars as well on the inside of that left hand kit you realize quite how fast they're going yeah but you know while the grandstands may empty in certain areas they remain full the campsite there are always people doing something whether they're yes. just nipping out of their tent to go and uh, check what's happening on the banking or whether their barbecue is ready to go in the night there are still people moving around so it has its own camp within the camp nature right i'm very pleased to report conor de Filippi got completely back on the pace of the race leader on that last lap so clearly the previous one traffic was in the way of that number 25 bmw but uh he is down to next to no juice left on board energy remaining five percent race leader tom block is down to 15 percent chaser in third place colton herter down to 10 percent and joseph newgarden fourth in the number seven porsche that will be coming into pit very soon again kevin estra who've led this race for a while has 70 percent on board he's half a stint away from coming in so the order is going to change and the six porsche will soon be back in the lead of the race expect a flurry in the pit lane joe they're coming your way very soon indeed a change of lead in lmp2 christian rasmussen needed to be brave there he got much better pace coming out of speedway turn two onward towards the le mans chicane and the overlap just about maintained on matt brabham so era motorsports charging hard with Christian Rasmussen to the inside line in the break zone for the Le Mans chicane and nabs the lead away from Matt Brabham in the 99 so it's 18 to the front spike the dragon back to second and how far away is Ferdy Habsburg from that scrap only a couple of seconds so whilst Matt Brabham might be slightly on the back foot this could be a big chance now for the Austrian driver to close in in car number eight there really is some good racing under cover of darkness here, isn't there? You know, it depends. You, you really feel the camera crews are just trying to work out which gaggle to pick up on. But they're, they're sport for choice. Almost at any point around the banking, we've got a class battle. The only class that's, uh, you know, an enormous margin between first and second remains to be GTD, where the Windward Racing Mercedes is sitting very pretty. 35 seconds to the good. That's Indy Dodge, the Dutch racer, head of car number 32, which is uh, the caught-off Preston Mercedes. So Mercedes 1-2 in class third place, the McLaren right on the tail of Kenton Cook is Ollie Milroy, the number 70 Inception Racing 720S. But Indy Doncha sitting on a, a chunky lead. Nobody else in the other three class can afford to back off for a nanosecond. We've hit 4.30 in the morning, so let's take this opportunity for a VP in-race update. Tom Blomqvist leads the motor race after 14 hours and nearly 50 minutes so that's nine hours and ten still to go and Whalen Engineering's Cadillac V-Series R after 476 laps lead by pretty much 10 seconds. Blomqvist over Colton Herter in the number 40 Wayne Taylor Racing Acura and Joseph Newgarten now up into third position because Conor Felipe, this car has just made a pit stop so the 25 BMW on pit road and Joseph Newgarten the Porsche from Penske Motorsports, the car to benefit from that up to third position. In LMP2, it's the number 18, Christian Rasmussen driven Aero Motorsports Orica after a splendid overtake just two minutes ago on the AO Racing Orica, the bright purple, spike the Dragon liveried uh, LMP2 car of Matt Brabham. They were side by side in the braking area for the Le Mans chicane and Rasmussen coming out in front. 18 leads 99 and the number eight Ferdy Habsburg Tower Motorsports Orica is in third position. GT Daytona Pro has Daniel Junkadea leading in the number three Chevrolet Corvette from Corvette Racing by Pratt & Miller. Ferrari 296 of Risi Competizioni just half a second back though for Brazilian Daniel Serra. So Span uh, Spain versus Brazil there for the three and the 62 and it's American driver Tommy Milner for the number four Corvette who is in third position. GTD headed by Dutchman Indy Donche for Windward Racing in their Mercedes AMG number 57 ahead of Kenton Cook for Court Off Preston Motorsport. And there's about 35 seconds now separating the two AMGs, GT3 cars in GTD. Third position is Ollie Milroy's number 70, Inception Racing McLaren. 
So representing the UK and Woking, to be more specific, the McLaren 720S GT3 Evo. That's another VP in-race update, live from the Daytona International Speedway. Around the world on RS2 IMSA Radio, we're at the track on 107.9 FM WDIS and on Sirius XM Channel 207. And another 90 minutes or so of the Night Owls with Sacred Stint. Bruce Jones to my right. I'm Johnny Palmer. We've got Joe Bradley in the pit lane providing our CrowdStrike pit lane reports. And the number three car just talked about the uh, three car being the race leader. Well, no longer, albeit briefly, because Daniel Junkadea arrives on pit road for a scheduled stop, Bruce. Yeah, the one, I, the one I was watching was actually the very slow pit stop, the long pit stop for Conor de Filippi. He came in in second place, a lap ahead of the race leader who's just come in now, which is Tom Blockfist in the 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac. But uh, the, the tail, the bodywork at the rear of the BMW was uh, removed. It looked like the gearbox oil was being uh, topped up. But for Conor de Filippi, that's dropped him from second down to seventh place. So that's not quite what the doctor ordered, but the American racer back out onto the track. And again, of course, you do have rolling repairs through uh, in the midnight hours. The Acura in second, uh, that came in from what was third place, Colton Herter, also sitting in the pit lane at the moment. The Whelan Engineering Cadillac, nice, clean, slick pit stop. It looks like it's going to be very much the same for the number the number 40 Acura as well, so that gets going as well. That's the red and black Acura, the sister car, number 10 was the one that had the problems, the blue one still going, but way down the order, all the way down, actually having just served a pit stop as well in 46th position. So let's take a look further down. Indy Doncha still just reading off the laps in that 57 BMW, uh, Mercedes leading. Uh, GTD for Winwood Racing. This looks like a really, really clear run. But three cars in second, third, and fourth in GTD. Kenton Cook in the number 32. And Mercedes from Court of Preston Motorsports. Ollie Mulroy in the number 70 Inception McLaren. And 80, which is uh, Rui Andrade, who shares with the uh, Lone Star Racing Mercedes. That's three Mercedes in the top four in GTD with uh, Sally Yoluk and uh, of course Scott Andrews and Adam Christodoulou. That's been in the lead of the class before, but at the moment Indy Doncha leading comfortably for Winwood Racing. Not a good sight with the number 14 Lexus RCF of Vassa Sullivan in the garage. So behind the wall, it's gone back to where the 14 crew are based this weekend. Carl Kirkwood brought that car in with clearly a significant problem. So once again, similar to BMW in the GTP ranks, it may well be that Lexus are firmly concentrated on the number 12 car and trying to get that initially up into the top six and maybe scraping a podium. But even that seems like a tough ask for Frankie Montecalvo et al. At this stage, a Porsche Penske Motorsport 963 arrives on pit road and this will be the uh, number... Is it number six or number seven? Seven, seven. car. Only look at the nose rather than the, on the side and uh, a windscreen clean as well. So from the lead of the race, Joseph Newgarden is in. Pippa Durrani has just come in and gone back out again, and Colton Herter back out into the race as well. So that will mean that the lead of the race flips from one side of the Porsche Penske Motorsport uh, initiative to the other. Seven bails out of, of the race lead, albeit briefly, and Kevin Estra back to the front. Well, I mean, he was really entertaining to watch not least for that pit low pit road entry for the previous stop right through a load of gt cars hang on a minute more dramas for bmw now they're yep. going to hope this is for the 24 rather than the 25 but it's not because the 25 economy for Felipe pitted not too long ago and now this is losing an awful lot of ground as well Bruce yeah I saw something being topped up at the rear of the car I think it was gearbox oil and I did worry the other crews uh, from the other class front runners in GTP were not doing that at this particular pit stop but I thought maybe it's BMW it's just a routine efficiency but clearly a scurry back in while that was happening I saw another mechanic who was out on the apron having to sprint to the pit wall to get something to put in the car then I saw it was whatever fluid was being put in the back but clearly something un Award. So Conor de Filippi, I had that slight concern ahead of the pit stop that he wasn't running at the pace of race leader Tom Blomqvist in the 31 Cadillac, 
but then it proved to be traffic. He was lapping within a few tenths of a second once they got clear of the traffic all over again. However, then it was the time to come in the pit stops. He pitted a lap before uh, the 31 Cadillac, but it was a longer pit stop. And now Conor de Filippi back in the pits, but uh, down in seventh place. He's now one and a half, two laps in arrears. So this is going to be very costly for them. And bear in mind, the sister car, the number 24, was running right in the mix, but about an hour and a half ago, came to a standstill just ahead of turn six, just going out of the infield horseshoe. And uh, that has lost an awful lot of time. In fact, I have to scroll down to 14th position and 14 laps off the lead of the race. That's Dries Van Toy in the sister car. So for uh, the Rahal Lanigan Racing BMW crew, always looking pretty good at the midway point in the race. And then suddenly things have started happening. But unfortunately for them, it's been on not one of their cars, but both. And that's where the real misfortune comes. Pit stop there for the number 32, caught off Preston Motorsports Mercedes AMG and Kenton Cook after at least a double stint is now out and Maxi Gertz welcomed back into the 32 car, it's dropped to 6th but with Gertz at the wheel you can guarantee that it will be able to make up a few more places between now and the end of this stint. It is 22 minutes to five in the morning. Kevin Estra is the new race leader in the number six Porsche Penske Motorsport car from Cadillac 31 and Acura number 40. As we can take another crowd strike pit report, here's Joe. Yeah, it's a 77 year old Porsche coming in for a pit stop. Tires and fuel only though, the driver's leaning on board. Replenished drinks bottle, but he needs that in this humidity. It's cooled off massively since this early evening, but here we are in the middle of the night and it's still very, very hot, uh, hot, warm and sticky. So what it must be like in those cars. Engine's still running while the fuel goes in in IMSA. And then the obligatory wheel spin just to scrub the sheen off those brand new Michelin's. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm getting word actually that part of the reason why the 32 came in and then then presumably then consequently done a, a full pit stop i.e. with the driver change as well is that he actually got black flagged for 32 caught off mercedes operational requirements which rather covers a multitude of sins it's one of those phrases that doesn't give you much information at all but uh, i can understand why they use it because uh, there could be all manner of reasons why it needs to stop but the 32 black flagged and then presumably permitted to rejoin after those operational requirements were met Absolutely side by side in LMP2 and around the outside goes the orange and white Tower Motorsports car on Spike the Dragon. A terrific overtake down through turn one from Ferdinand Habsburg to pick off Matt Brabham on the high side of turn one. You don't see that too often, Bruce. Ferdinand Habsburg does nothing that's not extravagant. I think that's an extravagant, fabulous move around the outside. He'll be chuckling his way around the banks, the uh, Austrian aristocrat. What a great inclusion he is in any championship. Such a character, not just fast on board, but you know he entertains and keeps the team's mo mojo up when he's in the pit garage as well. But by golly, he can race. So that was a fabulous move. And again, Daytona just offers something very, very special. No wonder it's caught on as a formula since 1966. 24 hours on the banking and infield, it's a cracker but that, again Ferdy will be talking his way through that moment many times when he finishes his stint but that was a brilliant brilliant start from him there the real advantage of doing it that way and you've got to be so brave and confident indeed in the car that it's going to do what you expect it to do but out breaking someone to the right hand side as you come off the banking which is what Ferdy's doing on the very next lap now and staying on the outside line the reward the instant reward is then the inside line for the international horseshoe you can be neck and neck with someone through the right and left sweeper round the back of the pits and then crucially have the inside line for the next corner which is the right hander at turn three i think it's normally called even though it's sort of turn four um, so yes, uh, that's precisely how Ferdy picked it off and it can work well in somebody's head but then in reality um, you need the stars to align for it to, to happen without any contact and uh, just the, the perfect example of it. You know what, you're quite right, it's, it, the very best moves often are, are planned some distance in advance but the driver's imagining them and I always sort of liken a driver when they're going out to set a qualifying lap, particularly when you've got a very short qualifying period, how they've pictured they have the mental image of how the lap's going to look. And the only sport that I think really has an equivalent is when you see people at the top 
of a ski slope and they're about to go racing. They're planning their route down the slalom course or how they're going to hit the jumps, how they're going to compress and make sure they don't get too much air. I mean, that's why I think uh, so many people that love motor racing also really love the Alpine events. I certainly do. And in fact, there aren't enough weekends in the winter to watch all I'd like to watch. But again, it's that moment beforehand when you can just sense a driver sitting in the cockpit. You can imagine them just, even if they're not twitching the wheel, in their mind they are. And particularly at the really tricky circuits. And one that always stood out for me, I remember watching Ricard Rydell, the great Swedish racer, picturing his lap at Macau before he went out onto that Superman circuit in, in the Far East for his lap, where really you have wall on one side, wall on the other, no breathing space between. And uh, you know, so many drivers do it, but some are just far more visual in, in that they're in their zone. You know, don't talk to me now, I'm at turn three. No, you're not sitting in the pit lane. And it's a fantastic analogy, and yet yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, <laughs> There are so many unknowns in motor racing. Uh, you suppose, I suppose you want to settle on the knowns first and have those pre-planned in your mind, and then your brain can be fully occupied by the, the unpredictable nature of this sport. Joe's got a little more for us down in pit lane. Just wanted to mention the 52 with the Europol car has come in and changed drivers. Not just, we've seen a lot of just tires and fuel uh, at this point in the race, but in the Europol, the 52, in there in the contentious LMP2 scrap that's the only way you can describe what's going on in LMP2 pure racing in those cars and uh, driver change for that car as Paul Lipschatan mentioned to you in a previous CrowdStrike pit report no balance of performance in LMP2 it's really, frankly not necessary the bulk of the order in LMP2 are the Orica LMP207 these they, we did have the Ligier uh, entering the race, of course, Sean Creech Motorsports, and that still running, uh, but in ninth place, and behind it, sadly, only retirees, i.e. the number 20 MDK by High Class Race Car, Seth Lucas last driving that, but it only reached 185 laps. Fewer laps than, la than that for the other United Order Sports USA car, number 22, retiring after 128 circuits and only making 107 laps, Richard Millet, of course, as Orica for Lewis Perez Compang, the la uh, last driver in car 88. So we started with 12 LMP2s, nine are still running, and you could say that eight are still very definitely in contention. Right, one thing I want to pick up on, Johnny, is the fact that so we had a huge class lead in GTD, the only class that had a big class lead, but that was uh, Winwood Racing, and the car gate brought in by Indy Doncher, but it's had a, a, a full brake change during that pit stop, so uh, they've got that done now, that'll take them through to the end of the race, just under nine hours of the 24 still remaining in this fabulous uh, Rolex 24 event, but that beautiful looking... Mercedes, and I use that advisedly because a fabulous livery, but it's looking incredibly clean at this point in the race. Uh, going back out onto the circuit, but they've had their long pit stop, they've got it done. Maybe some of their riders did it last time around, thus the large advantage over, well, at the moment, Ollie Milroy in the number 70. Uh, McLaren is second in that class, but with Phil Ellis uh, going back out onto the circuit, uh, GTD, the battle has been rejoined, but the, the brakes were done, cool, calm, collected at Winwood Racing and uh, always best i suppose to, to allow a half distance marker to uh, pass you by before you then uh, factor in the brake change sometimes that's not possible and it's done maybe an hour before the half distance marker but better to get to the bulk of the race under your belt before you do that they have to generally be done at some point because this place although there's a lot of open country on the speedway turns and on the main straight uh, heavy heavy braking which really does kill brakes turns one and the two horseshoes on the infield now the battle in gtd pro moving up from gtd to gt Pro, it's down to just uh, 0.277 of a second and Sheldon van der Linde who hopped aboard the number one Paula Miller Racing BMW M4 GT3 immediately set that car's fastest lap. We've talked about track conditions being brilliantly. He's getting closer and closer to the tail of Ollie Milroy. Milroy, sorry, uh, Tommy Milner leading the class, the number four Corvette Racing entry, but uh, it's almost nose to tail. Two car lengths between them, but having caught the toe, certainly Sheldon van der Linde, the South African driver, is getting closer and closer and closer. Now right on the tail, driving, oh, and diving into the pit. So playing with the driver ahead, I thought he's going to get the toe up on the banking and make a move into turn one, but instead he's turned more sharply to the left and come in. But certainly the pace that Sheldon van der Linde was showing is that M4 GT3 for Paul Miller racing is absolutely on top form. 
You can't really imagine a better scenario for an in-lap though there when you've got the toe of the class leader helping you through speedways, speedway turns three and four. And Joe Bradley not very far away from this stop for the number one. Is he going to stay in, Sheldon? Yeah, he looks like he's staying in. I was just next door at Iron Links where the 83's just been in for driver, tyres and fuel. Driver jumped out, driver jumped in. I'm not quite sure whether it was exactly the same size and shape. Goes to uh, the East driving that car. Which I want, uh, you guys will be able to tell me who was in the 83 and who's now in the 83. Well, Meanwhile, the number one BMW, Sheldon Van der Linde, is staying at the wheel. And that pit stop is done. And there he is, just uh, wheel spinning away. He was fueling tyres only. Yeah, nice, neat and tidy, Sheldon van der Linde staying on board. It should be Rahel Frey who brought, who's gone out in the 83. Not so long ago we saw Michel Gatting driving that car, and they're not quite the same shape and size. And Sarah Bovey and Michel Gatting are both uh, tall individuals, and uh, certainly Bovey got out and Gatting got in, but uh, now, in fact, uh, it's changed again. We've got, okay, we, instead of the two larger ones, taller ones, we've gone from the two smaller ones. Rahel Frey has handed over to Dorian Pass, so they're rotating single stints at Iron Dames. Doing it with a smile, doing it with a laugh, running eighth in class. So again, another strong showing from the all-female crew in the GTD class. Great to have them here. And maybe when you switch Rahel with Dorian, there's no need for a seat insert because I would imagine, and indeed to, to pull the seat forward or back, right. probably not the adjustment required that for then Michelle Gatting or uh, Sarah Bovey to take over. It's like there's been some planning. You reckon? I yeah. reckon so. Just quite just, possibly so. Just got a hunch, right? Tommy Bil Milner was leading his class. Ah, the number 25 uh, BMW coming back towards the pit lane and onto pit lane. We saw um, some shots, but not revealing what was happening when the work was going on uh, for BMW M Team RLL. They've already had the problem with the number 24. We thought it might be out of the race. That's got going again. But last time I checked, it was about 20 laps down. Overall, Dries Van Tour, the driver on board when it came to a halt, the long recovery, the car not making it back on the toe, having to be put on a flatbed. But it's a 25 car that, bear in mind, was running second when it was brought in by Conor De Filippi. But I can tell you what, it dropped to seventh, but importantly for them, or tragically for them, they're now nine laps in arrears. Really intriguing to find out what the problem was, but the fact of the matter is that the team thinks it's been fixed. The car's come back from the garages behind the pit lane and is now going back out onto the circuit. So work has been done. It'd be really intriguing to find out what the full extent of that was. Interestingly, during that lengthy stop, they chose not to address the uh, the one light out on the famous BMW kidney grill. Uh, it's not part of the regulations, of course, to have that illuminated because it's part of the car design to make it look like a BMW. But uh, one side of the kidney grill is brilliantly lit up in the sort of white LED strip, and the other one's been out for several hours now. But that clearly wasn't the focus to make the car look a little more symmetrical. Uh, they wanted it to be running, namely, and uh, it is at least under its own steam now with Conor Filippi still driving it sadly no longer flirting with the podium position dropping back to seventh position and a costly pit stop that um, the sector time which incorporates the pit stop 13 minutes and 30 seconds it's actually a lap time of 14 minutes and 43 seconds so it's lost pretty much 15 minutes but within that pit stop. Now we're talking a lot about the Iron Dames with their Lamborghini. Dorian Pass just taken over that car and Rahel Fry out of it, Joe. Rahel, the GTD class is about, well, it's like playing chess at high speed, isn't it? You guys just plugging the whip. Yeah, absolutely. It's getting more and more intense. I mean, we all love the fresh air of the night, especially the early morning. It's a pleasure to drive out there. We love Daytona, we love this intense fighting. Um, we are pretty happy. We had a little incident earlier on, but so far uh, it's going pretty smooth. Uh, we are back, let's say, with, in the same lap that's always important, and now we need uh, to be ready for the final push. Does the car actually uh, perform better at this time of day? The air is cooler, the track is cooler? Oh yes, absolutely. And you can tell as a driver. Absolutely, although you see I'm still red, I'm still sweaty, but uh, it's definitely easier during the night, but um, we are up for every challenge. Uh, we just need to bring it home now. Yeah, you make it sound easy. Crack on. Thank you. The 60-second edition of the 24 Hours of Daytona continues. We're still a good couple of hours away from the sun rising, by the way. Quarter past seven, I make it, for sunset on uh, Sunday morning, the 28th 
sorry, sunrise on Sunday morning, the 28th of January 2024. So well over 13 hours of darkness. Eight minutes to five in Florida, and Kevin Estra continues out front by only 1.2 seconds after 488 laps. So this tussle between Porsche and Cadillac continues at speed. And the Acura that Wayne Taylor Racing was insistent that might be able to make a podium, but that was really the best that the 40 car might muster. It's still only 5.6 seconds away from the race lead, you know. And we've got, yeah, OK, over a third of the race still to go. But on balance, there appears to be not a great deal wrong with the Acura AR6, ARX06. They've obviously been battling away with uh, various issues and perhaps not wanting to put words in his mouth, but they don't feel like they're necessarily fighting on a level playing field with the other big manufacturers in this race. However, the timing screen never lies. And it's under five seconds now, Colton Herta to Kevin Estra. Yeah, bear in mind also, quite simply, not one, but two of the BMWs have hit trouble. That's removed them, or certainly dropped them down the overall order. So you've just got to be there, be there, plug away. Might be half a second down some laps, might be a tenth the next time around, but certainly Colton Herta has really put up his hand. He's had a fantastic uh, double stint here, and he's still in the battle. And he's sitting on an advantage of 30 seconds over the car in fourth place, which is the Proton Competition Porsche. The second of the Porsches, of course, the race is being led by one of the two from uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport. That's Kevin Estra in the number six. But as in the previous stint, he's uh, how far into his stint? Well, he's, uh, he's down to 20% energy remaining. So if they've managed it properly, he's uh, effectively about, uh, two th about uh, four fifths of the way through his stint. He'll be making a pit stop. And then Pipo Durrani now in the number 31 wheel and engineering. Cadillac, that's car 31 and Colton Herter, identical amount of power left, 60%, so they're matching the bells, uh, you know, absolutely as they should, they have same pit stint length, four seconds between them, so there we are, Colton Herter, four seconds over the potential race leader, I think that's not too bad for Wayne, really. The previous stint for Kevin Estra was 29 laps, and within that, no laps of caution. So expecting that the number six car can do around about the same. He's already completed 25, so within the next four, maybe five laps, that number six car will need to come in for more fuel and perhaps more crucially, more energy on our little telemetry webpage, imsa.com forward slash GTP hyphen telemetry if you want to keep tabs on that amongst many other things if you've stayed up for the duration so far every credit to you even more so if you began with the green flag lap of the Dubai 24 hours which was many hours before we got underway here at Daytona um, because of the conflict in the Red Sea those two famous 24 these two 24 hour races um, conflicting somewhat on the same weekend that's posed quite a problem for drivers that wanted to do both for teams that wanted to do both and quite frankly for us here on the radio show limited network of channels because we have been covering both events on uh, each of our rs1 and rs2 imsa radio outlets but a thoroughly intriguing race in the middle east no spoilers here of course on imsa radio if you want to revisit that race later on in the week um, but uh, yeah, just a, a kind of festival of sports car racing for the final weekend of January. And frankly, you think about the 24 hour race being a good training process for the teams, the drivers, everybody associated with them. But for some of the ardent supporters trying to do the 20, well, what they jokingly call the 48 hours of day by as they combine Daytona and Dubai, some of them truly would have had high sights and they'll certainly fall short, I'm sure of that. Now, Joe Bradley, what have we got down the pit lane? The McLaren diving in. Yeah, just confirm this. Is it the 70 McLaren that was in the lead of GTD? Um, just confirm that for me. It, it is, it is. It's the Inception car. Yeah. Um, that car was uh, leading the class there just before the pit stop fears, and here it is coming into the pits. However, it's not just a straightforward pit stop. We've got the rear deck which exposes the mid-engine on this McLaren off, something going on there, not much, and then uh, we've got some air to, ah, to battery change, battery change, and the battery's housed in the front of the car, and to get to the battery you have to take off the air ducts, the air ducting from the front of the car that go all the way through, so it's had a battery change on the number 70, which is going to sort of drop it out of the 
lead. It's it's been flip flopping the, and sort of swapping the lead during the pit stop phases, and it's been in contention. I'm not sure where this delay for a battery is going to put it. The, the rear deck of the car was off because whilst they're changing the battery, that's the primary job. You might as well do something else and do a bit of service, like you know, top it up and top the oil up and see if Holly Milroy can shed some light, Holly. Because I'm just, uh, I'm just going off what I can see. I'm just going off what I can see. But uh, Ollie Milroy is hanging about on there. He's getting some. Ollie's getting some service done on his uh, on his kill suit. Ollie, have you just got? Yes, you have just got out. Is that a flat battery that you were in there? I'm not sure. It struggled to start at the start of my last stint then, um, and then it went on the second push of the button, and then for some reason it just won't start now. So, um, hopefully, not too long more, not, not too much longer that the car will sit there. You guys were well in contention, weren't you? Swapping the, the lead backwards and forwards. Yeah, and the car feels awesome. Um, like everyone, we're managing tyre deg a little bit. Uh, and, and it feels really good, especially at the end of the stint. It feels really strong, so it's very frustrating, really. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we're certain what the actual issue is yet, so... I'm not sure how long we're going to be sat here. All right, man. Thank you. So, a real shame uh, for yeah, the car, by the racing, way, Johnny, Joe. Um, he said that, and he was looking over my shoulder at the car. That's still sat here. It's still sat yeah. here, and it's uh, soaking up the time, soaking up the lap time. That's a shame. I make it nearly an eight-minute stop to this point, and they've not solved the issue quite yet either. You're quite right that it came in as the GTD leader the there is another mclaren in the race that's entered into gtd pro for faf motorsports but down in 10th position currently for james hinchcliffe gtd pro led them by daniel Junkadea. and there's been a lead change in gtp grand touring prototype new race leader is wayland uh, engineering cadillac v-series r of pipa dirani done out on track he got a terrific run on kevin estra and I reckon it was done at the Le Mans chicane to pull off the overtake, Bruce. Entirely so. Bear in mind that Kevin Estra is about to make a pit stop, hopefully with a little more warning than he had last time when he dived between a couple of GTD cars to dive into pit in. But the, sim the simple factor is that Pipo Durrani is in a, on a different stint, yet still managed to wheel him in, still managed to pass him and pulled away. Kevin Estra will dive in, and that means the number six Porsche will drop down the order all over again. Colton Herter should go up into fourth uh, from third overall in the number 40, Acura to second. But that is really telling for me because they were running different stints, and I really expected, uh, you know, Kevin Estra in the previous stint was about 10 seconds clear, came down to six seconds. Then, this time around, he's not only had that reduced to nothing, he's been passed by the 31 Cadillac. So that is supreme form for Cadillac 31 crew from Whelan Engineering. And Pipo Tirani, the driver, took outright pole position, the fastest ever lap around the banking here. And uh, he's proving that form in the race as well. This is Night Owls with Sacred for 2024, the 62nd edition of the 24 Hours of Daytona. Exactly five o'clock in the morning. We're on NBC and Peacock, we're on RS2, IMSA Radio, around the track on 107.9 FM. I'm sure you found that frequency quite some time ago, but if you've lost it in the meantime, or if you've got friends uh, maybe uh, in the vicinity, but not actually in the confines of the racetrack, they should be able to find us nearby on Sirius XM channel 207. It's the continuation of the weekend, which uh, I kind of like Bruce's terminology. We could call it the 48 hours of Dutona, Dutona, or day by, to combine the two. I'm not sure that'll catch on. And <laughs> thankfully, in future years, they should be on separate weekends as well. But we've had everything covered here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. Normally two weeks apart, so Dubai, not quite the pre precursor to Daytona, but um, we've had in previous years the Dubai 24 hours then the raw before the 24 here at Daytona then the 24 hours of Daytona on consecutive weekends we've had to give the calendar a little bit of a shuffle though in 2024 Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer here on RS2 IMSA radio for a further hour powered by sacred coffee and then we'll be handing the reins back to John Hindoff and the rest of the team 
as uh, we're already having a switch around actually in the pit road because Joe Bradley after a sterling effort bringing our crowd strike pit reports Shay Adam before him but uh, it's the third voice that we've heard many times already during the race Nick Damon now looking after matters good morning to you Nick good morning the third voice <laughs> Blimey. Uh, yes, purely so, statistical. Well, I don't know. I think in some ways, just always put me first. Anyway, uh, the JDC Miller um, 85, the yellow cars, actually go now a bit more yellow than it was when it came in, because they've uh, had a nose change. So they've uh, they've replaced one nose with another. Now that doesn't necessarily mean there's any damage on the previous one, because obviously they they change can give them a small downforce shift as well. So they can just change some of the diet plates, the internal. So it may just be for a bit of downforce, so there's no, whilst it's grubby, there's no sign of any damage on the nose and it's something they can do change within the time it takes to fuel the car. So uh, a tactical bit of uh, bodywork change, they walk past it and it still looks, uh, the one, the, one, of the, one of the light glasses was broken so that might be it, the hell actually broke one of the glass, glasses for the, the light so possibly that was slightly given an aerodynamic deficit so there's a new car, a new nose on the 85. He's the only voice in his head. That's Nick Damon for the latest CrowdStrike pit report. And there are another five laps to go until we reach the uh, half to a thousand. I don't, and we have never got to a thousand laps here at Daytona. That really would take some doing, but we got very high up recent years. I forget now the distance record. It wasn't that long ago, maybe three or four years ago. I'll look that up in a second. Um, Distance records have rather been scuppered though by a number of full course cautions early on in the race. In this new era of GTP cars, I suppose the reliability will come, uh, but there have been, you know, the odd glitch here and there, namely for BMWs in during our stint, 24 having its problems, and then latterly the 25. BMW GTP Bruce. Yeah, I was just taking a look at what sort of pace the number 24 BMW had managed since the problem for Dries Van Tour, where it slowed and stopped, had to be towed back to the pits, that didn't work, had to be put on a flatbed, lost a lot of time. Fifth, fifth, uh, 15 laps down is Jesse Croden, the number 24, but lapping as fast as the race leader. In fact, fastest car on the track, 1 minute 37.1 seconds last time around. And the second fastest car on the track was the sister car, number 25, down in seventh position, nine laps down after its uh, delay that took it back behind uh, the pit wall to the garages at the back. It'd be interesting to find out the real reason for the problem for that 25 BMW, but that's the second fastest car on the track. So they've been both delayed, but lapping really, really well at the moment. So Nick, if you could uh, sidle up to the BMW area and find out what it was precisely with the 25 and the 24 never had uh, got to the the foot of either of the problems for those cars that would be really handy indeed but right now out on the track both running supremely well It'd be really annoying if it was a tiny little problem i did joke but with an element of seriousness about my approach to that one that what if a driver had knocked the switch in the car that caused it to stop yeah which is number 24 it's happened many a time over the decades but let's face it, it gets harder and harder the more buttons to press in so many ways the cockpits seem even smaller for taller drivers maybe that's why Pipo Durrani goes as well as he does because he's not very tall or large in any di any dimension fits in beautifully to any cockpit and right now lapping in the lead of the race not particularly great pace at the moment he's only 1.6 seconds clear of Colton Herter so that gap has come down Durrani to Herta it's gone out to 2.3 seconds as I speak as they work their way through traffic but maybe Durrani's just uh, dialing himself in oh yeah in fact his last lap was the best one as he just in the early laps this stint he's down to a 1 minute 37.3 second lap that's uh, right on the money not quite as fast as the BMWs at the moment but they're respectively 9 and 15 laps in arrears after all their problems well well, let's hear from, we wanted to know about the 25 BMW and Nick Damon strikes immediately. He's just got the driver who's climbed out, Nick Yololi. Hi, Nick. Hi, I think it's hi, Nick, then. It confused myself because I'm called Nick as well. It's like, uh, it's very early in the morning. Um, it was, it's very early in the morning, but unfortunately not a great morning so far for the, either the BMW cars. First of all, what's the problem with the 25? 25, just, I mean, I've only just arrived, so just trying to dig to the bottom of it. I know we had to fill up something with the oil tank. Um, Obviously, we've lost a lot of laps, I think eight or nine, unfortunately. Still over eight and a half hours left in the race, so you never know with the yellows here. You might be able to climb those laps back, but not ideal. Uh, it seems to all be running okay and as normal now. Um, but the exact problem, I can't uh, tell you yet, I'm afraid. I mean, as an outside chance, you know what the problem the 24 had by any chance, because that's also had a long, long trip behind the wall 
Um, I know there was a small issue with the steering wheel, uh, but then I don't know anything else apart from that, I'm afraid. That's more than us, so that's fine. Um, now your car's gone out there, it's, it's gone to about to pace again. So it's one of those really annoying thoughts, it seems, where it's, it's, it's not working, you fix it, so it's actually full health again. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I, it was a very late call as well, so I think it's something that happened relatively fast. I was able to be fixed within, yeah, let's say five or six laps once we got the car to the actual garage. So, yeah, a bit of a shame because we've been fighting in and around the top three for most of the uh, race so far. But, like I say, still, uh, yeah, a long way to go, so you never know. You're looking as fresh as me, by the way. Where, where did you get in the car? Because you, 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 you wrapped yourself up for that. You in the car soon? Yep, yep, I am uh, in and about, well, just at the end of Connor's stint, so yeah, ready to go. Great stuff, thank you. Cheers. Nick Yellowley talking to Nick David in that CrowdStrike pit report, and uh, just before that, I was posing the question as to exactly how many years ago was the magic number of 833 laps, which still stands as the distance record. That was 2020. Uh, following the year which was massively affected by wet weather where we only got just north of 2,000 miles completed well it was nearly a full thousand miles more than that the following year when Ryan Briscoe, Scott Dixon, Kamui Kobayashi and Renga van der Zander won for Wayne Taylor Racing. Let's get back to Nick, more news from the pits. Yeah we've got the, uh, I could call it the Mustang sampling Porsche because it's actually it's the Proton Porsche isn't it which is a mountain climb up from a relatively slow start in the race and now is, uh, is up fighting with the rest of the five car. That's it's got a, you know, a full service. I think it's actually only taken, no, I think it's got all four tyres and a fuel slug of fuel. And that, what seems to happen now a lot is that they use the advantage of a full fuel tank to for a very good thorough look around the car. They just uh, prod stuff and check it. But it did look like the car was absolutely uh, A OK. I think the only advantage being black is you can't see all the detritus from the tracks. So it still looks as good as it did when it started. Clever bit of pre planning that, you see. Uh, to hide uh, various events through the course of the race. Um, we've talked many times here on RSL about boring white Porsches. Well, that can be a uh, not quite boring black Porsche, but one that can easily sneak beneath the radar. Proton very new to running GTP cars, and indeed um, the, car, the equivalent cars in the World Endurance Championship as well, the hyper cars, called different things, but essentially the same category beneath the beneath the skin and the tight link now nose to tail again in GT Daytona Pro so the number three Corvette heading into the International Horseshoe on the infield that's driven by Daniel Junkadea and with Daniel Serra right on the rear wing 0.9 of a second through the last split it's an awful lot closer than that though as they hit the infield down to basically a quarter of a second between the top two in GTD Pro it's been like this it feels like all of our stint long and probably all race long Bruce yeah it has and the driver in third place in the class is Sheldon van der Linde the number one Paul Miller racing uh BMW, that's running on its own. It's got a 13-second deficit to Sarah, but uh, the equivalent, in fact, slightly larger deficit, 14 seconds back to Tommy Milner in the second Corvette. But again, that BMW was going very nicely indeed. But uh, right now, as you say, just under, just over a quarter of a second as the cars hit the banking, the number three Corvette, Danny Junkadea, so many titles in GT cars, and uh, looking to see if he can get a class win here at Daytona. But certainly that ritzy competition, Competizione Ferrari in its uh, regular red livery is very much a thorn in its flank. And actually, as we go into the uh, Le Mans chicane, it closes in by about another tenth of a second and uh, has a better exit as well. This is a chance for Daniel Serra, the Brazilian, to get into tow. Four car length, three car lengths, the gap between them now. Turning left, turning left, staying low on the banking, and he's got a proper toe. Maybe we've got a move coming up, and oh, to complicate matters, an LMP2 car goes past them. And around the top of that as well goes one of the Porsche Penske Motorsport 963s as well, and the JDC Miller. Suddenly, from calm to fury out on the track, that's how it happens. You know, you're concentrating on your class battle, and then suddenly, kaboom, you've got competition out there. Um, uh, we've got a great sight of the cars coming through the final corner and through the tri-oval. Put your... Uh, feet in the shoes, the racing boots of Daniel Junkadea, who needs to keep a well watchful eye of where this Ferrari is, but also needed to be wary of those faster cars coming through. Which of those is he allowed to uh, to let by, and which 
uh, i.e. the Ferrari doesn't want to keep right behind him now to the high side of the kink was always going to be a brave place for Daniel Serra to put his reseat Ferrari that's uh, always a worry that he might skate out onto the grass on the exit of that corner and he did eventually get out of what would have been a bold manoeuvre on occasion more so in the prototype classes you can see that overtake done on the high side but not quite the real estate offered and quite understandably by Daniel Junkadea and Daniel Serra had that been two laps from the finish he might have taken a different uh, vantage point as far as that's concerned but we've still got eight and a half hours to go so discretion the better part you might say it was I saw that as a semi-serious attempt to go past I think you're just trying to unseat him knowing they just had the P2 car go past and a pair of the of the top class GTP cars as well. I think it was a semi-serious look, but sitting on the outside, as you go to the kink, effectively turn four, mm, you have diminishing returns. But he did it just enough to put the seed of doubt into Danny Uncadea's mind. But you know, it's not like the Spanish racer hasn't been attacked like that before. He knows True. what's coming, but this time around, it's a whole car length closer as they go around the banking. They've got a chicane coming up uh, very soon indeed. What's up ahead? Another GTD class car, looks like a Ferrari. They're gonna go past that. But if they're going to go past, they're going on the high side. More of a chance for a tow coming in. But the chicane's coming up. They reach the chicane. Still the red Ferrari. That was the uh, number 19 Lamborghini, is it? I think it's uh, certainly a green Lamborghini. No, it's car number 78. I beg your pardon. That's 40 Racing's Lamborghini. But that actually just broke up the battle for GTD Pro. The Ferrari had to duck in behind it. And now the Ferrari back on the tail of the Corvette all over again. Great battle. Danny Juncker there. Danny... Daniel Serra, 0.14 of a second apart on the start-finish line. Sandy Mitchell's Forte Racing Lamborghini, they would have really been hoping for a, a better run than they've had to date, down in 17th position. And uh, when you group the GT cars together in one, uh, not that the timing screen does that, but uh, it's something like 27th place uh, with 10 GTD Pro cars up ahead. But Sandy Mitchell at the moment will be focusing on well, Ollie Milroy's still stricken. McLaren, remember that car, the Inception Racing 720S, had been leading its class, still yet to emerge from behind the wall after its battery change initially, but it can't be as simple as that now, because that pit stop's been uh, a lengthy one, stretching towards about 20 minutes now, I would suggest. And therefore, Sandy Mitchell could be about to back a spot purely because of the bad luck for Inception Racing. Still Corvette ahead of Ferrari, and this time the Risi car doesn't get quite as good an exit out of the Le Mans chicane, so it won't be as close as it's been on the previous two occasions to Junkadea's Corvette. Now, just taking a look at the gaps between first and second outright in this race, it's still the number 31 Cadillac from Wheeland Engineering, still Pipo Durrani in the lead, but it, he's eking out a bit of an advantage now, just over four seconds clear from Colton Herter. Last time around he gained eight tenths of a second over the chasing American. Joseph Newgarden, a second American in the top three, that's uh, in third place in the number seven Porsche. All lapping, actually no. Race leader Pipo Durrani, 1 minute 37.5 last time around. Joseph Newgarden in third, 1 minute 37.9, but 138.3 for Colton Herter. So the Acura losing a bit of ground. Was it traffic? More than likely. But let's take a look at that. The uh, Nick Tandy in fourth place, also lapping in the mid 1 minute 37s. High 1 minute 37s for fifth place, Neil Yarny. Likewise, Tip Timon van der Helm in number 85 for uh, JDC Miller Porsche high 37s same as Conor de Filippi but he of course is 10 laps down after the problems for number 25 BMW Nick Yaloli couldn't really answer the problems with that one but uh, steering wheel problem he thinks is what afflicted car number eight is car number 24 in eighth place overall and that was the sister BMW where we had it coming to a halt just approaching turn six suddenly not moving at all with Dries Van Tor at the wheel but that unfortunately for them is 14 laps down both BMWs still going still lapping well however they've had their problems here comes the Ferrari into the Le Mans chicane and it's just a bit too far back for Daniel Serra but he thought about a move there is there a little bit of a haze coming off the back of the Corvette which is being picked out by the Ferrari's headlights and this is definitely Daniel Serra's opportunity now to slice underneath the Corvette uh, I'd like to see Daniel Juncadea's uh, sector times to see whether they've dropped off at all it might just be a little bit of miss because here comes the Corvette on the fight back so there's certainly no question that the top speed is still definitely there for the number three car 
and often this lack of light can play tricks to the naked eye but down into the first corner they will go again and they're in a different order this time around I think there's just an a little bit of ambient mist here and there which uh, was tricking me to think it was coming off the back of the Corvette but now those cars have switched around it's still present between the Ferrari and the Corvette too so nothing to be worried about as far as the performance of these two cars is concerned and Daniel Serra was plugging away so many times I thought his best opportunity for an overtake would have been coming off the banking and into the first corner in fact he did it into the Le Mans chicane on the back stretch. Yeah what's interesting since that happened uh, trying to fight back Danny Junkadeo could take the wider line into turn one, a better sweep through the corner, didn't find an advantage, could also take the wider line in turn three. But since then, they're now just turning through left through the exiting the horseshoe through turn six up onto the banking. The Ferrari is pulling clear, so I, I really think the story has been told. He just was careful, cautious for a handful of laps. Spike has just flashed through beneath that uh, number three Corvette as well. And the number 10 Acura into the pits. This is the the one that's up at the front, the one that's had all the problems, got behind the wall when I said into the pits, so I should have been rather clearer in my description. Yeah, not a scheduled start, well it may well have begun like that for Brendan Hartley, but it's turned sharp left part way down pit road and into the garage area for Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti to do more significant work to the number 10 Acura of the two ARX 06s, though this was the one doing not as well. Uh, I'm sort of uh, trying not to exaggerate with that uh, comment but the number 10 car had dropped many laps earlier on and this could be yet another problem to compound the issues from earlier however the sister car the number 40 ARX 06 still in the hands of Colton Herter pretty good only 3.7 seconds away from the race leader Pipa Dirani so having established itself into second it's gone up ahead of the two Porsche Penske Motorsport 963s Joseph Newgarten and Nick Tandy in the seven and the six and they're running third and fourth but crucially behind the Acura in second and the Cadillac V-Series R of Pipa Dirani as we've reached 505 laps completed in this year's race the Daytona Rolex 24. Well, certainly still very, very busy out there, but uh, just the pace of the number 31 wheel and Cadillac is just relentless. Last lap a little slower because of traffic, but uh, bear in mind the sister car, the 01 uh, Cadillac racing entry, likewise was going really well in and around the top two, top three, and then suddenly going nowhere at all and out of the race. You never wish any misfortune on anyone, but particularly, I think, in the past decade, the way that the, these cars are put together in all the classes, the GT classes and the prototypes, these, these cars are much more rock solid, but they tend to run well and then a problem happens and then quite quickly you can be out. If it's electrical, it may or may not be fixed. We've had problems with both of the BMWs in the top class, but the difference is you haven't got loads of drivers out there nursing cars that are already with problems. Problems come, it's a question where they come, but they're not coming at the rate they used to. It's not something you generally have to expect that majority of this race bouncing around the banking, putting the, so much stress and strain on these cars that you're going to be having a car that's not performing at its best. While they're running, they're running really smoothly. Fastest lap of the race, still to the race leader, Pipo Durrani, 1 minute 35.863 seconds. A good lap at the moment is more like uh, low 1 minute 37s. Last time around, he wasn't so good. I think there was traffic. A 1 minute 39, followed by a 1 minute 38. But he's getting back onto the pace, and as soon as it clears up, head of the 31 Cadillac, and right now it is clear for them, the lap speed will increase. Yeah, the 47 car has recently entered the pits and there were some race control messages suggesting that that car had suffered some impact at turn five. So the Chetilar Racing Ferrari has come in, Antonio Fuoco potentially with damage as we head to Nick Damon with more news from the pits. Yeah, the Chetilara car just trundled past me, it looked fine, I mean, obviously there's a problem on the right hand side, I couldn't see it. Uh, the Inception McLaren, the 70, has rejoined after his electrical problems and I am staring down the uh, very much the pit in and I believe that is the, uh, the, the red Acura, let's call it that, the number 40 car. That, to me, has had uh, a uh, rolling away several times. It's had a full set of boots and fuel, but I don't think, I don't shoot if I get it wrong, I don't think there's a driver change there. Thanks, Nick, for that crowd strike pit report. Uh, yeah, so the sequence of messages from race control at 17 minutes past five, so that's four minutes ago, impact at turn five, which is the second of the horseshoes on the infield. Then they confirm that 10 seconds later, impact for car 47 at turn five, 
and then a further 10 seconds after that car 47 continues and it came all the way around the track and Antonio Fawoko brought it into the pits it is actually rejoining now so they've done a stop maybe to check things over or perhaps they plan to do a stop at the end of lap 459 regardless and the Chetilar racing Ferrari 296 back into the race as Nick suggested look fine from his angle and also in from the lead of GTP is Pipo Dirani's number 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac so how many laps were on that particular stint? I make it 29, Bruce, which is about Bob on. That's the number that sticks in the mind. That's the number he seems to run to. So running like clockwork for now. But Nick Damon, what else is happening down in the pit? Well, it's a little bit away from me. It's lights are shining, so I guess luckily, luckily it's white lights. So you can tell it's at the uh, GTP. And again, I'm not sh I don't think there's a driver change. Just there isn't that kind of panic around the car where they're changing the driver. The uh, number of tyres being wheeled away is just two, I think, but then it's, uh, it's been fueled up and away it goes. So, yeah, this is uh, very much the point where they've got some real pace in this car and they're turning laps and then really leveraging the advantage. As I talk about the 31 wheel and Cadillac, I'm walking past the now completely stripped. It's like there's been uh, uh, you know, some sort of birds have come down and pecked every single piece of pit lane equipment away from the Cadillac racing, the other Cadillac, the Zero One. I'll be honest, I was uh, I was enjoying some 40 weeks, so just for my benefit, perhaps anyone else has just woken up. What happened to the uh, 01 Cadillac, Johnny? Well, we don't actually know for sure. It was out on track and doing perfectly well when Ranga van der Zander was at the wheel, and then all of a sudden we went full course caution because the Zero One had stopped on the back straight. and. I don't think at any point we actually got a conclusive answer from Cadillac as to exactly what went wrong, but we can only guess it's something electrical, which will cover all manner of things in the hybrid era of sports car racing. There was no damage uh, to the car as such, but uh, Renga van der Zander slumping out of the car to a vehicle that took him back to the paddock, he was absolutely fine and left scratching his head and all of a sudden Cadillac were down to just one car still in contention and you can hear the engine note of Pippa Durrani in the background the Cadillac V-Series R that was leading when it came into pit road it's dropped to second position but you're absolutely right Nick the 31 had no driver change and we're now getting an impression of how little there is under the awning of 01 they are almost fully packed up Meanwhile, next door, Risi Competizioni, the party continues at the 62 crew because they're having a great race, leading GTD Pro. You know what, particularly for the mechanics and engineers, when you're going through the night, you want a battle to watch. Not only did they have one, they had one in which their car came out on top. That's Daniel Terra taking the leading class from Danny Juncker there. Nick, you're super busy down in the pit lane with CrowdStrike. What have you got for us? It's more GTP fun, basically. This time there's the number seven Porsche that's coming. This is, I, I can see it, I'm right close. This is, so they've done the two outside tyres. They've got the uh, left-hand side tyres to offer. Are they going to take them is the question. No driver change, yep. So it's four tyres for the seven Porsche. And they'll be up and away with the same pilot as they had when they came in. And away in a moment or two will go the number seven car. Looks like another set of medium compound tyres with the yellow panel uh, visible on the right hand side. And generally, I think that means a full set of medium compound Michelins. Uh, we have seen in the previous season of the World Endurance Championship compounds being mixed with hards on the left and mediums on the right. But keep things simple here. Uh, predominantly, of course, a left-hand circuit. A bit of a squirm and a, a, a wiggle of the wheel there from Joseph Newgarden as he's about to rejoin and the number seven car back into the race. But Pippa Durrani, as a result, now uh, is leading once again in a 31 car ahead of Nick Tandy uh, by 11 seconds. And the seven car just waiting for that to ping. And in fact, Felipe Nasser, I beg your pardon, is the new driver in the number seven Porsche Penske Motorsport 963. So their cars are on the timing screen in second and fourth. We've got customer 963s for Proton and for JDC Miller Motorsports just on the fringes of the top six, fifth and sixth to be exact, for Neil Jarney and Timon van der Helm. And it's BMW's seventh and eighth as they continue on their recovery drive. There were no tyres replaced on the 31 car. And when you're retaining driver Pippa Durrani, that would make sense. 
tyres heavily restricted as they so often are in this race so you want to certainly be double stinting a set and there may well have been portions in the dead of night as we're not quite in the dead of night at uh, 27 minutes past five but when tyres have been triple stinted to make sure that uh, you've got some very useful rubber for the closing stages of this race Bruce save where you can and of course when you get a full, uh, full course yellow they get an opportunity uh, to do just that but uh, right now the important thing if you if you're taking a little time away from this race you're just coming back you think whoa the number six uh, Porsche is going well it's in second place just 10 seconds down on the race leading Cadillac it is half a sequence out so it'll be uh, pitting in about fi about 15 laps ahead of Pipo Dirani who's the race leader so Nick Tandy will uh, at some point uh, be coming in and dropping down the order all over again that should promote uh, the Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti Acura Jordan Taylor at the wheel now up into second place all over again and just about possibly maybe no Neil Yarny will also have to pit uh, relatively soon not as soon as Nick Tandy he's running fourth Yarny the Swiss racer in the number five Proton competition Mustang sampling uh, Porsche the black and uh, gold delivery car but he'll be one of the the stoppers sooner Timon van der Helm also in another Porsche 963 will be coming in uh, fairly soon but for those who just made a pit stop the number seven Felipe Nazar Porsche is in fifth place likewise Jordan Taylor not long ago in the pits he's got 90% of his power left that's in the number 40 Acura and our race leader 90% of the power less in the 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac and the good thing if you're fans of Cadillac racing is the fact that uh, Pipo's getting this to run like a train as his teammates have and in every stint he's just gaining a little bit more of an advantage for the number 31 Cadillac it's telling the last few hours have been very very interesting indeed it was closer when we came on air to start our four-hour stint at the global broadcast center but uh, the story is starting to unfold as we heard from joe bradley when he was down in the pit lane with crowd strike conditions actually as cool as they've been throughout as you'd expect when you're getting towards five o'clock in the morning as it was when he uh, departed the pit lane and nick damon came on board the official line from Cadillac, the party line, was that the reason for the Zero One's retirement it was mechanical. Ah, I feared as much. Yes. So you can uh, you can file that one away under uh, a word that can mean all sorts of things. And regarding the 47 Cetela Ferrari, I talked about Antonio Fuoco leaving the track at Turn 5. Well, Cetela have said that Fuoco went off on an outlap and caused some damage to the left side of his front bumper he then rejoined but then went off on his next outlap at turn five apparently so that 47 car has had two recent offs but, but nevertheless it was able to rejoin let's skip back to nick damon for a crowd strike pit report uh, and it's a full service of the number three the pratt miller corvette racing something works machine uh, antonio garcia now has got on board racing uh, replacing danny Ciccadella. um they have as they finish the, often as you expect, they, they finish the tyres, they're still fuel. They're, they're, they are taking the opportunity to, to put some of those very pressurised metal cannons in the side, so that'll be either water or oil going in. I believe actually there's a little kind of box. That's the Corvette fall. Oh, that's not right, they didn't get the full effect because it stopped. Uh, that car has only one rear light. You might know that because you've been here overnight, but now this is not working well. The car, Antonio Garcia, got it going as you heard, and then it stopped. Uh, trying to second burst of Corvette. Uh, thank you, Nick. And actually, during that driver change, Antonio Garcia was really struggling to get his, one of his uh, belt straps over his shoulder, so he probably lost a couple of seconds, and maybe, just maybe, he uh, slightly hesitated as he tried to get the acceleration done. 5.30 in the morning. It's RS2, IMSA Radio, at the track on 107.9. FM and at this juncture chance for another VP in race update with another portion of the race to go remember we didn't start on the half hour or indeed on the hour a 140 start so another 10 minutes and we will be at the two thirds distance marker 511 laps completed and Pipo Dirani leads in the number 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac V Series R from uh, the Nick Tandy driven Porsche 963 car six from Porsche Penske Motorsports the gap is almost nine seconds and in third a third different manufacturer in the form of the Acura ARX06 from Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti that's Jordan Taylor son of Wayne and the number 40 car running in third position LMP2 the top three are all Orica 
uh, 07s, and it's Aero Motorsports' Christian Rasmussen, number 18, leading by almost 20 seconds over Ferdinand Habsburg in the number 8 Tower Motorsports car. Ben Hanley for United Autosports USA is in third, car number 2. GTD Pro, now led by Daniel Serra in the Risi Competizione Ferrari 296, number 62, 8.1 seconds in front of Sheldon van der Linden, who's doing a superb job behind the wheel of the Paul Miller Racing BMW M4. He still holds the fastest lap within category, set uh, a good probably hour and a half or so ago when track conditions were at their most perfect, although Nick still admits it's incredibly muggy down in pit road, but the, the track just lended itself nicely to the Paul Miller car doing that 146.094 not too long ago. Third position is the number four Tommy Milner driven Corvette for Pratt and Miller, Corvette racing by Pratt and Miller. So Ferrari, BMW and Chevrolet Corvette all present in the top three. It's a guessing game as to who might be on top by the end of this. In GTD, two Mercedes leading the way. So that's Philip Ellis in 57 for Wynn Ward, ahead of Kortoff Preston Motorsport for Maxi Gertz in number 32. And the 0 2 3 uh, Triassi Competizione Ferrari of Riccardo Agostini completes the top three in GTD. That's the latest VP in race update. And with that, just under 30 minutes of the Night Owls with Sacred Coffee stint to go. Let's catch a little more from Nick Damon. Down with uh, Danny Ungadella from the Corporate Racing, out of the number three, out from second place. A bit of a, a ding-dong battle with Daniel Serra in the uh, Ferrari as well. Yeah, I mean, it's still early in the race, but I think we can already see uh, Ferrari, BMW, they're very fast. Um, the Corvette, uh, the CO6 GT3R is very good, uh, to be fair, like, it's just getting better, the cooler it gets, uh, the car feels better, uh, but I feel at the moment we're struggling to fight those guys on pure pace, so I just wanted to give him a bit of a fight, you know, not make, make the way easy, I know it's still a long way to go, but I want I wanted him to make, uh, to work for his, for his position, and uh, yeah, worked out for a couple of laps. But in the end, I, I had to give up. How hard can you push? I suppose all the cars, especially the, you know, your new cars, the first you've run it, you're, you're, you're about to look at thinking about conserving tyres. It's a very limited, limited resource, aren't they? Yeah, that's the thing that with the new compound, it's kind of weird. And it's not like in the past where you could push uh, the whole stint and you had sort of a negative degradation with the fuel dropping. Now it's a bit difficult. Um, still learning, you know, about the tyre. Um, so yeah, we, we're suffering with a little bit of degradation at the end of the stint. So I'm trying to keep the tire at early in the stint to try to manage manage those rears uh, to be more consistent at the end. Danny, thanks very much. Thank you. Keeping his powder dry, I think it's fair to say, in that CrowdStrike pit report. But you don't want to speak too soon. Still very early in the race, he says. Well, we have had nearly two-thirds of it done now. But I, I get what he means, because there's still an eight-hour race that stands in front of us. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of bread-and-butter World Endurance Championship race length is six hours. And we consider those to be a big, big challenge. Uh, this is by no means done yet. Yeah, but to paraphrase... He's effectively saying the Ferrari was slightly faster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep it simple. True. Uh, Nick Yellily rejoining, by the way, after a pit stop in the number 25 BMW. So that is in seventh spot. And Yellily, uh, I think, will have been right on the button there. Well, Conor Di Filippi bringing the car in after 26 laps. And Nick back in the car. He was reporting to Nick Damon not too long ago that uh, he'd been away for some rest. So was just starting to update in his mind what had been going on with the two cars and there was quite a lot actually to download there yeah well before probably just about the point he went away they were running absolutely in the mix when we came on air uh, into the into the global broadcast center they were running in the top four comfortably not quite at the pace of 31 weedon cadillac or of the zero one uh, cadillac racing example and one of those has hit trouble since then and then both of the bmws have but galling for them since they've come back they're running absolutely on the pace all over again so whatever their respective problems were are behind them for now let's hope they don't get repeated but that moment where a driver has taken a little bit of time away 
you don't just walk back in and know exactly what's going on. You know, you know the sort of feel of the garage. There may have been no mechanical problems, but there might be something that the team know about. You've just got so much information to take on board, and you're not at your best. Anybody who's coming to take over a car at uh, five in the morning is hardly going to be feeling sharp. And uh, who was it who told us that? Joseph Newgarten saying you can never really repair, prepare too much for going through the night. It's going to hurt, come what may. A couple of coffees, a couple of espressos, possibly quite not enough. Uh, to uh, get you through but you know each driver does it in a different way some some are able to sleep others simply in their break they would just want to lie down some have a massage everybody has a different approach and it does depend at what point in the race it also depends how physical the car is you're driving yeah. if the car's not behaving you're going to feel a lot more tired in fact you ironically probably sleep better after driving a car that's been really difficult because you've just burnt through a bit more of your own personal juice in fact that'll be the next screen we'll have that for next year how much personal <laughs> juice has a driver got left on board while their energy with fantastic graphics showing us how they're dropping down nick tandy will be the next driver in from the gtp class he's running in second place because he's only got 30 percent of his juice left whereas recently the peeper durani's got three quarters of his t energy tank filled at the moment another car coming in soon will be Timon van der helm the jdc miller motorsports uh, porsche 963 that's running in sixth place so many so much data to look at but it's great it's just you simply don't have enough eyes or enough time to look at it throughout the entirety of the race while trying to commentate at the same time very difficult, I would imagine, after one of those tricky stints to actually be able to switch off, though, as well. And uh, you'll be in that sort of state of just dropping off, and then you'll jump back awake again, thinking, am I still in the car? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm back in the, in the trailer. I just need to switch off for a few hours. Uh, it's a tough old thing, this, but that's why it's such an immense challenge, a 24-hour race, wherever it's being held around the world. There's something about Daytona, though, about being... being perhaps the most intense it feels like you're under a microscope because there's no escape from this place in the grandstand uh, spectators can see absolutely every corner and they'll also i'm sure pick out nick damon in the pit lane well i am perambulating on my own towards the uppermost direction of the pit lane uh, which i will find the 21 car the uh, af course the ferrari uh, daniel serra um, looking at the uh, huddle of, uh, of people around the car. I think Daniel stayed on board this time, but he is getting a full set of tyres and obviously a full set of fuel as well. Uh, the checkage appears to be very similar as we saw the Corvette, a bit of a, a fluid top-up, but nothing untowards. That's what they're going to see where they come out in relation to the three car who they're battling with pretty much as they went through. Just look to my right, and we've got a couple of other cars coming down, including the Mercedes 57 car, which I think actually is one of the leaders in the GTD... Uh, uh, GTD uh, class. That's has the, been. That's the uh, yep. car that's uh, the uh, Winwood Racing Machine has led for a while. No driver change there. Just uh, tyres, but not even that many tyres. Oh, no, they had the stupid, really odd way. Ah, oh, now this is really interesting. The 57 is going to drop down now because it's having to do its brake change. So the 57 is doing its brake the change front. on the uh, front brake change, actually on the uh, apron, but that's going to cost them some time. So they'll probably. Uh, uh, forfeit their lead in the class, which is the GTD rather than the GTD Pro. It's actually, I think the 21, which is sitting on the uh, apron about ooh, 100 yards from me, that's also doing its brake change. So both the uh, cars that are around the lead of their prospective uh, GTD-based classes are doing uh, longer stops to uh, make sure they can stop later in the race. OK, Nick, that's very interesting, because the last time the 57 Winwood Mercedes was in the pits, they certainly changed the brakes at the front right. I didn't bother looking at whether they'd done them on the front left. That's the one they're working on now. That'll be most odd. But uh, I thought, as I said to you, Johnny, they're taking the pain now. You said get past the halfway point in the race, then start thinking about a brake yeah. change. I thought it had all been done. So there may be a story down there. And certainly... Uh, Philip Ellis brought it in with about a 30-second lead. He's now tumbled down to third, fourth, fifth in class. Interesting. I don't understand why they don't do one set in one pit stop and one in the next. Well, Who unless knows? they did, and then there's been a problem in that stint with the brakes not quite sitting correctly or snatching, maybe, mm. and the focus was all on the front left corner. They didn't do any work on the front, on the on the right side at all, apart from changing tyres. The pads on the left have been used for a long time, so it does suggest that they did front right the previous stop, and they've now finished the job on the front left. Nick's just had a chance to see those pads that will be incredibly hot, and there's not a lot of meat on them now. So that suggests they were installed on the front left from the start of the race, and they've now married them up. Well, I mean, there's only so many personnel you can uh, allow to jump over the wall, 
and rather than uh, take a, a you know a longer stop where you're doing both sides together they've obviously worked out that a half and half job is quicker in the long run yeah well i can imagine that looking at the sort of um orchestrated ballet of the mechanics working around any of the cars and you don't just suddenly hop into the pit lane and uh, no you know you have this is where so much planning goes in and of course also the ability for all the crews to uh, while they're in the race they can't really look to see what other teams are doing but if they look at the replays of the race they can see exactly how the more experienced teams work their pit stops uh, we've hit the two-thirds uh, point of the race folks so that's 16 hours done and now just under eight hours still to go 7 59 and 20 seconds as now the leader in lmp2 is in pit lane let's take a crowd strike report yeah, it's on that the, from uh, the era number 18 car uh, Freddie Robinson has got out, not again, can't see who's got in because I'm trying to position myself also so I can watch the Tower Motorsports uh, stop. They're currently second, they're on the wall, they'll be in a lap or so. Uh, this is fuel and tyres, it's four tyres for the new driver. Now, I think a little bit of a, an effort getting him in the car by the looks of it, but they aren't having to do anything else. They need to replace brakes in the P2 cars, obviously, unless there's a fault with them. And that car gets away in pretty much a faultless stop, and we'll have to see how well the Tower Events team do. Then they take Freddie Hapsburg out and replace with Michael Dinan. The Night Owls with Sacred Coffee stint nearing its end at very nearly quarter to six in the morning. You're tuned to RS2 IMSA Radio and now there's a drama for Spike the Dragon which is off the road from LMP2. This is Matt Brabham in the AO Racing Orica that has found a tyre wall on the infield and that is the second of the horseshoes, I think I'm right in saying. So, clouting the barrier. No, it's not. It's the first of the horseshoes. International yeah. horseshoe is... Because Turn three. Of course, more cameras are now being cranked back into life after the overnight stint. We were entirely reliant on Rooftop Ray for the overnight uh, segment. And now viewing from his camera, the number 80 car coming down pit lane. But yes, turn three is where Matt Brabham has maybe outbraked himself. Perhaps there was contact with another car, not had the opportunity to see how Matt has ended up there but he may well have stalled the car as a result. It's not firing into life or it's trapped up against the rubber belt at the International Horseshoe. Yeah, the number flashing on the door is, you can see five, fifth position LMP2. And, and uh, that has uh, really scrambled. Is there going to be any, a replay that shows us anything happening? Well, locked up, going into the corner, very much on the left-hand side. The track was going to the right. And then for Matt suddenly getting onto the grass where he should have been on the tarmac and up against the tire wall. Can't see what the degree of damage is. It didn't look like a particularly high speed impact, but he certainly stuck against the wall there. And the headlights were flashing well before he made the barrier. So whether the engine had cut out as a result of that as well, I'm not quite sure. Nick Damon's got more pit stoppers though. Yeah, I got the uh, uh, full course caution. Car. Nick. Full, and it's gone full, full course, course caution. Okay, that's interesting. Now, yeah. uh, what I would say. And that was the Tower Motorsport P2 car leaving after a full service tyres, driver, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think the, uh, that uh, P2, the Batman Rapids P2, had been in about two laps earlier, so he w wasn't exactly straight out the pits. It's like his second time, my guess is second time round for him. Uh, yeah, so a busy time for uh, the stops in LMP2 and um, jumping it. Well, some will have beaten the caution being waived, of course. Remember that when a full course caution is announced, that automatically closes pit road. But some may well have got in before the red light was illuminated and some may well have preempted it, of course, knowing that Matt, was, Matt Brabham was uh, tucked in at the International Horseshoe there, slapped up against the tyre wall and race direction will have given Matt as much time as possible to try and get out of there under his own steam and as soon as that was evident that it wasn't going to happen uh, caution is the result and that means we can take a, a crowd strike pit, pit interview now with Nick Damon uh, <laughs> uh, with Freddie Hasberg just out the town it's been quite amusing is uh, his, his mate's just been covering up a couple of the stickers that aren't quite right for this sentence I put it it's, it's radio uh, which kind of um, confused him slightly uh, great uh, Freddie great uh, stint there the, the town machine really coming back into contention now i mean i think we always had the potential but we dropped back you know that one or two laps in the beginning which we've luckily got back so now we're in the battle for the lead which is just insane 
Um, I'm just watching the TV to hope everybody's okay in the accident there. My my this year's teammate uh, Paul Lou is in that car, so I hope he's all right. But I don't think. Anyways, I'm super happy with my stint. Absolutely, I had a new set of tires at the beginning, so I was able to just build up to it. And as the fuel came down, the car really came alive and um, gives me a lot of hope for the for the for the race to come. Yeah, the temperature, whilst it's cool, it's refusing to get cool. I mean, how is that affecting the tyre wear for these cars? You, you, everyone's running with limited amounts of sets, so how are you having to, to manage that? I think we're just taking advantage of the cool to, like, make sure we have all the fresh tyres that we need when it gets hot again. So, uh, right now, the tyre deck is not so bad. Um, of course, it gets quite, you know, brutal towards the end of the second stint, but manageable. So, uh, if it was a lot hotter, we would have a lot more troubles. But I think we'll be able to manage with uh, a lot of new sets towards the end, which is what everybody's planning for. I mean, the other thing I'd say, as we've gone through this, this, this deep night out, has the, uh, the driving been respectful? We saw kind of a bit of a uh, argy bargy in the first couple of hours. It does seem to have calmed down. Has everyone got their sensible heads on? I, <laughs> I don't know. To be honest, I've had a pretty lonely race in a way. I'm just out there driving, doing my laps, which I like. You know, I can just focus on myself. Um, I've seen a couple of uh, funny moves in the beginning for sure. Luckily, we can see the car going back on track. But. Um, yeah, I think everybody's kind of respecting each other. I was able to overtake two or three LMP2 cars and they always gave the room. So every time I've been out there, they've been fair and I've tried to be fair back. So hope that will stay till the end of the race, yeah. So thanks, Ferdy. Ferdy, they're helping us with some commentary as well as the 99 car was rejoining on the screen left with that CAO uh, P2 car. I know, doing uh, quite a good job as well. So uh, better watch me back. He's uh, very handy indeed behind the wheel of particularly an LMP2 car. But uh, that phrase we can see on radio, mm, We'll have to stamp that out very early on in his broadcasting career. But I can assure you the 99 Spike the Dragon car has indeed got going again with the help of the marshals. Didn't prevent the full course caution coming out though. And it had been a while since we were last in caution. So this will be a full uh, wave around and uh, the two segment pit stop phase as well. Just going to check how long that green flag running was uh, until a thing I think a third yellow during our segment that's a vast improvement on some of the broadcast stints that I did last year when most people were blaming me for full course cautions and for safety cars and for code 60s in other championships two hours 36 minutes and 32 seconds of green I'm very proud of that frankly Johnny I'm surprised you're back but you've redeemed yourself but we've still got another commentary stint of three hours coming up we have well, a little true. two hour break you've got a chance to recharge your batteries and then get the drivers back on the toes but really good to see that uh, man the, the Brabham driven car, the spike getting going all over again. So for AO Racing, they live on because it was going absolutely fine. But I think Nick pointed out it, Matt Brabham had just taken a pit stop in that and it was probably his second time around, his first time at full speed. But it was interesting that Spike just seemed to not want to turn. You could see all the dust being kicked up at the outside of the circuit. Then he was on the grass and then it kissed the barriers. Be interesting to see what the front left damage is on that car, if much at all. Yeah. As you say, relatively slow speed, but uh, he would have felt the hmm. contact with the tyre wall. I, I would be very surprised if uh, any of the crucial innards of the LMP2 car, drivetrain, etc., and uh, drive shafts will be affected by that. But it might be that the the splitter needs to be replaced. Similar, in fact, to the 04 crowd strike by APR car earlier on when Stewie Cox was chatting to Joe Bradley in a previous crowd strike pit lane report describing. Um, just a nose to tail bit of contact and they carried that damage for a, a, a few stints actually before they then took the opportunity to change the front clip as it's coined and if you weave that into a driver change you don't lose much time at all in actual fact the longer stops are the time to do that rather than just a just a fuel stop for instance Tommy Milner's just brought the Corvette in and back out again and that was surely for emergency service because uh, the rest well first of all the GTPs haven't been allowed to pit so he's had to come in no doubt for fuel and yeah goes back out again and let's hope that that was a very short stop indeed and they didn't do any more than they were permitted to do in a closed pit lane from the lead of the race in GTD Pro the Corvette Neil Verhagen installed into the Paul Miller Racing BMW M4 during the last stop car number one and Davide Regon in the 62 Risi Competizione Ferrari. Another nine minutes to go before we reach the top of another clock hour, and that will be six o'clock in the morning here at Daytona. So here come the GTPs right towards Nick Damon. 
and you're going to be presented with the first, the second, the third, and possibly more cars all at once. So eyes everywhere in this crowd strike yeah. pit report. The first to hit its marks is the 31, Nick. Yeah, it's a, it's a complete phalanx, and I'm kind of... It's quite interesting, because both you get secluded by another GTP each time, so I'm, sort of, I'm at the kind of the far end of the, of the list of them, and, as I, and one pops in and covers the next one. Now, one thing I can tell you is that the, uh, the Proton car's gone for a driver change. That's the number five, the Mustang sampling uh, sponsorship. Also a full set of tyres. Already underway is the Whelan car, and I think, yep, Durrani stays on board, recognise the helmet. Uh, running into second place, that's the 40, the Acura, the deep red car. Again, not, uh, uh, anything more about three cars, but I can't tell you if it's, uh, it's changed driver or not. Uh, the car close to me is the 52, that's of course the uh, Inter Europol P2. There goes, now the, the Porsches are all through weight, they've got the six car, and interestingly, all of them showing about the same amount. The one car that's been left behind at the party is the JDC Miller, the 85, the yellow car. They've had the rear deck off that. They've had the rear deck for a look. They haven't changed it, I don't believe. Um, full set of tyres. JDC Miller car comes down off the jack, so you, know, you can take these extra 20, 30 seconds. It's absolutely fine. You're not losing anything apart from a bit of track position. And that car goes away. So the uh, question is, who changed the driver? Nick Damon down in the pit lane with that crowd strike pick report as we gently bring to a close the famous nay infamous night owls session and for the moment at least uh, we bid a fond farewell to our night owls of Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer powered through that four hour session by sacred coffee available in uh, Europe and the US, they got their own grinding and roasting facility in the US now. Search Sacred Coffee wherever you are in the world. Fulfill your coffee needs. And that is just about it as far as our coverage on Peacock is concerned thanks to our colleagues from NBC for handing off their airwaves the world feed flag to flag coverage for international viewers continues and of course if you're in the US you can stay up to date if you're moving around as the sun starts to come up this Sunday morning with Sirius XM channel 207 or imsaradio.com and that is on RS2 part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels for those of you in the US at 6 Eastern the video coverage picks back up again with our US colleagues just about a couple of booths further down to my left Actually, it's a bit bizarre at the moment, because as I look to my left, uh, I can see the real TV booth and the TV booth that they built last night for the movie. And the coverage continues on USA. Pitcher now open for all cars. Pitcher open all cars. Let's head back down to the pit lane for this crowd strike pit report. Nick Damon has snagged himself a driver. I've snagged myself Neil Yarny out of the number five, the Proton car. Um, as the race is going on, it appears to be getting better and better for you guys. Well, our uh, testing is uh, the race because we haven't been testing here like all the other guys in December. Uh, so we try to do a lot of laps here. First time with this car on this track. Uh, Roman and Alessio, first time ever in this car. So, you know, we're just getting better with every lap. We're learning which pressures work at what condition. 
just the basics basically at each stint and hopefully by the end of the race uh, we are there and we know what we need to do. So how much can you do with the car without taking the engine cover off and adjusting the ride height and the, and the springs and everything else? Um, you know, there's tyre pressures, you play a lot with and especially with the hot weather we had and now cooling down, um, it's quite crucial to be always on top of it, especially because of the minimum target. And as soon as you overshoot, you are, uh, lose a lot of pace. When you undershoot, obviously you're illegal. Uh, so it's, it's, that is experience and that's what we are learning now. Great stuff. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Nick Damon down in the pit lane. Uh, with Neil Janney from the number five Mustang sampling Porsche. And that's just about all we have time for for our viewers on Peacock who've been with us here on IMSA.TV and IMSA Radio over the night time period. Once again, our thanks to our colleagues at NASCAR Productions and NBC for putting this together for the overnight coverage for you night owls powered by Sacred Coffee. For those of you in the US, switch over to the USA Network where co coverage continues through to the end of the 62nd running of the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. Meanwhile, for the rest of the world and those of you here around the circuit on 107.9, it's John Heindorf and Peter Mackay. Still very dark here. And I'm sort of trying to cast my mind back, Peter, to last year when we did exactly the same and we came back and picked up after Johnny and Bruce on the the overnight on the Night Owls coverage and I can't remember when it started to get light uh, in real terms it's, uh, it's about 13 13 hours of 13 hours and 17 minutes of official darkness. Sunrise at 7.15, so over, over an hour uh, away. And hopefully, and I've been looking at the weather forecast all the time we've been away, hopefully I think we've dodged the potential rain that was forecast yesterday. And it came really close to us. It came, and Jeremy was spot on when he, he said it's about four miles away, and it, it passed straight over the top of the circuit, basically just over the northwest of the circuit, and uh, missed us just. Uh, so hopefully that means we stay dry for the rest of the uh, the race, particularly for all those uh, uh, weary campers uh, in the uh, infield when we welcomed uh, Mr. President John Doonan uh, into the booth uh, just at the got around midnight last night um, he said that the infield is absolutely packed there's not any spare space at all left so hopefully it stays dry uh, for them and hopefully we'll get one of these well just so dramatic lion king-esque floridian sunrises that's what i've come for hello to red square images that's uh, and he's written this so don't have a go me irish kev uh, so that's silverstone in the middle of the carbon fiber triangle in northamptonshire and buckinghamshire in the uk hello kev good morning and thankfully it has been i caught an accent at six o'clock in the morning john <laughs> you don't know kev i tell you he's a top bloke he, he really is lights are out on the safety car and P. Porzerani then will lead us back to green. The Cadillac pulls off to the right-hand side. It's the darker of the two cars. Here are the bright white lights, the GTP cars, and immediately jumping out of line and up and over the top. They're going three wide down on the transition with the Porsche on the infield side. That's Felipe Nazar and Jordan Taylor's right there as well. The top three on the lead lap. In fact, still the top six on the lead lap down towards the international hairpin two porsches having a look down the the inside at one time there for a moment but it looks like durani who's obviously on the same shift pattern as we are peter because he's he's doing the long shifts when we're on 
and the running of the down towards the probably where the similarities end that's a whole more certainly yes first time i met people to run it was at a world endurance championship prologue at Porica in the south of france and he was still happy as a clown because he had an lmp2 drive and the, the car was up on the high stands no wheels on getting some work done and he said and I was doing an interview with him and he said, I'd just like to get in my car. Oh, Nick Demons just said he did you buy before that. You're absolutely right. That happens to be how I knew him there. I was just wondering there why he bothered to speak to me, but that's right. We must have been in Dubai together, Nick. Thank you. And he said, would you like to sit in the car? I laughed, obviously. I'd have got in. I'd have still been in it now. I'd have been wearing that LMP2. This is, this is incredible. We've got six cars on the lead lap in GTP. That's how impressive this race has been and how close it has been. Four of them are Porsches, both, uh, both privately entered Porsches, the uh, JDC Miller car and the Proton Competition car, both on the lead lap with the two works car. That, that's incredible. Couple of penalties uh, with improperly served emergency service obligation for the Ford Mustang of Fred Favich, number 65. That sounds... And that's a stop plus 10. That sounds like they probably Lee took Jay too much fuel, uh, not just the five seconds, or they did something yeah, else to the car. And also for the Ricci Competizione, Ferrari in second, Davide Rigo is going to have to do a drive-through. Oh, my Roy goodness. Uh, not properly manned on the fire GTD extinguisher. That's a safety one again, and we talked about no penalties in our Michelin countdown to green. Davide Regon in the pit lane now, stays in the full speed lane. Oh, from second at GT That's going to hurt just after a restart, but he wants to get it out of the way. Further back, it's the uh, fastest lap of the race for Scott Andrews in the number 80 Mercedes AMG. That's the Lone Star Racing car. They've done really well. They're on the lead lap in, in class in TPT. They had a, a quite a tough, uh, quite a tough test and deep practice, but they've uh, they've just worked and chipped away at it, and they're right in the hunt. Three Mercedes AMGs on the lead lap in GTD as Pippo Durani comes over the start finish line. He's opening up a big gap at the front already. He's checking out. Yeah, Felipe Nasser in second, trying to hold off his teammate Nick Tandy. He's in a different postcode at the moment. It looks like... In the evening, uh, has in he the got hours. super boost or something? Run over a turtle. An hour the oh, I have no clue, but he's opened up now in event. the space of they one green flag lap, 2.6 seconds. The battle is on for second position to the with the two the Porsches going down towards the western end of the infield to the horseshoe. Both taking rather odd lines there. There was a defensive line from Felipe Naza and Nick Tan. And his teammate right there as well. Now, Louis gets back in. It would not please Mr. Penske if those two came together, Peter. Oh, it would not. Uh, but they're even just fighting is allowing people Durani to escape because in sector one, Felipe Nasser in second place lost seven tenths of a second to Durani. That lap where Durani opened up that 2.2 second advantage, he was only three tenths of a second off that car's best, which is the best of the race. So Durani has just switched it on straight away. You mentioned half a dozen cars on the lead lap, of which 50% of them exactly are Porsche 963. 66%. Oh, really? Four out of six. Oh, four out of six. Yes, yeah, sorry. So both private yes. cars and both, both work private cars and both work cars. I, I, I apologise to the, the JDC Miller Motorsport to team and it looks like right with now that uh, bright yellow number 85. Going to be one of those strong cars. My eyes were drawn to the two BMWs next up. The yellow submarine and snuck up on you. It really has, <laughs> stealthily. Uh, Johnny Spike Palmer reminds me that Sunrise last year on Sunday the 29th, which is when this race ran, was exactly the same time as this year, 7.50. So far, 
now we're back so, to racing this I have, being the I have recent no recollection of coming back in this much darkness. I thought it was already starting to get light right last the year. Corner, we're gonna see that sun. Here you see the so, leaders in class. Again, it's the action. Been a long night. 13 hours and 17 minutes of darkness. By the time the sun starts to peak over the eastern horizon. And at the moment, it's Pino Duranic who is driving into that sunrise. With the so remaining Cadillac, night, mechanical issues for the 0-1 car and keep when it like was running Run very well now. indeed and then noon, it wasn't. NBC, it stopped out on the circuit, event. And we say, joins the that is growing long list long of cars with night. issues from that we now know Steve all of the manufacturers to be honest we first lost the TDS racing Oringa on lap 58 Stephen Thomas taking a wild ride after clipping the exit curb of the Le Mans chicane and hitting the safer barrier pretty much head on the 88 Oringa LMP2 of uh, Richard Millier of course uh, after 107 laps Daniel Goldberg 128 for United Autosports. They had a couple of goals to get that car back moving after an accident. But the 22 went no further than that. 185, Seth Lucas. Finally, the MDK by High Class Racing. Oregon cried enough. The number 20 car had been put through the ring again quite a bit. In, in fairness, Lucas Stoltz was the last driver in the Sun Energy One Mercedes. 193. In the race control working with 193 laps completed for that bright colored 75. No Iron Links Lamborghini number 60 went on lap 293. Magnus Racing, Spencer Pompelli was the last driver, the number four Aston Martin 294. 303 lap, another Aston Martin Harner Racing team, the 27 car was retired. They had to wake up call Alex for them. Lynn was Matt the last Yoke driver of 13. That had a troubled start of the race. They somehow got it to 308 laps. Haven't seen that one for a while. So we'll keep an eye on that. To see if it does pop back out again. Gianmarco Liberato from Proton must act it. He and his team did 67 laps in the light blue number 55, light blue and white car. And following, following on this number 11 and double numbers, the 66, Tatiana Calderon driven Gradient Racing Angra, retired on lap 368 to the pits. It's not been seen since. Neither has the number 14, Vassa Sullivan, Nexus RS. They've got the 397. That car with Mike Conway on board involved in an accident, actually, with the 20. High class racing car very early on, and the car got back and was rebuilt. It's turned some laps, but uh, not been seen for quite some time. That 397, given that we are working lap 531 at the moment. Fastest lap of the race for Nick Tandy's car, just been turned by the man from Bedfordshire in the centre of England, 136.2, and he did that whilst passing. Felipe Nasa. So now it's 31 6 7 Cadillac Porsche Porsche. And still with uh, Jimmy Bruning sitting in fourth place, just another three tenths of a second behind Felipe Nasa. So the three Porsches now beginning to work together. This is more sensible, Peter McKay. You cannot give a driver of the standards and the tenacity of people to running in a team like the wheel and engineering squad you can't give them any advantage and all of a sudden that 3.2 seconds will be starting to worry roger penske and the rest of the porsche teams and this is one of the few times we've seen in the race where the the, the cadillac has jumped away on the restarts and has been Good had a point. quick sprint start when we've, we've, what their real strength has been is big, long, green flag running where they just go in this relentless pace and begin to slowly pull away. But this is the first time we've shown this burst of pace. Meanwhile, in GTD, it's a complete punch up as it has been all the way through at the GTD Pro and GTD intermingling uh, between one another. Phil Ellis for the uh, Woodward Racing team 
uh, leading the way right now, but by an absolute whisker, he's battling tooth and nail with Robbie Foley in the Turner BMW right now, and in LMP2, well, there's about a car link between the leader, Conor Zilic, for Aero Motorsport, and Toby Sowry in the 04 Crown Stride Racing Car, two youngsters who have just blown us away. Oh, I, yeah. I, I you took the words out of my mouth. Impressed is not a strong enough word for these two youngsters. Connor Zilic, who we're used to seeing recently in the uh, Whelan Mazda MX-5 Cup. We had two outstanding races, one on Thursday, one on Friday here at Daytona there. Now traditional season opener. Already they are posted on the official IMSA YouTube channel. And I am not for a moment suggesting you tune away from what you're seeing now. But this week, if you've got a couple of gaps of 45 minutes, perhaps on your lunch break, I suggest you settle down and put that on. If you want to see 45 minutes times two of pure racing and excitement from start to finish, the Whelan Porsche, excuse me, Whelan Mazda MX-5 Cup is uh, absolutely the place to go. Quick shot there of the Lamborghini was that the number 45? Yes, it was. Into its garage. Yeah, yeah, the Wayne Taylor Racing uh, with Andretti, the Dex Imaging car in GTD, uh, running a little bit further down the, the order. Um, so it has not been a good 60-second Rolex 24 Daytona for the Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti crew. Their number 10, Conor Kubinolta car, uh, had, uh, well, was in the garage for a couple of hours uh, repairing an electrical issue. Their Lamborghini, as we just talked about, has gone back to the garage. Uh, however, the number 40 car, the other Dex Imaging, Acura GTP, driven by Jordan Taylor right now, is on the lead lap. 10 seconds off the lead after Louis Delatraz ground to a halt just three, four hours ago and had to recycle the car and get going. So they're still in it. So that's, it's not all lost yet. Yeah, that number 10 car, if you weren't with us earlier, uh, was Philippe Albuquerque in that car and it just went dead stick on him after a little bit of smell of electrical burning, he thought. They replaced the wiring loom in a couple of hours. I'll tell you now, that's an incredible feat to do that. These are complicated pieces piece of machinery and now Kyle Marcelli back to the paddock area in that Lamborghini Huracan Evo Wayne Taylor racing to the Le Mans chicane for the number 18 era motorsport car keeping traditional colours of blue at least mostly blue this year on that car, always an easy one to uh, identify. Winners two years ago. Yeah, they know how to win, exactly, Peter, you're right. Crowd strike have had a good night as well. Stuart Cox will kill me for saying that one. They are still running very much at the sharp end of the field. Getting some good times now coming in. Tom Dillman in fourth position in the ET Europol by PR1. Just done that car's fastest lap of the race, the yellow and green machine. But the battle at the front of LMP2 has remained tight since the last restart a few moments ago as we come up to 6.15 in the morning, Eastern. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are this Sunday. 11.15 in the UK. Way. Welcome to those of you who stayed through the night, maybe feeling the pace a little bit now. The Dubai 24 hours finished a wee while ago. Maybe a few of you have got a sh couple of hours shut eye and come to join us here on this live coverage. What a weekend for endurance racing. Monte Carlo rally will reach its climax today. Pete has been keeping a careful eye on that. It's been very close. Has it? Yes. Yeah, very, very close. Elephant's still there? No. No. Uh, there's the two other drivers. I won't spoil it. Okay. I won't spoil it. Okay. Save it for later. Save it for later. Okay. <laughs> 
fact-picking the highlights uh, later on. We can watch it on my own life. Oh, later, we can, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, we can be entirely antisocial at dinner later. <laughs> No, no change there after 24 hours of working. <laughs> Nick Damon is our crying strike pit reporter for this segment of the race. Uh, not in the pits, though, Nick. No, I've been uh, exercising myself, and the fact that no one's going to go anywhere in the pits because of that yellow for a few minutes, I had to walk right around the paddock. So um, the uh, bad, well, good or bad or different news is unless you're the 45 Lamborghini, uh, which came in a second ago, and if you're scored behind the ball, uh, you're not coming back. Because no one is working on any cars apart from that 45. The number of, effectively, really, if you, if you have two numbers on your car which are the same, uh, <laughs> you're in big trouble and you're under a car cover you've given up. Um, so, yes, the only car having any work done is the 45. Uh, but, uh, Alvin, is the 10 car yep. actually going round? Yes, it is, Brett. Right, back out again. Because I, I was wondering whether it just stuck it on the truck. He's been in and out like a. Uh, 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 in out, uh, piston, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the most cutest in and out I can think of. Um, and they, well done uh, at this time, Nick. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Uh, you, uh, I, I was you missed my magnificent opening to this uh, section at five in the morning where I confused myself by saying the word Nick because I was talking to Nick Yellowly and thought, why are you talking about yourself? Um, well, it's because it's all about you, look. Well, it, not that time of day, it's not. So, yeah, so we've, we've seen a, a, a level of attrition uh, uh, recently. So obviously, for example, I've walked by the, none of the P2 cars, they've all been packed up and gone. So, yeah, all right. if you're. If you're out, you're staying out if you've got the Lamborghini. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I don't, I don't, I mean, apart from the large number of P2s, I don't, I don't think it's been a particularly attritious race, is it? Well, three P2s, four P2s, a bit in the dust. Uh, it is, in that case, if you take out the Wayne Taylor Lamborghini, there are five GTDs and three GTD Plus. A dozen, round dozen official retirements, I'm being right, told, from is our producer we'll Aaron. It's not the wrong quarter, it's not the quarter of the cars that started. The uh, but they've been spread relatively the evenly end, across the classes. Uh, with, well, actually, with the exception of GTP. Yes, with the exception of GTP. So the GTP is unquestionably the most complex cars and seemingly the most reliable on this day. I've said it now, haven't I? Oh no. Let's just recap that. That's four LMP2s, three GT4s, two, four, five GTDs, and a GTP. With that Lamborghini not counting, the 45 Lamborghini went to a racing car being worked on at the moment, so we're not writing that one off just yet. And there are no double numbered cars left, are there? We haven't got a 55 or a. 77. 77, we do. Oh, we do have What do we have? Uh, AO Racing. Oh, 77. Uh, oh, yes, oh. you're right, of course. Sorry, AO Racing. Oh, yes, that's the that's oh. the last one. Lauren Heinrich in that car, 15th GT D Pro at the moment. Will the, will the curse of the divisible oh, no. by 11? That's a great chapter for a book, isn't it? The curse of the numbers did it, divisible by 11. It's not the catchiest title I've ever heard. Think not? So, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> Jordan Taylor, now the wheels back with the uh, back with his family team, Wade Taylor Racing. And switching back to Porta, he's driven for Corvette for several years, picked up lots of success, championships. Rolex 24 hour wins, but back in a back in a prototype. And he's got a, a new helmet painted for this uh, for this race with his two dogs, uh, Fonzie and Chachi, that are on the back of his uh, helmet and running with him. Two golden doodles. Lovely dogs. 99 is still running as well, which is the other AO race. Did have a bit of an issue, it brought out the last yellow. Correct. Uh, uh, but, but, it's but it's still going. It's yeah. just gone out of the pits with Alex Quinn behind the wheel, I believe. Good. So, so we'll see if that one So if you want around. to break the curse, you've got to either be a dragon or a dinosaur. Well, yeah. works have always have got a little bit of magic dust, there haven't you go. This is not what you were expecting when you tuned into the <laughs> race <laughs> program. <laughs> if, uh, if you're an aficionado of long distance racing, particularly in the overnights, I, I accept that it's not overnight everywhere, but uh, it's been a very busy few days for the broadcast team, so we do tend to get a bit uh, tangential at this stage of the motor race. We'll bring back the voices of reasoning, Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones, in about an hour and a half's time, and then we'll go directly to the flag. Dino Pascal. 
do not collect any more full course yellows if you don't mind. Like to have a nice long run at the end of the race. I suspect so would the 31 wheel and engineering oh, yeah. team as well because they've been good. Nick Tandy, however, has pulled that gap down. He's about half it in the last couple of laps. The LMP2 battle continues to be entertaining as well with Connor Zilic. Uh, just a couple of seconds now ahead of Toby Sabri, Pato Award, which I almost stumble over every time I see his name written as Patricio Award. But it is his full name, Pato Award, one of 14 active IndyCar drivers in the field at the start. He's in the third place in LMP2, then Tom Dillman for Indy Europol. So go down for a crowd strike pit report and indeed Nick Damon is picking off the drivers as they get out of their cars in this early morning session and he's caught up with Matt Grabber. Matt, I have to ask you what, what happened on that second or third lap out? <laughs> um, yeah, obviously just uh, got caught out there a little bit, um, you know, obviously didn't didn't want to do that so I was disappointed and uh, you know we were looking uh, really good there so yeah just big apology to the team and uh, I mean yeah just yeah, sucks but uh, you know those things happen so I just got to move on from it. Was there actually any damage to the car? Um, I'm not sure I, I mean we did touch a little bit but uh, everything felt okay but it's hard to know I mean we have to kind of I was just trying to focus on driving there at the end, but hopefully, hopefully nothing that really affects us too much. I mean, luckily, there's been some yellows that will come up and get a chance to catch up in the in the 99 AMP2. I mean, how is this this uh, Oracle going? Is, is it a good car to drive? Sorry, what's that? Is, is this car, you know, on the whole, a good car to drive throughout the stint? Oh yeah, it's so much fun to drive. I mean, the racing is uh, so awesome to be a part of, and. Uh, yeah, it's tough out there, and, uh, and, and the racing's hard, and it makes it so much fun. So I had a blast out there, but obviously just yeah, disappointed myself, and uh, had to just move on from that mistake and learn and, and keep pushing, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I didn't see the whole Was it, was it a, a bit of a, a touch of some traffic, or did you just go off your own? Uh, I just came out of the pits on cold tyres and just lost it a little bit going into turn one and went straight on, and uh, I just wasn't expecting it to be so slippery and um, just locked it up and went off. So, yeah, just mistake and you know, obviously uh, I just feel bad my teammates because they're doing such a good job and you know we're right up there in contention uh, in the top three so yeah, yeah it would have been uh, nice to, to give the car back over and in, uh, in the same position but uh, I mean it happens. Thanks for honesty, mate. That's Matt Brabham out of the 99 AO LMP. I would expect nothing uh, else from a Brabham. My, he's had a very career. Good to see him in that car here and it's uh, to check back in with Toby Sowery, three seconds away from Connor Zilic at the lead of LMP2 in the CrowdStrike Algarve Pro racing at number 04. Going through the Le Mans chicane at the moment, the CrowdStrike next-gen cyber security car is the red and white machine, and he is trying to get back on terms. I suspect he's been given a little bit of a hurry up by his team because Pato Ward has started to close in on him. Now just two and a half seconds further back. The front of the field coming through to the same part of the track on the back straight before he dives left, right, left into the bus stop. Le Mans is our leader, P. Porterani. Nick Tandy just holding steady around about one and a half, two seconds in arrears. But he's pulled away. Nick Tandy has pulled away from the other two Porsches. Felipe Nasser now four seconds behind and about the same gap between Nasser and Brody there or thereabouts. But it's Porsche 963's second, third, fourth and fifth now with Phil Hansen having got ahead of Jordan Taylor. So that is a new fourth, uh, fifth position, excuse me, for the number 85 bright yellow car. And I have to say, I didn't see that happen, so I apologise for that. But that must have been in the last couple of laps. And Hansen has pulled away by a couple of seconds. Porsche's getting into their stride. 
if you if you think about this, there's a certain look to the sort of 80s and 90s here with two Porsche works cars and two customer cars beginning to gang up on the rest of the field. No question. This is what the you know the Porsche 962 was really the ultimate customer prototype, the ultimate Porsche customer prototype and it defined the GTP era in the uh, the 1980s and really dominated this race and you couldn't do that without having good customer teams who could buy the cars and race them and in uh, GDC Miller and Proton competition they have just excelled um, with cars that they Yes, JDC Miller ran the car for, for a, a part of, of last year, but they're a, they're a private team and they're kind of doing it all on their own. Um, Proton Competition, as uh, Neil Yanni said, they didn't come to the December test, so they've had to do their testing through race week. They've done more miles than anyone through race week, and they've had to get Alessio Piccarello up to speed in his first race in a prototype, let alone a 963, uh, and Roman Dumas, not his first race in a prototype, but the first race in this one. The Got the leader in LMP2 passing the leader ago, in GTD. This is the joy of multi-class racing. Phil Ellis, Philip Ellis said, no, go in the win with number 57. Uh, sees Connor Zilich go through. Uh, I'm indebted to Josh Barrett. Uh, well-known voice around the circuits of the United Kingdom. Random Toby Sowery fact. He started car racing in the 750 Morning Club Toyota MR2 class racing with and against George Russell. God, where is he now, eh? Um, <laughs> when they were getting their license signatures before they went to F4. That's excellent, Josh. That one is tucked away. Yeah. See, if only, if only George had followed a better career path, he could have been doing sports car racing. Yeah. Well, to, to, <laughs> see what there. <laughs> Toby Sowery, he's kind of gone down the American single-seater path, going up to uh, previously Indy Lights, now known as Indy NXT. There's several of those drivers in the field. You mentioned, John, 14 full-time NTT IndyCar drivers in the field. Well, there's another huge raft uh, in the support classes yeah. for and the ladder, the, what was previously known as the road to Indy. Now, not a battle for position between the 57 uh, Whitworth Mercedes and the number one BMW because they are, yes, they are both uh, the same spec of car effectively, but they're in different, cra different classes. Uh, the 57 car of Phil Ellis is in GTD, class, your leader. That's another class leader. They're, they're, they're both class leaders. Yeah. They're both looking They're both looking at each other going, you're going fast. No, you're fast. Oh, we're great, aren't we? Yeah, we're great. That's another lap about to be put on the GTD leader. The GTD pros got a lap on the field in the same way the GTDs did last year um, when one of the early safety cars fell that split that field up. And that basically pushed all the GTD pros ahead by a full lap of the GT D cars. That, so that's nothing to do with the pace. That was a vagary of a safety car. And what a story this would be for the Windward Racing team. They have won this. Well, they have won this before, but last year they had the they had the roller coaster of weeks. They had a horrible crash in practice at turn one, uh, turn two, effectively into the wall. There, they had to go. They had to fly the crew back to uh, or drive back to uh, Pasadena, Texas, 952 miles away. Pick up another chassis, drive it back. Um, not the car on the road, they put it in the truck, um, and then rebuilt it, got ready for the race, and they nearly won it last year, so they're always a force here. Biggest movers overnight, Jimmy Bruni, six spots, and Connor Zilich uh, was the best in LMP2, ten spots, GTD Pro, also the leader, the Paul Miller Racing BMW, 11 spots for them, and in GTD, the best mover nice. overnight that was, was the yep. again the leader this is telling the story isn't it and this was started by Daniel Morad when we were on before midnight and it was I don't you say 17 spots there for the number 57 16 my apologies thank you Aaron crunching the numbers yeah the, all the AMGs had a horrible 
uh, test at qualifying um, and uh, early practice and they, 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 they with the balance of performance process they got brought a little bit back into the uh, the window and that's that's allowed them to compete because they really weren't nowhere at the beginning of the week so that what that's meant though is that the windward crew have had to really charge up the field so no wonder they've gained uh, so many positions. Well, as I said, Daniel Morad started that a very, very long time ago. It was very impressive to watch. He laid the groundwork, got into the top three, and the rest of the team have worked on it. It looks to me as there's a fire in the back of the number three Corvette. This is the car that's lost the right rear light. I see flames there. I saw a little bit of smoke with one of the P2 cars coming up behind. Now, is that just a bit of rubber build-up underneath the engine cover, or is it something more sinister? This is the third-place car in GTD Pro, Tonio Garcia, with the one working rear light. Should that stop working, by the way, they would have to come in and fix that immediately. Looking for any more signs of smoke and flames. Definitely saw a lick of flame underneath, I can see. Maybe is there something coming out of the centre exhaust pipes as well? Is it? Is that just dust, or is it that it's the light? Oh, the rear that light that's dislodged. Is it the rear light? I yes. think it might be. Wow! But there's certainly a lot of dust or dirt being thrown up from that car. It's coming onto the tri oval now. We'll take a look as it comes by us. A little bit of damage on the rear deck. More dust. I am not happy with with the amount of haze coming out of the back of that car. We'll keep a very weather eye on that machine. Nick Damon is down by the Pratt Miller Corvette racing team and there is no concern. They're just not here. Uh, they're not even they're not into that thing where you stare and point at the screen where it's your car. Uh, you know, they are just looking at some numbers, looking at some images, but they seem to have no concern, there's no activity at all. So apparently it is either a bit of, you say, right, got a build-up, or even more excitedly, the, the light that's been stuck back in the back of the car. <laughs> there's an awful lot of dust or something that's being thrown up from the back of the car. We always get a bit of exhaust glow from the, the Corvettes, and very much Batmobile-esque, so there's a little red glow on the exhaust outlets. I'm seeing a bit of haze from that car, even as it's going down the back stretch towards the Le Mans chicane. Was it exhaust glow underneath? No, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. There's something rubbing uh, that's causing the smoke. Tire rub on the right hand side. Maybe yeah. the exhaust rubbing up against some part of the bodywork and causing a. A little bit. It's definitely getting worse. It seems to be. And again, I'm trying to look underneath the back of the car as it comes round to us. This could be drama. It's concern from me, but not from the team. So. It, and they would see it on the data if there was a problem. You would imagine. It's already. Yeah. No, 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 it's definitely. Oh, it's, I, 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 you were right the first time. Definitely right the first time. Flair. I think there's a leak. I think there's some kind of fluid leak at the back of that car. The back of the car is already quite oily and grimy, and once in a while it gets onto something hot, but then it's getting, blo I think it's getting blown out again, but there was another flash of flame there, definitely, my eyes, although they may be, were not deceiving me two laps ago. There was definitely a flash there, um, so... And look at the hairs out the back of the yeah, car, Peter. No, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you on that one, John, and the back of the car is, I know we're at, what are we... 17 hours into a, a 24 hour race, and the, but the car is more filthy than it could be. Oh, there's definitely a flash of flame there in the, in the, in the engine bay. You can actually Maybe see it's behind it, the engine. You can actually see it more, Peter, because of the fact that that right hand rear light isn't there. I mean, but definitely a glow from the exhaust. We've, we've been used to that down through the years. But having that rear light missing, it might be getting a bit of extra air flow in and putting the, putting the fire out when it doesn't ignite. Uh, uh, what what good fire makes this could the be, draw? This could be something that they could sort under un, well, either under a full course yellow or just just in a regular pit stop. But you got to remember how good the Pratt Miller crew are. Yes, there's a different nomenclature, but make no mistake, Corvette racing with pros in the car, they're still the, a proper force to be reckoned with. Now Nick Damon 
uh, is down by Pratt Miller. The worry will be if that car stops and there's no airflow going through, would that cause a conflagration? Even a full course yellow. As it yeah. comes to a halt, or exactly, if it has to slow down. So, Pratt Miller watching what we are doing, uh, watching what we are seeing, and probably listening to my commentary on the PA as well from shrugging their shoulders and saying what is Heindhoff talking about? Have they started looking more interested in it? Well, interestingly, when we had that slow-mo shot of the uh, flame at the back of the car, then they stood up and pointed at the televisions uh, and some of the mechanics but now they are getting um, the fire suits on the hill I think they're just getting ready, there's no uh, apart from a manly fire extinguisher on the uh, pit wall, there's no immediate action, but I think they are now realising there could be a problem, they need to bring that car in a little bit early earlier than they would wish been out for, uh, let me see, that's the number three car, isn't it? It's been out for 22 laps for that car. It's team car with Nicky Katzberg driving it, one pit ahead. And meantime, whilst that drama unfolds, something more, something slightly less random and more reasonable, we've got standard pit stops for the top two big family in LMP2. Yeah, the 18 era car and the number four, the crowd strike machine, uh, both Oracle 07s, of course, because the only Lee is down in ninth. Uh, they are both in the pits. A bit away from because obviously I'm hanging around the Corvette racing uh, pit box. Uh, it's not, it's certainly the crowd strike car is getting four tyres. I think they changed drivers last time, so the driver will stay on board. Uh, if it's Connor's, is it Connor's election, that one? Um, and then, of course, I don't think they're... Uh, and, uh, We'll then see who's going to go in. There's actually new tower cars coming as well. So it is, it is interesting that the, the, um, the P2s really do just come in as a phalanx. Even the ones which have got a different chassis, because they've got the same engine. So there's a Sean Breach car comes in as well. Uh, so we're going to get a complete run P2s. They've all been called stuck together by that last yellow, which was now, what, 45 minutes ago, John? 40 minutes ago? You've mentioned it now, Nick. That's, you've, you've palmed the whole thing. Oh, no. Oh, is, it, oh, is, it, is that a verb now? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, only Johnny is blessed with that uh, that kind of power. Do you think? Do you remember last year? Yes. We had that super long run. Six hours. Yeah. And Johnny came on. I was part of the night shift, wasn't it? Was it, it, was it, it was the, the morning shift, no, the morning shift no, and he yeah. says, we, we've been green for ages. Oh, and then yeah, it was a 10, 10, 10, and a countdown from 10. And I was actually yellow. watching our production <laughs> Skype chat. And the responsible adult, Eve Hewitt, said, I can't believe you've just said that, Johnny. Full course yellow coming in 10, 9, 8. I don't even think she got to 5 and the full course yellow was out. Yeah, so team strategist listens to Johnny Palmer and if he comes out with anything like that, be ready for the... Yeah, get your car in. Jump, get your car yeah, in. Yeah, get your car in top <laughs> off. The first vestiges of sunlight off towards the beach, that lovely sort of expectant glow of dark Etruscan orange in the sky. There's a bit of a cloud front over the ocean at the moment, uh, which is just blocking out the, the best of the life. We're still about half an hour away from official sunrise, but there's a definite lightning, lightening of the sky. Still uh, been a lovely night. It's very warm. Yeah, oh, I can't crazy. imagine anybody and went with the soft tyres overnight. No, 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 it's been super humid as well, so for the drivers, they, it will have been pretty hard work in the uh, the cockpit of some of these cars. Interestingly, the, um, in LMP2, the 74 uh, Ranch Resort Riley car and the 52 into Europol car got a couple of laps longer on the, uh, on the stint, so could that be an advantage up their sleeve as we head into this final... Uh, portion of the race with just over seven hours to go. But Connor Zilic has stayed on board the number 18 era car, so once Dillman and Burton come into the pitch, you'd suspect that uh, he'll cycle back through to the lead. Johnny's corner at Johnny's corner, who at the moment is leading the tweet of the weekend competition for the tow truck tweet from earlier on to at IMSA Radio has just said I was about to make a joke about Heindorf being at Blackpool Tower last month this will resonate with those of you in the UK um, but he says you can't deny it it's on fire this was a, a piece of orange netting that was blowing around at the top of Blackpool Tower and the 
west coast of the UK, which uh, a number of people filmed and tweeted. And the emergency services came out. Of course, a bit of an internet stir. I remember seeing that. Actually, I think I saw it when it was finished, rather. And the brilliant pan is mightier than the sword. They've been dinged multiple times. The Dorian pan. Accounts, fan accounts, so said pity it would have been a good job. It would have been a good job. Gap. Yeah. We do have it. Gap at the front the is down to, to it. so it was seven and tenths of a second uh, coming over the line last time by. It's just edged up back up to just over a second. It's ebbing and flowing through yeah. traffic, but it's Nick Tandy chasing down Pippo Durrani. Now, Nick Tandy is going for a historic win here at the Rolex 24. He has won every major 24-hour endurance race overall except this one. This is what he's going. He said it before the race. He said, this is what we're going to Daytona to go for. Uh, this would complete the set for Nick Tandy. He's won Spa, he's won Nürburgring overall, he's won Le Mans overall. And this is the last one on the list. And, and actually, only his second opportunity uh, to, to win it overall, he's won it in the GT class before, yeah. uh, but uh, but but not in uh, not overall. And you could be sure that uh, he's got the bit between his teeth, and he's closing in Durrani here. Well, the thing is, he can now see people with no cars between the number six Porsche with the white pinstripes and side flash, and the wheel and engineering red, white, and grey Cadillac ahead of him. Coming towards the ends of their stints, I would suggest. Let's uh, have a quick look. People uh, has done 27 laps, so yeah, coming towards the end. Well, our GTP telemetry will tell us. Ah, oh, very good point. I forgot. Have you got that one? I, on, do, I do, yes. On the tab. Uh, I do. Oh, so Nick Tandy has 5% left, and Pippo Durrani has 10%. In fact, make that both 5%, so they should both be in within the next lap or two. Yeah. Um, Great stuff. You can you you can go on it. It's, we're not special in the booth. IMSA.com forward slash DTP dash telemetry. Um, wonderful resource. Great work from uh, IMSA. And, and uh, to be honest, it's a bit like cheating here at the box. We know exactly what's going on. Sky beginning to get more orange. Let's have a quick VP racing in race update. Porsches are coming to the fore at the head of the GTP field with pit stops coming, here's how they stand. The gap is down to just on a second from the wheel and engineering Cadillac to Nick Tandy's number six Porsche Penske Motorsport 963. The team car 12 and a half seconds further back. Felipe Nasa in the seven. Brought on competition with the third of the Porsches in line. That's the number five Jimmy Bruni car. The black and gold of Mustang Sampling. And the first car coming in from GTP is the car that comes in from fifth, Phil Hansen. We'll get the nick in a moment. LMP2, Connor Zilic still leads after a quick pit stop for the 04, Martha Jackson. I oh, know, Martha's just. Uh, Yes, the both had a pit stop, excuse me. Martha Jackson, uh, Jacobs have got in the car. Tom Dillman still third for Indy Europol. Paul Miller BMW by 10 seconds over the two Corvettes with a little worry. A bit of flame underneath the engine compartment of Antonio Corvette's number three car in third position. And both of those Corvettes are pitting now. So Nick's about to get very busy. And Phil Ellis is coming in from the lead of GTD. Uh, he was ahead of Robbie Forley and the Triassi competition Ferrari. That's your VP Racing update. Uh, Nick will pick off the GTP at his end of the pit lane. Right, also just to my left uh, is the uh, Smokey Joe, the Antonio Garcia number three car. Uh, they are looking to fill up the fluids. There's no major panic on that. And now to my right, I have our, our erstwhile leader, Pipo Durrani. He's staying on board and he's getting uh, four new tyres. And then to my left, I have the uh, Porsche out has got Nick Tandy for the number six car. That's also getting four new tyres. He's second now, the 40 tyres that come to my feet. The first, the Mustang sample, number five proton machine, trundles down the pit lane as well. Durrani now not being released yet. What you can't see, Nick, is the work going on at the back of the Corvette. They're trying to drag out what they can, but there's undoubtedly fluid 
coming out of the back of that car. And the actor is at my feet, John, and that is uh, the, uh, the red one. Better turn over. That is set again. No driver change. That's the sound of the Cadillac pulling away. Oh. The, the uh, Antonio Garcia number three has gone as well. The six Porsche has gone. Uh, I think slightly longer in the pits than Duran. He's certainly using the second behind him when he's going down the pit lane. Uh, I'll tell you what, Nick, that was interesting because Duran went out on internal combustion engine, not doing. So he didn't stop the engine there. No? Okay, we, so is that a poor end of an issue? Maybe. Not sure, quite a long stop. Actually, not really. This is how long the fuel takes to go, isn't it? With the uh, uh, Acura in front of me, they don't think the uh, tyres and the way they go. And that, as you say, goes away on our old favourite milk float power. It's not as good as the Toyota milk float power from the Mon, but it's still whisked away. The uh, recovering BMWs are both in now. And yeah, so whatever was ailing the number three car, they felt they could fix quite easily. Isn't it? Kind of a, I'm looking now, kind of a post-mortem at uh, the stuff they found. They don't seem, don't seem overly concerned. There was an awful lot of fluid on the rear, the top of the rear, uh, well, underneath the deck, on top, on top of the diffuser. I wonder if that's fluid that maybe had come out and it's it, and it's now, that leak is now fixed um, and it's uh, come and it's just sort of stayed the rear of the car. Full car service seven in. Yeah, full service the seven. The exhaust is glowing red, which is absolutely fine on the Porsche. They're outside and not about to set fire to tyres of Tritus. Uh, full service driver change. Uh, they're putting on. Uh, a complete set of tyres, and they have the big M on them, the big yellow M's. They're certainly running medium tyres at the moment. Cars drop down, obviously the last one knows fuel. No faffing around in this car, so a lot less of the looking about, just cleaning it up. So uh, that one's obviously giving no cause concern of the television. Room. That's a seven car. Uh, the six car had a little, a little bit more of looking around. They've been driving a little bit more in traffic, and of course, Durrani got away still in the lead. And Nick, one of the nice things this year is we've got three new compounds for GTP, soft, medium and hard. And as we've seen in the WAC and at Le Mans down through the years recently, they are, have different stickers on the sides, different markings. It's uh, yellow for medium. Yellow is mellow. That's the medium. White is the soft from, and red for the soft from memory. As long as they haven't changed that around as well. Uh, generally speaking, this year we won't have to worry about the compounds in WeatherTech Sports Car Championship competition, but because of the unique nature of Daytona and particularly with the cold weather that we experienced a few years ago, there is a special regulation here that allows you to take the soft softs from. Seven o'clock last night to eight o'clock this morning. Don't have to, and I suspect many of them haven't. Uh, let's go down to Bedfordshire's finest, uh, and that's Nick Tandy with our Nick Day. Well, Nick, um, the number six Porsche, in fact, by all four of the Porsche are, are really taking this battle, aren't they? It, 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 we we saw through practicing qualifying a little bit off the pace, but once you've got racing, the cars are going really well. I mean, the conditions are a little bit different, this is the thing, the, the night is, uh, <laughs> the track cools down, and it, I mean, it looks like it suits our car, this is the thing, the start of the race, we sort of struggled a bit, but then you don't know what people are doing on tyres, obviously you can see when people put four tyres on, um, I think us and the 31 ran, ran with four tyres the last stint, and it was, you know, it was pretty close, so... It's difficult to know what's going to happen when the sun comes up, this is the thing, but... Uh, yeah, so far so good, and like you say, with four Porsches up there, um, you know, <laughs> I'd like to think we can kind of help each other, but uh, often we don't help each other, as I saw in the last thing. Um, so, I mean, obviously, with these high temperatures, has that, that meant you've been on that medium tyre the entire time, or have you had to run too soft? Um, I couldn't possibly tell you, Nick. Right, I understand, that's mostly me, you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's it's probably still not the coolest part of the day. So, you know, until the sun comes up, there'll still be, t you know, ground temperature drop. So we have we have both compounds still available. Yeah. When you were trailing uh, Pipo towards the end of the stint, did you did you decide there's no point overtaking him? Well, just sit in his toe and save some fuel, or could you not overtake him? I mean, it's very difficult to stay close and pass when you're running 
together in clean air. What, you know, it's, it's almost impossible, unless you've got a one second advantage on the car in front. But, um, you know, when you get in traffic, this is when you've got to try and make sure you're close enough to pick up on an opportunity. So, you know, whilst if you can sit in the toe and save a bit of fuel, all well and good, but um, you, know, you still need to stay close enough to see if, if you can make something happen in traffic. But uh, it's still, I know it's a cliche, but it's still seven hours to go. This is the thing. Well, it's cliche, but it's true. So, you know, as I say, we are now you know, working, we're getting towards the end. Uh, we can back time there. So, are you going to take the car to the finish, or is one of your other fast friends? I have no idea. It depends how the yellows fall and how the driver's stints work out. But uh, the good thing with the four of us, it doesn't matter who's in the car at the end. So, um, yeah, we'll wait and see. But I'll, I'll get ready just in case. Yeah, that would do. Thanks, Nick. Cheers. Look close to the best there. A pair of Nicks there. Dearman and Tandy, a bit more light in the sky off towards Daytona Beach itself as we look over Daytona Beach Airport and of course the Daytona International Speedway. People are starting to return to the hospitality units below us for a bit of breakfast and motorsport. There have been some hardy fans in front of us pretty much all night tonight, uh, all night overnight um, in t-shirts because that's all they've needed. Chetilar, number 47, into the pit lane, the Ferrari, the blue car. And fuel going in. Tyres offered, but I don't think they're going to use them, are they? Oh, yeah, they are. That was interesting. That seemed to be a rather late decision. Is that just rears? No, they put one on at the, the front right as well. Right, so it's just... Uh, it's just it's just right hand sides then yeah isn't it? we've seen a, a, some quite a few teams uh, doing that because there's a limited tire allocation you can't just throw four new tires at it on it at every given opportunity channel our team unfortunately they're running quite a few laps down there eight laps of the uh, class leader in gtd they're going to be here for the uh, the whole michelin endurance cup season which uh, that's consists this year of an extra route. We have the usual suspects here at the Rolex 24 at Daytona, the 12 hours of Sebring, uh, the Watkins uh, 6 hours of the Glen, uh, and Petit Le Mans. But we're adding to that the long race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So a five round Michelin Endurance Cup season here in 2024, which I'm sure all the teams are very excited about. 71 degrees uh, on the, in the air. Round about the same on track as well. That's 21, 22 degrees Celsius humidity going back up again and dropped to merely 66% overnight. Now well up over 80% as the Triazi 023 comes in. I, I really like the colour of that car. That darker, almost blood red into the pit lane. That's a almost Scuderia Ferrari before they even built their own cars. Yeah, so correct. They used to run Alphas before the war. Totally. Uh, that sort of deep, yeah, almost red wine colour. Um, fantastic. That's for the lead of GTD for that Ferrari. Correct. On the pit stop cycle, in fairness, it should be the... Uh, in the B, um, it should be the uh, Daniel Morad going back to the lead. In fact, when he comes across the line this time, he's just put his fastest lap in for that car of the race. And when he comes by this time, he will retake the lead. We've talked a lot about the serviceability of this new Ferrari 296 GT3. That this Triarty car had spun under the pace car, backed into the wall, and had quite a bit of damage. But the rear section of that Ferrari 296 GT3, you could pull off the whole rear section and just bolt a new one on, and it saved them so much time and repair. And as the unfortunately the Ford, the new Ford Mustangs have found out to their cost. Uh, there with damage on the rear of their cars has cost them dearly this race. In for the 120, Jan Halen and the right car. This is the very attractive blue colour. It's almost, well, the, the darker blue is almost Porsche Nautilus blue, but there's a, there's a hint of uh, that lighter colour that we used to see on France Conrad's cars. Do you remember that? Around the Celine S7R in those, those colours. Uh, interesting race for the Fords. And the 64, that's the Harry Tinknell, Mike uh, Rockefeller and Chris Meese car is in the pit lane. The engine cover is off. 
at the front end of the car, but underlying how much work has gone into these new GT3 cars, I can't, I can hardly see the front of the engine. It's so low and so far back. This effectively then a front mid-engined car. There, there's a, there's three feet in front of where that front pulley is to the front of the car. And I'm not exaggerating there at all. Do you expect anything less from Multimatic and Ford? You know, look at, look at how they push the boundary uh, and really push the limit with the Ford GT uh, and to the, to the regulations there. They've done, clearly done the same thing with this Ford Mustang GT3 and no wonder, uh, as they've reported, they've got such customer demand for the car. I think they're going to be building them as fast as they can and building spares as fast as they can so they can roll those out. And it's very much a global program. It's all about global for that uh, team, even down to the drivers that they've, they've got. They've got drivers from all over uh, all over the world and several have made switches from other manufacturers to come and join this uh, this Ford program Aston Martin is very similar actually all the front engine cars are you look at the level of technology and design GT3 not so very long ago was not a million miles away from taking a shell off the line, putting in a cage and the requisite other safety equipment, taking everything else out, and basically that's what GT4 is now, really. But even GT, yeah, yeah, GT4 is in, he's getting incredibly sophisticated. Uh, yeah, you're right, that's what GT4 used to be. I saw the first ever GT3 race and they did look like uh, street cars with some performance additions and accoutrable on the car. A few weeks and so. Now, that is, they are fully designed race cars. GT4s, since 2017, 2018, have started to do times that GT3s were doing only a couple of years uh, before that. We've got another car got behind the wall, Peter, and it's not good news for the number 17 Corvette. The AWA Corvette, they've already lost the sister car, which had an issue on the opening, uh, well, actually pulling off from the uh, the grid, uh, had an issue um, that eventually took them out of the race. So the car's number 17 for AWA Corvette. It's been a, a certainly a learning uh, a learning experience for that team with their two uh, Chevy Corvettes. But make no mistake, that car and that team, they, they'll get it right. Uh, it's clearly golden hour. It's golden hour in terms of the, the light coming up, but it is also for your leader in GTD as well. Daniel Mora has just set the best, his lap, best lap of the race for that car, 146.699. And the chase for the lead continues. People Durrani stayed in the number 31. Whelan Cadillac. It was Mathieu Jamine who was plugged into the number six Porsche Penske Motorsport uh, 963. And my goodness, these two are setting the pace. A little bit of bouncing around on the back straight, a bit of oscillation for the Chamonix yeah, Porsche. He was right up against the wall going into the Le Mans chicane. I don't know if it was slightly bumpier there. But all of a sudden, 15 seconds between these leading pair and the Matt Campbell and Jimmy Bruni cars are also split apart. They were running, if not line astern, I think we said they were about four and a half, five seconds. It's now 13 seconds between Campbell and Bruni and 10 seconds between Jimmy and Phil Hansen, who's in the bright yellow number 85, as the battle for the lead begins to heat up. A minute before seven in the morning, live from Daytona International Speedway. This is IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together around the world on Sirius XM 207 here in North America and 107.9 FM. WDIS at Daytona International. Great to have your company. Six tenths of a second, Jamini pulled out of your race leader, Pipo Durrani, on the last lap, and now he's got him in his uh, in his gun sight. He's chasing him down, and of course now he's close enough. Matthew Jamini in second place in that number six Porsche that he can try and get a little bit of a draft 
on the uh, on the straightaway. So Durrani getting the hurry up here from Germany. Half a second now. But again, that Porsche bouncing rather worryingly close to the wall. Out of the Le Mans chicane. That's a brilliant exit from Chamonix. The car just seemed to pick up and fire out of that chicane. And it's target acquired. The Porsche sparking as it moves up and down. The banking at turns three and four on the speedway as it was going through traffic. Now, that car, and again, sparking heavy fuel load, of course, on that car. The 963 seems to work best, Peter, when it is low to the ground. Very, very pitch sensitive, this car. There was a lot of work done after Le Mans last year by the team when they went back to basics along with a couple of their customer teams at Barcelona, I think. Apologise if I've got the circuit wrong. And they, they literally yeah, went back to basics to try and find the balance in the car. In fairness, the pace of the car in the second half of the season, both in the World Endurance Championship and indeed here in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, certainly was more competitive. Lost a win at the sale in six hours of the Glen because of excessive plant wear. When I say excessive, they were one mil one millimeter at one part of the plaque was out of specification that was a really poor luck for them well uh, and they know what happened there yeah that was that was a piece of tire debris that punctured the floor and set up an aerodynamic vibration that kept bouncing the floor on the ground. Here we go. Don't have to have the stopwatch out now through turns three and four of the speedway. As Mathieu Javanet is in the draft of the Cadillac. Underneath us now, Peter snaps his head to his right as if he's watching a tennis match as they go down towards turn one. It's good up front. There it's was really no return from the hats. That, that was turn. an ace from Mathieu yeah, Germany. It was indeed. <laughs> he's right there. Three tenths of a second quicker on the last lap. Cadillac now remember what Tandy said. He said we've got to make the chances count when there's traffic and traffic is about to play a part ahead of them. Uh, they've got a couple of different cars. Most of the time, but man, that it's the, been there. We just talked. Uh, the 120 Porsche handy. is there. They've got the an LMP2 car the right in front of them at the moment, driver. which is the Tower we number this 8 car. This the is oh, and he oh. just really swipes the nose of Durrani's Cadillac there. Durrani turn 6. Durrani had to get out the power. Here's the chance for the Porsche. That's not typical Pippo Durrani. He would have gone for that. Yeah. Uh, he's he's being safe here. Pippo Durrani is renowned as being as one of the most aggressive drivers in traffic. Um, and normally he would have gone straight for that. But I think he knows how fast a race car they've got. Doesn't want to risk with six and a half hours to go. Michael Tyner it was who caused the slight incident. Can't really blame Michael. No. You told in the driver's right briefing. And this was the exact the words six. yesterday from Paul Barfield, our race director. Stay on your line. The faster car's got to find a safe and clean way by. There was just a little bit of indecision, though, there from people. That Peter picked up on across the line again. And there'll be more traffic in front of them. This time it's the number 80 AMG Mercedes. Itself having a wee battle at the moment, sitting in fourth for Scott Andrews in the Lone Star car. That's dispatched by the leader, and this time it's the Frenchman Chamonix who doesn't get the cleaner exit out of the International Horseshoe at the eastern end of the infield. But it's going to be traffic for the next couple of laps here, Peter. And the leader's offline here. That's cost time. Here comes Chamonix. He's going to get the apex. He'll go to the inside. There's almost contact as Durrani pushes back. It looked like Chamonix thought about going down the inside of the Inception McLaren into turn number six, which takes them back onto the bank. He thought better of that. 200 miles an hour on the bank for the GTP cars. And these excellent drivers are dicing with the other Clatnaby cars as if they were 
parking this in the multi-story just street fighting all the way through traffic fantastic and that was a little bit awkward there getting past the inception mclaren and spare a thought for the driver of that number 70 inception mclaren frederick shandor with their uh, two brother two gtps going either either side but uh, tell you who is on the move it's it's third place another one of the porsches car number seven for porsche penske motorsport matt campbell has trimmed the gap down it's now down to just 11 seconds he set that car's uh, best lap of the race about four or five laps to go 36.1 so Matt Campbell is on the move Triazzi Competizione Alessio Rivera third place at GTD fastest GTD lap of the race 46.2 we are in happy hour the sun uh, is not officially up yet but we've got color in the sky more of it just a quick update by the way on Sean Creech Motorsport the Stars and Stripes leash here the only leash here in the race they had their issues earlier on, but Joao Barbosa is behind the wheel now. And he's just uh, turned a lap last time around, and he's just on a second away from that car's fastest lap of the race. So despite all the problems, the never say die attitude of Sean Creech, as we would expect from that team. They're down in 30... 44th position, that's another double number car as well of course, so that's three double number cars which still got the race. Ninth in LMP2, but pushing on. And it's a, a brave thing from that operation to go, go up against the might of Orica, who have been the benchmark in the LMP2 class for so many years now. So to run another chassis in uh, front of Ligier, uh, that's brave. Talk to Lance Wilsey about that at the back end of last year on Midweek Motorsport. And he said, look, <laughs> we know what we can do, we know the resources we have, and do we want to be the 10th Origa team, or do we want to do something a little bit different? There will be a time when this is going to work for us, and we've got to maximise that and take the opportunity. It's not been their day today, but who knows? Well, through the rest of the season, I'm Peter, they can bring some really, really smart guy and say, okay, performance out of that this year. I didn't do the math. Yes. I'm thinking about this too. Inherently, remember, if you look at all the of those cars the were got, the warning, the, the, performance the, the balanced the penalty, the stop when they first came out. It was a big the block there. So Unintentional, I'm sure, from the, the FAF. Engineering staff to make sure that as the weather changes, uh, McLaren, the torque parameters, the engine oh, parameters are still FAF McLaren. So Alexander Rossi in that Perhaps car. Alexander Rossi is doing exactly away. what he should do, just hold, hold the line. And Durani got by and Chamonix did not. So that opens up the gap a touch um, to maybe about half a second or so, as we see. But there's a big chunk of traffic coming up, John. Yeah, there is, uh, including some. LMP2 traffic, the Ranch 74 Resort car, the Triazi car, which Rivera is pushing very, very well. The BMW number 96 is in that little line, and I think it's the Conquest Racing Ferrari with Cedric Sperazzoli, the number 34, that is about to go down. Also the 64 Ford Mustang. There's a Sperazzoli car and the Triazi car. My goodness, 200 miles an hour around the banking. And that, well, the, the difference there, the contrast there, Peter, of how solid and how stable a platform the 31 Cadillac is to people to Raleigh, looks like he literally is nipping to the shops on a Sunday morning to go and get the papers in a cart the milk. Whereas when we see the onboards from the Porsche and Mattia Jamine behind, that looks like he's doing 300 miles an hour. Yeah, and, it, it, and he, even in their, the language and the way that they, that you look at them through the corners, the way they get out the corner, it does look really quite raw and edgy, the, the 963, whereas the, the Cadillac, and I think also the way it delivers its power, the Cadillac is a naturally aspirated engine. Yes, it has the hybrid, they, they all have the same hybrid system, but the Cadillac has got this, bit, you can just hear it, the way it revs, this beautiful linear power delivery. And it hits you in the stern. Uh, yeah, but, and then the Porsche, of course, a 4.6 V8, with twin turbos, maybe a little bit more aggressive with the power delivery, but I mean, it's still <laughs> clearly a fast car and a, and a reliable car, too. Four of them in the top five. Let's see, this time, Mathieu Jaminet off turn two. 
and immediately into that oscillation before the breaking area into the Le Mans chicane. It's, it's been noticeable. Oh, took a lot of curb on the exit there, a lot of curb. That was touring car about the curb. It was past the Triazi machine. A lot of the Porsche factory drivers, they, uh, they, they come up through the ranks through Carrera Cup, whether that be their regional championship and then up to the Super Cup if you're going through that program. And you, you certainly use a lot of curb striking in, the, in, that, uh, in that category. Durrani just getting through the traffic that little bit quicker, uh, whether that be a matter of fortune or skill, it's uh, difficult, to, difficult to say, but brilliant stuff. And it's not the only close battle. No. LMP2 is just a second and a half between Connor Zilic, who's been really motoring away in that era motorsport car, but he's been chased all the way by Malta Jakobsen in the CrowdStrike uh, 04 car. And Malta's been doing a huge amount of heavy lifting through the test and through the practice, where he's been one of the quickest drivers in the car throughout the whole time. So leader is Pete Portorani by just on 1.4 seconds. It's the top left if you're watching the screen. Top right is Connor Zilic, MX5 and Trans Am driver last year. He's leading in LMP2 by 1.4 seconds. Racing in Xfinity this season for Connor Zilic. So we're getting plenty more oval experience. GTD Pro, probably the biggest gap actually. 19 and a half seconds, Neil Verhagen over Nicky Katzberg, BMW, ahead of actually both the Corvettes, four from three. No reoccurrence of that uh, flame out on the back of that Corvette, not that we've seen at least on Garcia's Corvette. And finally, Daniel Morad leads Robbie Foley in the 96 BMW and Alicio Rivera, 10 seconds and then another second. With Scott Andrews in the Lone Star AMG, uh, back another 30 seconds or thereabouts. I'm being fairly rounding up and rounding down here. I hope you don't mind. We've got about a minute before official sunrise. Looks like it's going to be another corking day. A bit of overhead clouds and out towards the ocean. There is an ocean layer out there. I think we're going to be okay, Peter with the 140 checkered flag. Let's hope so. Let's hope it's a nice clean run to the flag and a, a straight fight because we've got so many close fights right through the classes. That we, we, let's see uh, who's going to come out on the top here. Don't, don't you love this though for endurance racing? Where we can see the relative strengths and weaknesses within the better part of an hour's worth of racing between the fuel stops. And you made a very important point, actually, an observation. At the start of this stint at the front of the field, it was the first time that we really saw the Cadillac disappear right from the restart or from the pit stop. And that is something we've not seen. The Acuras were doing it earlier on, and then their pace seemed to ease through the stint. The Cadillacs have been monstrously reliable in terms of their performance potential right the way through the stint. It wouldn't be a big climb and a drop off if you looked at the performance curve. It would be much gentler to the middle of the stint and then a gentle curve back down again. But they, I mean, Durrani took off like a... Matt, we can well, that's been shot out, out of a steam yeah, catapult, actually. It looked like a scene from the next Maverick. And, and you wonder, had they had that attribute in their pocket all, all the, time. the time? Yeah, and because and the, what is now, I think, typical of the Rolex 24 in this modern era is that it, you know it's 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 very typical to have uh, a late full course caution or several late full course cautions when everyone's getting to the end of the race and the intensity ratchets up you are going to get more incidents therefore there's always that shootout for the win and so you need that quick sprint pace that's what both Acura showed last year so you need to really go for it straight off the uh, straight off the full course caution and so I'm not surprised to see that Cadillac have got that in their pocket, but it's the first time they've shown it. Move for the lead in LP2. Round the outside for Martha Jacobson. That gap has come down and down, side by side through the tri-oval, the red and black. Crowd strike. Algar Pro Racing, six and a half hours to go, and the elbows are out from Connor Zilic. 
massive Maybe he's practicing for his Xfinity drives here, but he's not giving this one up. Down to the infield hairpin, the first of the two horseshoes. Crowd strike car looks like it maybe has a little more grip underneath Martha Jacobson. Tom Tillman's another 12 seconds further back. In fact, actually, has Dillman just pitted? Because there's a big change. Oh, Josh Bird. Sorry, time just catching up with itself. Side by side again, coming out of the infield. And still that, but mainly blue here car. Drift a little wide. Oh, that's a super move from Martha Jacobson, the over and under, but he's got the Iron Dame Lamborghini ahead, it's a big, they're rubbing, they're touching, they're touching again, and well, how do you call that one, I think that's heads up racing from Connor Zilic, he did not give one inch, and used the Iron Dame's Lamborghini as a pick, as a screen, Wow, he totally learned that in the Wheeland Master MX5 Cup. <laughs> or watching the NBA, that was a basketball screen as you said. It was a big uh, Fantastic stuff. Malta Jakobsen, uh, uh, a Perishow Hypercar Junior driver. Well, I'm sure the Perishow management are watching this closely thinking, do we move him up to full uh, to the full squad? Why not? He's driving so well. Here he comes Whoa. again and again. It's a Lamborghini that thwarts his move to the outside this time inside on turns one and two tried the outside move going into the first corner on the infield this is getting spicy six and a half hours to go how would you like your breakfast hot thanks very much extra chilies chili flakes all over it coming out of the final infield corner Jakobsen went wide and then cut back underneath brilliant move the side by side, there's a bit of side drafting. He tried to move up, but Connor Zillic says, uh, excuse me, I'm already here, if you don't mind. All words to that effect. Brilliant stuff from Jakobsen. Brilliant look. Absolutely brilliant from Jakobsen. And, and indeed, and also from Connor Zillic. Just enough respect, I think, there. And uh, it's spared a little thought for the uh, for the 83 Iron Dame Lamborghini. Michelle Gatti, well, actually, you'll, you'll, not, you'll never scare Michelle, that's for sure. Uh, she's looking at an America going, oh, you of... Pull out, pull out. Pull out. Have you seen me? Hello. Have you, oh, they have seen me, that's fine. Uh, Shay Adam is into our crowd strike pit report rotor for the early morning as the sun now makes its first appearance over the horizon right in front of the Global Broadcast Centre. Good morning, Shay. Hello. Hello. Had to do it. Uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news coming into the pit lane, but this beautiful battle that we're watching out on track is about to be broken up because Era has scrambled into life, and indeed the pit board is now waving, and Connor Zilich is going to be getting out of the Aero Motorsports number 18 machine, handing over to Ryan Dial, as there's a bit of drama for Turner Motorsport, actually. The car coming to a stop in the transition lane. It has missed its pit box. This is the first place in GTD into third place, excuse me. Uh, the CrowdStrike car is also in it looks like they are doing perhaps a drinks bottle change, but Malta staying aboard. Connor Zilich, though, for sure getting out. I'm definitely stalking the right place because we need to chat with him. After that debut in the Rolex, so far, his job is not yet done, but it is four new tires for Ryan Dial and waiting on the fuel as Turner is now being pushed into their box. I'll keep an eye on that as well, and I'll run down and check after we've heard from Connor. It's going behind the wall. Turner is going behind the wall. Robbie Foley brought the car in. Patrick Gallagher was sitting helping it on the box, waiting to take over. So I will head down there, but uh, we definitely need to hear from Connor after that sit. Waiting on fuel for Era. The crowd strike car is moving. Are they going to leave them out? Yes, crowd strike is clear of Era because Era will make it out to the transition lane, but the overlap dictates that the 04 will lead them on the racetrack. A change in the pit lane described by Shay Adam. As much as that battle was enthralling out on the high banks, proof once again that this is a team sport. I don't mean just the three drivers. The pit crew have done their job there. And that's a change of leader. As Malthus Jacobson goes into 
the effective lead. Tom Tillman scored as the leader in the number 52 car at the moment for the... No, it's a, a driver change for Era. It's uh, Ryan DL who's got on board. Oh, oh, right, that's just changed. Yeah, because Zilic had done a double stint. Um, so then Jakobsen now onto his next stint. So Ryan DL, one of the most experienced drivers in the field, trying to go for a third Rolex watch. And remember, Tom Tillman in the, in the Europe All 52 has to make the same stop that those two cars already have done. Well, that was entertaining, Shea. Adam, will you pass on our best to Conor Zilic? Oh, I will. And honestly, I don't even have to because, Conor, you get out of the car, you look exhausted. You've just driven your heart out, but the crew guys are treating you like a hero. They're practically putting you on your shoulders. Does that make everything you've just done for the last two hours feel worth it? Yeah, I'm worn out. It was a, a long double sin, and, you know, it was my third sin of the race. So I'm still learning, and, um, you know, I'm just glad I was able to keep the, the 04 behind us there and, you know, give us a better shot when we get the tires for the next next driver, Ryan. He's in the car now. So hopefully he can, uh, you know, get back by them and, you know, get us a little lead heading into the heading into the daytime. But uh, super proud of the Air Motorsports team. They've worked so hard today, and, um, you know, I just hope we can, you know, finish these last six hours, hours off strong. You were doing a little bit of hip checking there with Malte Jakobsen up on the banking guy. Uh, clearly moves you learned from Mazda, right? Yeah, that's MX-5 Cup racing. <laughs> Thanks, Connor. Good luck, and uh, good luck for covering. What entertainment at breakfast time. That's that's a bit of spicy sausage for you. How would you like his frittata? Hot, fluffy, and spicy. Yeah. Well, one of our Porsche keys to race was get to breakfast. Well, that applies to the competitors as well as fans, because well, fans, you don't want to be sleeping through breakfast because you're missing this action. No, absolutely right, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us here. Live from trackside, the opener of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship for 2024, the 62nd running of the Rolex 24 Hours at Daytona. Right, now, we've had our action in LMP2. Neil Verhagen has established a 23 and a half second lead in GTD Pro. Daniel Morad has pulled out 11 and a half seconds on Alessio Rivera, the Triazi, uh, uh, the Triazi Ferrari. He's been going very quickly indeed and setting that car's fastest lap of the race a few minutes ago so let's go back to the front of the field perfect because there's always something happening Pimo Durrani still leads well nothing's happened except Mattia Giamone is now just half a second behind again in the number six car and there's a really interesting thing again involving uh, Michelle Gatting in the number 83 Iron Dames uh, Lamborghini GTD she got just she was just coming into the braking zone there into turn one where the GTPs are braking from 200 miles an hour Durrani got passed and then it was sort of 50-50 where the Mathieu Jamini would go and Michel Gatting moved to the inside basically saying do not <laughs> you do not come through try and wait till the next corner so uh, interesting stuff through traffic Jamini waited and back on again Tom Dillman has come into the pit lane he was third behind that uh, fantastic battle that we were watching between then it was uh, find a 24 -hour endurance uh, Jakobsen a and Conor Zilic, Ryan DL's taking over the year team. Well, Tom's brought the, in the Europol car into the pit lane, so he will drop back into third. He inherited the lead there. Meantime, the 96 turn of BMW was pushed just through the Rolex arch, and they've not even gone back to their paddock area. The hood is off that car, and they're working on that car, Shea Adam, uh, in the return lane between the two sets of garages behind the pits. Yeah, a spot they know very well, having campaigned two GS cars here just a couple of days ago now, as it is. They're in the intake area. They did have a new fan, uh, excuse me, a, a new filter ready for the front of the car uh, to do on the pit stop, but that's not what they're changing. They do have one of the best from BMW here, though. Mark Murray is assessing the car, trying to figure out what the problem is. They are putting the hood on the golf cart. Looks like they're going to flat tow Robbie back to their actual garage. This is more intensive work. They're disappearing right now, John. As the drag that car just as she got to the car it's getting dragged further away uh, from her more smoke from the right rear of the number three Tony Garcia car that's dropped down to fourth position now as Davide Regon in the Ricci Competizione Ferrari has gone through and pulled out a second and a half or thereabouts she's getting on for two seconds now 
I am now officially worried. I was concerned before. Um, always when you see a flash of flame on a race car, uh, it's happened to me once only, and trust me, it, it catches your attention. Uh, uh, for now, for that number three crew, it's just get the car to the end of the race. If they can, if under, under any circumstances, just over six hours to go, that's got to be their sole objective now. Because remember, they're they're going for a full season championship. They, it, it, they you know, the season is longer than that one race. Um, so they've got to just make sure they get there. LMP2 battle still <laughs> raging on. But they've got two parallel universes here, and both are prototypes battling wheel to wheel. And Jakobsen has just pulled up a little bit of an advantage of 1.2 seconds for Ryan Deal. Remember, Walter Jakobsen is 20 years old. <laughs> Ryan Deal, this is, well, I'm not say, this is his 19th Rolex 24 hours. He's won it twice. So, Malty Jakobsen is about to be put to the ultimate test. He's had to deal with the young buck in Connor Zilich and now the experienced hand of Ryan Deal. Remember as well that Ryan Deal has just got into that car. Jakobsen has been in it for a, a couple of sticks. Yeah. So, Jakobsen right in the groove. Ryan Diel, an absolute pro. It will take him no time at all to get up the pace, but he doesn't have the knowledge of the evolution of the track right now that Jakobsen does. I'd say a fair play to Ryan, because he's only dropped 1.2 seconds. Sometimes in warming up the tyres and getting out there, you can double or triple that. I agree. Coming out of the pits. Shall we go back and revisit the lead? Well, oh, go on then. Uh, they come through the Le Mans chicane. Let's have a look. Matt Campbell, where's... We knew he was on the move, but he's... They're now... We've got top three battle within two seconds. Yeah. So Matt Campbell's just been charging. Let's go down to share while that's developing as we have a turn of BMW update. The number 96 car behind the wall and not under BMW M power, Jay. No, under uh, Taylor Dunn power, actually. Um, the reason that they've gone back to the garage is because they don't fully understand what happened with the car, but they fully lost oil pressure. That's never a good thing. Yeah, that is not a good thing. So they've saved the motor for now. Let's see how that's going to work. So Matt Campbell has charged up to the back of the leaders and the top three with uh, 18 hours completed or thereabouts are within 1.2 seconds. Stint of the race so far, I think, for me, from, uh, from Matt Campbell, Campbell because it's not it's, it's not that, like, Durrani and Jamini have been, you know, duffing each other up and, you know, costing each other time. They've been absolutely on it the whole way, but Campbell's just caught them on pure pace. So, where, where is this now a point where... Uh, well, there's two, two scenarios here. Has you, Campbell used up the majority of the tyre to be able to put that pace in, or has he still got pace left and you might get Porsche Penske Motorsport on the radio saying let, let Matt through, let him have a go well, uh, because this is maybe going to have to it seems that the number 31, the pole sitting car, Wheel and Engineering Cadillac has maybe got a slight edge on pace but if with a two prompt attack from Porsche Penske Motorsport they can double the pressure 577 laps completed the top three cars have 15% of their stint energy still to use. We'll make that 10% now for Durrani and for Jamini as the app updates in real time. IMSA.com forward slash GTP dash telemetry if you want to follow along. It's fascinating to see where they are harvesting power as well. We'll watch this for a couple of minutes before the VP racing in race update. But for the moment, loath to take my eyes off this. Uh, just coming up to six, uh, check that, 7.30 in the morning. The Tecumet GTD leader, GTD leader, just getting passed by. First of all, people to Rani, and now the two Porsches to think about the Western horseshoe. But it's the no team orders the here from the Penske really team. Long. They're running in six and seven order from Porsche Penske Motorsport. Roger Penske likes to let his drivers race, but there is... The I don't even yeah. think... I was about to say it. There'll be an unwritten rule. I don't even think it needs to be said when you're racing for Roger Penske. It's just 
assume that you never run into well, your teammates. You've got to remember is that there's a Porsche rule not to do that. That's, um, yeah, that's which, a very uh, good point. Alvin Springer, who was head of Porsche Motorsport uh, for many, many years, he, he hasn't been in that title officially uh, since, I think, 2003, 2004. But he's still there, and all his Porsche, personality all looms Porsche, large. He's scary, and all Porsche factory drivers. Are I mean, I've, I've spoken to many of them over the last couple of years, and you speak to guys like Lucas Luer, uh, Timo Bernard, etc. 